The House uh, now will proceed to the consideration of a motion to adjourn the House for the purposes of discussing a specific and important matter requiring urgent consideration, namely the COVID-19 protest. I'll call the cause that motion. According, the motion is as follows. Mr. Singh, seconded by Mr. Julian Moose, that this House do now adjourn. Honorable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to lead the debate. And I want to thank uh, my colleague and member of parliament for New Westminster Burnaby for uh, the support on this, as well as my entire caucus. I want to start by saying people around the world are looking at Canada right now, looking at Ottawa right now and asking what's happening. Let me talk about the convoy protests. And let me begin by talking about what they are not. This protest, this convoy protest, is not a peaceful protest. There's a often used saying, if people continue to show you who they are, then you've got to start believing them. This is what the convoy has been about. Hateful symbols like the Nazi flag and the Confederate flag from the beginning have been displayed at this convoy. This has clearly made Jewish and Muslim Canadians and racialized Canadians scared of violence. We heard it clearly in this house, in really eloquent words, what it means to a racialized person to see those flags. We have seen the harassment of citizens. And what is really unique about this, normally protests target the government, government policies, government decisions. But we see in this convoy that the target of the vast majority of the harassing behavior are citizens. They are harassing workers and citizens, including journalists. Violence is commonplace. We saw an example of this violence, an attempted arson downtown of an apartment building where people started a fire. When they exited, they taped the door. Take a moment to think what that means. They had the forethought that they wanted to set a fire and then tape the door to escape. This is not isolated. These are ongoing examples. Healthcare workers, healthcare workers who you would think in a pandemic, the people that have been saving our lives, the people in regular life that save our lives, the people that help deliver my baby girl, these healthcare workers are being targeted by intimidation. What protest? targets healthcare workers to the point that security and police are saying to healthcare workers, don't wear your scrubs, don't wear clothing that identifies you as a healthcare worker because you may be verbally or physically assaulted. That's a reality. That's happening right now. So it's certainly not peaceful. The number of complaints of harassment, of violence, of intimidation, targeting citizens, targeting families and kids, by the honking and the noise and the fireworks that really are disrupting the lives of families. Most of that activity happens at night when there's no one in parliament. So they're clearly not targeting parliament. It's certainly, the convoy is certainly not about helping workers or small businesses hurt by the lockdowns. The behavior and activity of this convoy has directly impacted workers. The blockade at the Coots border crossing is directly impacting truckers. Truckers are being prevented from coming across the border, Canadian truckers, mind you, that can't even get back home, can't bring goods into Canada because this convoy is blocking them from getting across the border. These are truckers who I've spoken with who are telling me that the conditions were pretty dire at Coots. There is no facilities for food or water or washroom. They're running out of food and water and they don't have the facilities to go to the washroom. And their trucks, while they were waiting for days, were running out of gas and running out of battery because they were stopped from getting across the border. Here in Ottawa, thousands of workers have lost wages because they are not able to work in what many have described as some of the worst of the lockdown by convoy protesters who are talking about ending lockdowns have created some of the worst lockdowns where businesses were forced to shut down. Workers can't, couldn't get to their jobs and small businesses had to shut down. We also heard multiple reports of retail workers being harassed for wearing masks, including young people. It's not even about truckers. 
I mentioned that the truckers that were being stopped, but the vast majority of truckers are vaccinated. This is not a concern from them. The, the convoy does not represent their concerns and they have concerns. Their concerns, truckers' actual concerns, if you speak with truckers and trucking associations, their concerns are wage theft. Often they're not getting paid the wages that they are entitled to after work that they've done. They're concerned about salaries in general, not having good pay. They're concerned about work conditions, not having safe work conditions. They're concerned about the cost of insurance. They're, wor- they're concerned about long driving hours that compromise their health and safety. That's their concerns. Those concerns aren't being raised. And the thing is, the occupiers, the organizers of this occupation have been very clear about their intention. They displayed it brazenly on their website with their MOU. They wanted to take over the streets of Ottawa and use intimidation to replace a democratically elected government. That was their stated intention. They stated it really clearly. They want to meet with the Senate and the Governor General and put in, pl- put in place an unelected committee to make decisions, replacing the democratically elected officials that are in this House of Commons. And what's been the response to this crisis? And the reason for this emergency debate, we are in a crisis. We're seeing this crisis spread beyond Ottawa to cities like Quebec, Montreal, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Sarnia, the border crossing, as well as Coots in Alberta, with the border with Montana. And what's the response been to this crisis? Well, the official opposition of Canada, what have they done? They have encouraged it. They've emboldened those who are harassing and intimidating their fellow citizens. That's been the response. The party of so-called law and order has embraced lawlessness and mob rule in the hope to gain political points. They're seeking political advantage by endorsing lawlessness and mob rule that harasses people, families, children, citizens. They've excused every incidence of violence by claiming it's just a few bad apples or in a very Trumpian turn, unsurprisingly, that there are very good people on both sides. Ludicrous. And the federal government has claimed that they are outraged. But ultimately, their answer to this problem, like so many others, is to say it's not their job. Now, I agree that they have offered help, but let's not ignore the fact that they've repeatedly said it's not their jurisdiction. And for everyone out there who likes to talk about jurisdiction, of course, We have a constitution that outlines the divisions of power and the responsibilities at different levels of government. But in a crisis, no one, no real person who's living in the crisis, no real family who's struggling with the honking day and night, who's got children that they can't get to school, small businesses that enforce a shutdown, real truckers who are worried about legitimate issues that this convoy does represent real people they are not interested in arguments over jurisdiction i want that to be clear normal humans real people in canada are not worried about jurisdiction they want to see solutions they want to see help they want to see the problem fixed that's what people want they don't want to see people searching for excuses they want to see leaders find solutions And that's what I believe. I believe a leader is someone who looks for a solution, doesn't try to find an excuse. At the same time that liberal cabinet ministers and MPs were claiming that they had done everything they could and that the city of Ottawa, in this case, had everything they needed, the city of Ottawa officials were pleading for more help. Effectively, all three levels of government have essentially told Canadians and the people in Ottawa particularly, that you're on your own. The only progress into getting some real change in this this occupation of Ottawa came from a court injunction won by a 21-year-old resident of Ottawa with the help of her lawyers. So I want to outline some of the things that we can and must do at the federal level, that members of parliament can and must do not only to end this occupation, 
but to help Canadians get to the other side of this pandemic. First off, the federal government has to stop using jurisdiction as an excuse for inaction. It's simply wrong. Today we hear that there is an attempt, there is an offer, or there is a start of discussions between uh, three levels of government that the federal government will work with municipal and provincial levels of government. Today, after almost 10 days of occupation, that prime minister should have been working on this from the beginning, bringing all levels of government together immediately. Once they saw the level of this crisis, once they saw the severity of it, that should have been, that step should have been taken right away. Clearly, this situation was not well handled. And it should not have taken this long to realize that. The convoy organizers were clear about their intent from the beginning. They were allowed to do exactly what they said they would do. Ottawa and other communities are asking for help. And it's not time to argue. It's time to deliver the help. So we want to see the federal government step up and provide the help necessary to these municipalities the prime minister should be meeting with the mayors and municipalities impacted and providing proactive help. Secondly, the federal government needs to use its authority and all the laws and tools that it has to shut down the funding of this occupation. Canadians are demanding answers about who funded this and who's encouraging this. And so are we. The same forces that fed divisions and intolerance and violence in the, United, in the United States, those that supported Donald Trump are now trying to interfere with our democracy. It is very clear. The intent of this convoy was to undermine democracy and the foreign dollars that are funding this, that is political interference are coming from the United States. The federal government has to use its tools to stop that funding. Thirdly, we need a plan. Canadians need to know what the plan is to get us to the other side of this pandemic. The vast majority of Canadians have been vaccinated. They have done their part. They have worn masks. They continue to follow healthcare guidelines and public health guidelines. But they're asking, what's next? How do we get past this pandemic? How do we get to the other side? What now do we need to do? People need a plan. They need a clear plan. And we're asking, we're asking Canadians, we're asking the federal government to work with provinces and territories and public health officials to develop that plan. People have done everything. They've got vaccinated. They've missed time with friends and family. They put off celebrations. They've endured the loss of loved ones. Now we owe it to Canadians to lay out a plan for how we get to the other side of this. And this plan is going to require testing to make sure we know if, if we're sick, if people are sick so they can prevent the spread. It's also going to mean that we help people to get continue to get vaccinated. And that's not just here in Canada, but around the world, because we know that the government can't keep putting the mega profits of pharmaceutical companies ahead of the health of everyone else. It's clear this virus will continue to keep mutating and new waves will arise and keep coming until we make sure the vaccine is available to everyone. So we need to do everything we can to make sure the vaccine is available to everyone. And we also need an emergency rescue mission for our healthcare system. For those people who've been worked to exhaustion, for our healthcare workers, for nurses, for those folks who put their lives on the line and protected us and cared for us, they need help. Our healthcare system has been pushed to the brink. And it is frankly inexcusable that two years into the pandemic, every outbreak, every new wave pushes our healthcare system to the brink again and again. We need sustainable, long-lasting funding to make sure our healthcare system is adequately resourced to deal with the pressures and demands. On top of that, people are paying the price of this pandemic with their lives. Cancer diagnoses and other serious illnesses are getting worse because people can't get access to the care that they need. Many people are living in pain because surgeries have been canceled. And people living with disabilities and those who are more likely to get sick and die from COVID-19 are terrified. They're terrified that if public health restrictions are lifted, it's their health and safety that will be sacrificed. So Canadians are angry and rightfully so. They're angry because they've seen 
that keeping profits flowing to millionaires and billionaires is more important than keeping their schools open. Many times this pandemic, big box stores were open, but kids couldn't go to school. They're angry that food costs more and that grocery store owners make bigger and bigger profits while frontline workers get their pays cut. People are angry that so many of the cracks exposed by this pandemic still have no solution, like in long-term care or in indigenous communities where the lack of decent housing and clean drinking water mean that the pandemic has hit them harder. People are angry and scared that the climate crisis is threatening their homes and livelihoods with more extreme weather like floods and fires. So we need to have a plan to respond to that. And we need to work together to deal with the issues facing Canadians. We were sent here just six months ago, elected in a minority government to get to work for people. We need to meet the real anger and frustration that people are experiencing right now with a clear vision about how to make life better. This starts by addressing the things that have clearly gotten worse in this pandemic, like finding a place to call home. It is simply impossible for so many Canadians to be able to find a roof over their heads, to find a home that's in their budget. That has to be fixed. Life is getting harder. People can't afford their groceries. They can't pay the bills. But it's not getting harder for everyone. The rich and powerful have gotten more rich and powerful throughout this pandemic. We've seen their wealth increase. So we need to restore the promise to Canadians that we can all share in a good future. Canadians sent us here not even six months ago to work for them, to deliver the solutions they need. We are committed to that and we need to be committed to getting us through the pandemic and rebuilding this country in a way that is good for everyone. That is what we have to do now. And that is all of us in this house. J'ai dit que uh, c'est vraiment... I said that this situation is very difficult. What's happening in Ottawa is a crisis. This is a crisis because this convoy is targeting citizens, workers, families. And this type of of protest is spreading across the country. We saw the same thing in Quebec City, and they said that they were going to return. So I have a solution. We've seen a lack of leadership on the part of the federal government. It, it, the federal government simply wasn't there to show leadership in this crisis. So we're calling on the federal government to meet with the uh, the mayors who have been hit by these protests, the prime minister must meet with them. And the federal government cannot continue to make excuses. It has to find solutions. It is clear that there is foreign interference in this convoy. There's a great deal of money flowing in from abroad, specifically from the United States. So we have to use federal intervention to stop this funding. Third, we need a plan. People have done everything right. They've gotten vaccinated. They've followed uh, health measures. They've followed public health directives. But now they don't know what the plan is to emerge from the pandemic. Canadians deserve a plan. The federal government must work with the provinces and territories and with public health experts to put forward a clear plan to emerge from this pandemic. And this plan must include increase in an increase in funding for our health care because it's inexcusable that after two years of this pandemic, Every time there's a new wave of COVID, we see that our health system, healthcare system is on the brink, and that is unacceptable. And lastly, we need to work together 
to solve the problems that people are dealing with. Housing prices, the cost of living, we have to solve these problems. Thank you. Hey, Kalatag, questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I listened uh, quite intently to the uh, leader of the NDP and his uh, discussion on this debate, and I thank him for initiating this uh, debate tonight. I heard him talk uh, about uh, um, uh, you know, the actions that have been going on outside and how he condemns the, the behaviour, and I would agree with him that uh, there certainly is a lot that's been happening. It's, a lot, it's more than just a few bad apples, as he rightfully pointed out. We're seeing instance after instance. This is not about one or two uh, bad apples here or there. But my question to him has to do with the fact that he indicated that he was pleased to see that a number, uh, that the three different levels of government were coming together. Um, where does he see that discussion happening? What, what suggestions does he have for that group? Certainly he wouldn't suggest that they negotiate with what's going on, given his previous comments. What does he recommend uh, to be some possible solutions that those three levels of government should be discussing? Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Well, the four things that I've outlined, I think that what we need to see is that the federal government stop looking for excuses and show leadership and say, we are here to help. We're going to do everything possible to help. And we're not going to hide behind excuses. We're going to be proactive and look for solutions. Uh, we also need to see that there is a clear plan to get us out of this pandemic. There are significant problems that uh, we've been up against for the past two years, and we need to see some real solutions. Our healthcare system cannot be in a position where it is at the brink of collapse every time there's an additional wave of COVID-19. So we need sustainable long-term funding, increase the funding for our, for our healthcare system, and we need to solve those problems. We also need to make sure that the money that is funding this, this uh, occupation is stopped. We know that there's a significant amount of foreign funding, particularly from the states, uh, that has to stop. And finally, there are a lot of frustrations that people feel in general. Canadians have been angry for a while now because they've done everything they can to get through this pandemic, but things have gotten worse. It's harder to own a home. It's harder to pay the bills. We need to work together in this house to provide solutions to those problems, to give people hope as an answer to the hate that we see rising. We need to give people hope as a way forward. Gianni Kalantar, questions and comments. The owner, honourable member for Kildonan St. Paul. The Honourable uh, Leader of the NDP for his remarks. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to say I do believe the NDP leader to be a compassionate man. I do believe that the NDP, with vigilance, fights for the marginalized. So that's why I'm, I'm just a bit surprised. I like his comments on the, he must be hearing them. His party must be hearing the damage that's been done to children, to seniors in isolation, job losses. I mean, the NDP is traditionally the party of standing up for, for workers. We've seen workers lose their jobs because of their personal health choices. We've seen significant damage done to children, done to teenagers, done to the mental health of the nation. Alcohol and drug dependency has gone up. We can go on and on and on about the impacts that Canadians have felt as a result of government actions to address the pandemic. And I think that outside what's happening is a result of that trauma that Canadians have experienced. So I would just like his comments on, on that, really. I, I would like to hear some compassion for the eruption of trauma that we're, we're seeing outside and across the country. River Burnaby South. I want to be clear who I stand with. I stand with the healthcare workers and I'm compassionate to the people that have given so much to us. And I denounce the fact that they are been made to be afraid to walk down the streets. I'm compassionate to the families of people in Ottawa who are wanting to send their kids to school that have been kept all night by people who want to overthrow the government. I'm compassionate to workers in downtown core who've been harassed and intimidated by these members of the convoy. I'm compassionate to young people who've been harassed and verbally assaulted by this. I'm compassionate to racialized people who see symbols of hate. I'm compassionate to Jewish people who saw swastika and, and Nazi flags flying. I'm compassionate to racialized people and black people who saw Confederate flags and say, how is this happening in our country? That's who we're standing with. We're standing with the people. We're saying, this is not Canada. This is not what we represent. This hate the desecration of war memorials, the vandalizing of the Terry Fox Memorial. This is not Canada. This is not who we stand for. And I want to stand with people who are saying this is wrong. I want to stand with the truckers who are saying this convoy doesn't represent us. 
We're worried about our wages being lost. Are we worried about wage theft? We're worried about work conditions. 90% of us are vaccinated. We don't care about what this convoy is talking about. They don't represent our, our concerns. I'm standing with those people. I'm standing with the workers. I'm standing with families. I'm standing with healthcare workers. I'm standing with people that have been terrorized by this convoy. And I'm saying to them, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to stand up for you. And I understand that people in Canada are frustrated and we have to respond to that frustration with a real plan to get us through the pandemic with real hope to deal with the problems that people are faced with. And we can do it. Any comments, questions and commentaires, l'honorable député. The honorable member. For uh, Avignon, La Métis, Matan, Matapédia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech and for the motion that he brought forward for this debate uh, this evening. It's about time that we uh, discuss this elephant in the room. And when I talk to my Liberal colleagues about uh, what their responsibility should be in this situation, well, they say it's not really a national issue. It's not uh, a federal issue. It happens at Ottawa. It's happening in Ottawa, so it should be the Ottawa police who look after that. So they talk about it jurisdiction. But I have a lot of trouble understanding that. I believe that this is a, a matter that uh, affects the federal government as well. And the, the federal government, government certainly has a, a share of responsibility in all this. So I'd like to hear him on that. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much for the question. And I absolutely agree. It is this lack of leadership that I am criticizing. The fact that at the federal government level, the government has continued to say, well, it's not our responsibility, it's not part of our jurisdiction. But when there's a crisis of this scope in the capital city of the country, then the federal government must act. The prime minister must take what is happening seriously, and he must say, yes, as a leader, I'm going to look for solutions. And, of course, there are provincial and territorial jurisdictions that are involved. Those have to be taken into account. But in a real crisis, a leader is someone who steps up, who says, yes, I want to help. I want to find solutions. I want to do everything in my power to help people who are in trouble. And that is what I want to happen here in Ottawa and in Quebec City because there are are, are supposed to be more protests there in a few weeks, and assistance must be given to the municipalities in a proactive fashion to help them. Questions and comments? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Burnaby South for his uh, leadership in successfully pushing for this important emergency debate tonight that all Canadians uh, can tune into and, and see the, the important issues that need to be discussed. The, the, many people have been saying that the, the federal government has been missing in action, and it's so important to have this debate tonight. I'd like to ask the member for Burnaby South uh, two questions. What would he say and what is his message to health care workers who have, for the last two years, as he said so eloquently, have been struggling to make sure that Canadians are taken care of despite uh, the health care cuts that we have seen over the course of the last few years that have been devastating. And what is his message to Canadians that see the ever, ever and ever more long uh, food bank lineups that are uh, often in precarious situations or have become homeless, that are seeing the increasing inequality in our country that have been exacerbated during this crisis? What is his message to those Canadians tonight? Good member for Burnaby South. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you to my colleague. Uh, first, I would say to healthcare workers, you're the ones who have saved our lives. You've put your lives on the line to care for us. At the minimum, we need to make sure that you're safe. And I am deeply offended that the people that have cared for us have been made a target by this convoy. The people that have put their lives on the line to keep us healthy are the ones that are now at risk of violence if they wear clothing that identifies them. I want healthcare workers to know that is wrong, that I stand with you. I'm going to continue to fight to make sure you're respected for your work, but more importantly, that you are properly resourced so you can do the work that you want to do. I've met nurses with tears in their eyes because they're underfunded and understaffed and overworked. 
I want you to know I'm going to fight to make sure there's proper funding for a publicly delivered healthcare system and that the federal government does its part. And to the people dealing with inequality, that has only gotten worse in this pandemic. You see a rigged system where those at the top continue to make massive profits while everyone else suffers. That is exactly why we need to provide solutions that speak to people. We need to put people at the heart of everything. And that means making sure workers have fair wages. That means we have got housing that's affordable and accessible to everyone. That means people shouldn't have to rely on a food bank, but have the dignity to be able to provide for themselves and their families and have the supports necessary to live a life of dignity. That's what we're fighting for. You are who we're fighting for. And we're going to stand with you every step of the way. Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the Honorable Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And at the outset, I'd like to indicate that I will be sharing my time with the Prime Minister. I want to thank the member for Burnaby South for his motion, and I want to thank all of my colleagues who are participating in this important debate tonight. Friends, the situation in Ottawa began as an interruption, and it has now become a sustained convoy and block blockade. And during the course of the last number of days, we've seen far too many examples of intimidation, harassment, violence, and hate. The residents here have effectively been held hostage in their own city. And many of them, especially young women, feel unsafe. They've been blockaded by an angry, loud, intolerant, and often violent crowd. Now, of course, all members in this House support the, rightful, the right to peaceful protest. And it is indeed one of the pillars of our democracy. But peaceful protests do not make people afraid to leave their homes. And this convoy has done that, and in doing so, it has crossed the line. Depuis le début, le gouvernement... Since the beginning, the federal government has been there to support the city and the Ottawa Police Service. As the situation has evolved, the RCMP has approved successive uh, requests for additional resources. After a call that I had with Mayor Watson last week and again today, I can confirm that the RCMP has received and approved a request for additional officers. Following another request this weekend, other officers have been made available. Since Saturday, over 275 members of the RCMP have been made available to help the Ottawa Police Service and to work under its command. The RCMP is in discussions with the, the Ottawa Police Service, the Ontario Provincial Police and other uh, partners and will continue to evolve its support as the situation evolves. I have requested information throughout the day from the RCMP Commissioner and from other representatives to make sure that we are doing what we can to end this convoy and re-establish law and order in Ottawa. I am in discussions with my provincial and municipal counterparts and I spoke with the Solicitor General of Ontario, Minister Jones, as well as with the, the Mayor of Ottawa, Mr. Watson. The situation remains very concerning on the ground. We have seen progress made over the last number of hours. We've seen charges laid. We have seen investigations ongoing. We are seeing um, the cutting off of propane and fuel to participants in the convoy. And we are seeing structures removed and we are seeing the dispersing of crowds safely and respectfully and with the excellent performance of our law enforcement. Hundreds of charges will continue uh, to be laid where appropriate and those decisions will be taken uh, independently by our police services. In the weeks that follow, we will need to be very clear that we cannot find ourselves in a similar situation again, Mr. Speaker. We must also be clear that we cannot expect to yield to the reckless forces that are outside as a way of imposing reckless change in public policy through disruptive activities like the blockades that we're seeing, the bringing in of heavy equipment and scaring and intimidating tactics. For now, however, we must continue to work together and assess what needs to be done. I've also been asking for operational updates through the day as well as daily updates to make sure that me and my partners are doing everything that we can to help restore the rule of law. 
And I'm confident that today's announcement to, of a table being convened between all orders of government will help to make sure those on the ground have all the tools and the resources that they need to get the job done and to see the situation diffuse. Colleagues, the pandemic is approaching its second anniversary in Canada, and I want to assure you, and every member in this House, and all Canadians, that we all want to get back to normal life. And that day is coming. Canadians have been united, and we've persevered through it all. Our government has taken a responsible, evidence-based approach, using science and using good faith efforts day in and day out to protect one another. Because Canadians have chosen this path, thousands of lives have been saved. We cannot allow an angry crowd to reverse a course that is saving lives now here in this final stretch. This should never be a precedent for how to make policy or law in Canada. We believe in peace, order and good government. The stories that are coming from communities from coast to coast to coast of people who are looking out for one another, who are sticking up for each other, who are giving back despite the fat fatigue throughout the course of the pandemic is the narrative, is the story of the resilience and the unyielding spirit of Canadians. And more than ever, we need to support each other. We need to work side by side, regardless of the level of government or party stripe, to take care of one another. Canadians deserve to feel safe in their communities, and I know that all members will join me in that, in that, uh, in that spirit, Mr. Speaker. And I will just go on uh, to say, uh, before um, yielding the floor, uh, that um, I know this is a particularly difficult moment uh, for the residents of Ottawa. I know that businesses have had to shut, that families have not been able to take their kids to daycare, that seniors have not been able to get around, that disabled persons have not had access to public transportation, that people do not feel safe, that the reports of intimidation and harassment and violence and the images that we have seen over the course of the last number of days have been very disconcerting to all of us. Those of us who respect the rule of law, those of us who expect that while we can hold disagreements, um, it is certainly uh, never a justification to cross the line and to uh, not respect other Canadians and to break the law. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm very proud of the fact that this government, since the very beginning of this convoy, has done everything that we can to put the resources, the support uh, to our police services locally, uh, including the provision of some 275 Mounties who have now been deputized and who are now able to enforce the law locally. And I want to take a moment to thank the members of the RCMP who are assisting the OPS in dealing with this very challenging situation. Mr. Speaker, uh, I will say that um, given the, 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 the great length of time uh, that has passed since the beginning of the pandemic, that of course everyone will feel a degree of fatigue and we obviously uh, share that sentiment right across the country. But we should not confuse the sharing of that emotion and the sense of wanting to get back to life as normal with a lack of respect for the law. And that is where we must draw the line, Mr. Speaker, and that is where we will draw the line. And we do it uh, because these are the shared sense of values uh, that, on which our country is built on. We do it out of respect uh, for those uh, who have worked so hard to see those values and those principles enshrined in our charter, to ensure that they're not just words on a page, to ensure that there is a sense of of unity and common ground uh, that sees itself manifest in our daily lives. And we haven't seen that in the past number of days in Ottawa. And I would hope that all members would recognize that, that it does us no good uh, to yield to perhaps some of the darker angels of our nature. We need to be listening to uh, the better angels of our nature, especially when those values are tested, especially when we have vigorous disagreements around uh, the pandemic. But those dis disagreements can never be a justification uh, for this, the kind of conduct and the kind of behavior that we have seen here in Ottawa 
And that is why I think I am calling, and indeed I hope all members are calling, on the convoy to go home, to contribute to debate, but not to break the law, not to make the members of Ottawa and those who live here feel unsafe. That's what Canadians do, Mr. Speaker. Canadians respect the law. No one is above the law. And we will get this through this together. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Merci beaucoup. Questions and comments? Question and commentaire. The Honourable Member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm having a flashback as I'm listening to this member's comments. Got elected in 2019, and shortly thereafter we had protests with the, regarding the Wet'suwet'en. All across Canada, billions of dollars were lost. And here I'm hearing words like, this is enshrined in Parliament and rule of law, and, and I, I can appreciate that. Uh, we don't support radicalism. But I'm just, th this is extremely rich for him to make these type of comments. And my, my question, two questions, one is, has he gone out and talked to some of these people? I think that they, a lot of the ones, when I've wandered there, and yes, there, there is people, of, there are some people that certainly, sh they've taken way too far. But have you gone out and talked, and have, what responsibility will he and the, and the government take for agitating and calling them racist and, and, and uh, just marginalizing millions of Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with due respect to my colleague, what's ironic is that he says that he and the members of his party uh, respect the values of the Charter, but then we see the member of Carleton and other of his colleagues go and put around some of the individuals who have been breaking the law, who have been intimidating and harassing and causing great disruption to ordinary folks who just want to go about their daily lives, Mr. Speaker. And if my colleague cannot appreciate the distinction uh, between having a vigorous debate about the way in which we are going to get through this pandemic and then crossing the line and using that disagreement as a justification for the very flagrant disregard for the law that we have seen in Ottawa, then that is something that I think he and his party needs to reflect on very, very carefully, Mr. Speaker. Very carefully. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? L'honorable. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamétis, Matan, Matapédia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for being here in the House this evening. It's appreciated. When I ask questions in the House, often uh, they tell me that, uh, you know, it's not federal jurisdiction, that it should be uh, the City of Ottawa or the Ottawa Police Service uh, that should be dealing with this situation. And... Uh, they've sent new RCMP uh, officers. That's very good, and we're happy about that. But uh, the city of Ottawa has officially asked for help from the provincial and federal governments. They did that this morning. What are they going to say to the city of Ottawa? Will they offer a bit more help uh, than just uh, simply sending more RCMP officers? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. President. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. The question of jurisdiction and of decision-making and operational decision-making uh, is, is very clear. The decisions that the police service makes on the ground are 100% under their jurisdiction, and we need to respect that jurisdiction. That's one of the principles, one of the values uh, that's at the the foundation of our democracy. Earlier today, I spoke with Mayor Watson, along with my colleagues, and during that discussion, we were able to have a good dialogue. We discussed their requests, and we have already offered additional RCMP officers, over 275 RCMP officers who are now working on the ground, who are offering their support to the Ottawa Police Service. And with their support, we've been able to make progress today, but we need to continue working this way. We need to bring an end to this convoy for the respect of the people of Ottawa. Thank you.
Question and commentary, une question de... Questions and comments, a very short 30 second question. Answered the Honorable. I'm sorry? Oui? Un appel au règlement. A point of order. I believe that the member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie is ready to ask his question. No. His hand is not raised, and he said no. So I would like to remind the honorable members that uh, they should stand up or uh, uh, let me know, let the chair know if they want to speak. I see the honorable member. He's on my screen, but I don't think it's the time for that. But I would like to thank the honorable uh, member uh, for their, uh, his help. The honorable member for Kingston and the Islands. Question, and uh, then hopefully a very brief uh, response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very briefly, you know, one of the arguments that we continue to hear um, out there is that it's just a bad apple in the bunch. But yet, incident after incident, we're seeing uh, that there are many bad apples uh, in this bunch, those that the Conservatives are embracing time and time again. I'm curious if the Minister can uh, provide his thoughts on that argument that we seem to hear quite a bit. Honourable Minister, in 30 seconds or less, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for the very thoughtful question, and I think it underlines um, a pattern that we've seen from the Conservative Party in an effort to minimize the harm, the intimidation, the violence, and yes, the expressions of hate. I heard one of my colleagues uh, uh, say it just earlier tonight in the context of this take note debate. Um, we have to understand that there are certain boundaries that we do not cross as Canadians. The flying of Confederate flags, the demonstration of swastikas on our Parliament Hill is not only an affront to our values, which are articulated in the Charter, it's an affront to everyone that has survived the Holocaust, that has experienced racism, and it is an affront to who we are as Canadians, Mr. Speaker. And these are not isolated incidents. It has been rampant, and that is why it is critically important that we have to rely on our law enforcement to disperse this convoy so that we can get back to life as normal. Thank you very much. Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, because Parliament is working. We're here to do our job as government, as parliamentarians, because our democracy is working. Just a short time ago, we had an election in this country where we asked Canadians how they wanted to keep fighting this pandemic. And their answer was clear. Canadians chose vaccines. They chose science. They chose to protect one another because Canadians know that's how we get back to the things we love. Over the last few weeks, there have been demonstrations across the country and particularly here in Ottawa. Obviously, people have the right to demonstrate. They have the right to disagree with the government and to be heard. This is a fundamental right that we will always protect and uphold as a democracy. But people do not have the right to block streets illegally, to harass their fellow citizens, people who want to go to work, who want to go to school. They don't have the right to insult those who choose to wear a mask, to get vaccinated, to be there for their fellow citizens are trying to blockade our economy, our democracy, and our fellow citizens' daily lives. It has to stop. The people of Ottawa don't deserve to be harassed in their own neighborhoods. They don't deserve to be confronted with the inherent violence of a swastika flying on a street corner or a Confederate flag, or the insults and jeers just because they're wearing a mask. That's not who Canada, who Canadians are. That's not what Canadians demonstrated over the past two years of consistently, continually being there for each other. 
The people of Ottawa, indeed people across the country, deserve to have their safety respected and deserve to get their lives back. From the beginning of this demonstration, our government has been in close contact with the Mayor of Ottawa and municipal and provincial officials. So far, the RCMP has mobilized nearly 300 officers to support the Ottawa Police Services and is ready to do more. Yesterday, the City of Ottawa declared a state of emergency. We're convening a table with the relevant federal and municipal partners to further strengthen our response. The federal government will be there with whatever resources the province and the city need in this situation. Le ministre des Transports. The Minister for Transport is working with uh, his uh, provincial counterparts to make sure that contraveners suffer the consequences. Speaker, this blockade, these protesters, they're not the story of this pandemic. They are not the story of Canadians in this pandemic. From the very beginning, Canadians stepped up to be there for one another, to support their neighbours, to support their elderly, to support our frontline workers by doing the right things, by wearing masks, by getting vaccinated, by following public health restrictions. We're all tired of this pandemic. We're frustrated, we're worn down, none more worn down than our frontline health workers who've been going flat out for two years. But everyone's tired of having to wear masks, having to follow public health restrictions. Families like mine just last week that test positive, you know, have to follow public health rules, have to isolate themselves. Nobody wants to do that. I don't know how many conversations parents have had to have with kids about not going to birthday parties, but not getting to have sleepovers. This pandemic has sucked for all Canadians. But Canadians know the way to get through it is to continue listening to science, continuing to lean on each other, continuing to be there for each other. Those who are shouting at others because they're wearing a mask do not define what it is to be the majority of Canadians, the vast majority of our country. The majority of Canadians are the millions upon millions who have been vaccinated. Almost 90,000 today alone. And tens of thousands who were week after week continue to receive their first dose, Mr. Speaker. Country, Canadians step up to get their first dose of vaccination. That is the story of the country people who've been there for each other. Everyone's tired of COVID. But these protests, these protests are not the way to get through it. We shouldn't be fighting one another. We should be united to fight the virus. One another. It's a fight against the virus. And Canadians know the tool to get through it is science, is vaccinations, is continuing to do what people have done from the very beginning. Step up for one another. Make the difficult choices. More than ever, Canadians need to continue to be there for each other, to be united. I've seen members of the opposition call for an end to the blockades. I salute that. This is a time to put national interests ahead of partisan interests. 
This is the time for responsible leadership. Democracy in Canada didn't happen by accident, and it won't continue without effort. It was a deliberate choice made decades and decades ago to come together, to respect one another, to be there for each other. And every generation, every decade, every day, Canadians continue to live that, choosing to support each other, choosing to do what's necessary to get through another long winter night, to get through another difficult season, to get through a pandemic. We have in this country a set of rules and laws, and principles that we live by, that keep us safe, that protect us. And over the past two years, we've seen measures brought in to keep us safe, measures loosened when things got better. We will continue to follow public health advice. We will continue to trust science as Canadians work to get through this. That's what people expect. I know people are tired. But we've seen it through the various waves and their receding over the past months. These pandemic restrictions are not forever. But we have to make sure that our shared values and the idea of Canadians being there for each other, supporting one another, respecting each other. That has to be here to stay. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are all continuing to stand for, Mr. Speaker. Merci beaucoup. Question and commentaires, questions and comments, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for participating and being part of this debate. Uh, I look at our country, Mr. Speaker, and I've never seen it as divided as, as it is now under this Prime Minister, whether it's regional lines, whether it's ethic, eth, uh, ethnic lines, whether it's people's health care choices. Uh, this, this country is more divided than ever, and the Prime Minister talks about things like respecting each other, and we are not fighting against each other, we are fighting a virus, and I, I have two very simple questions for him. When he decided to introduce the vaccine mandate, he believed it was the right thing to do. Does he regret calling people names who, who didn't take the vaccine? Does he regret calling people misogynist and racist and just escalating and, and, and poking sticks at them? and being so divisive to individual Canadians that he might not disagree with, that he might have thought were wrong. Does he regret that? And will he agree to meet with the leaders here, the other opposition leaders and myself, so that we can talk about a solution in the way that he's described? Mr. Speaker, this is, this, we are in uncharted charter territory. We are at a, a crisis point, not only with what's going on out the doors and, and across the country, but the country overall. And so much of it is because of the things that he has said and done. Does he regret his words? And will he work with us so that we can find some resolution? Thank you. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think people watching expect me to disagree with uh, the leader of the official opposition. Um, I just didn't think it would be about something so fundamental. She is telling people tonight that Canada has never been so divided, never been so angry a one region against another. And I disagree. What we have seen over these past two years has been Canadians stepping up for each other in extraordinary ways. Canada has one of the highest vaccination rates of our peer countries around the world. Why? And it's not because Canadians love getting needles. It's because Canadians trust science. Canadians trust each other to do the right things. It's in our national psyche of being able to be there for our neighbours, being able to push uh, a car out of a snowbank uh, for a perfect stranger, being leaning on each other. These are the things that define Canadians. And what we saw through these past two years 
It's people stepping up for our frontline health workers, stepping up for our grocery store clerks, leaning on each other, supporting our seniors, supporting our young people, young people getting there, uh, stepping up to do what they could around the house to help out while their parents, while they're all locked down. This is a story of a country that got through this pandemic by being united and a few people shouting and waving swastikas does not define who Canadians are. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis Matin Matapédia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his presence here this evening. It's very much appreciated. We were looking forward to seeing him again. We were wondering where he was. I understand that he was affected by COVID-19, so I'm happy to see him in good health. But when there's a crisis, we need a present leader that sends a clear and strong message. And unfortunately, that's not what happened over the past couple of days. Having not done so, the message that I sent to the protesters is, great, stay, stick around. Because we're not saying that there will be consequences. So does the Prime Minister not believe that tonight is the perfect opportunity to send a clear message to the protesters for the days to come? Because we all agree that protesting is legitimate, but the way this protest has grown out of control is no longer legitimate. So what message would the Prime Minister like to send them this evening? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I would like to thank the Honourable Member for her presence and for her question this evening. The reality is, is that we have been clear from the very beginning of the protest. It's perfectly legitimate to protest, but it is not legitimate to harass and block our Parliament and our democracy. Disturbing the people of a community and we have also been very clear from the very beginning that we are here to work and support the Ottawa Police Service, the City of Ottawa, which is doing its work, the province if necessary. We are here with resources in order to allow this issue to come to an end. But we will continue to be anchored in democracy that elected this government to keep Canadians safe, and that is the message that I've been sending from the very beginning, and that is the message that we will continue to send. Reprise du débat, resuming debate. Oui, uh, un peu le reg we have a point of order. The Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Mr. Speaker, we know that in debates like this, there is a division between each and every party. Each party has the opportunity to ask a question. I know that the MP for Burnaby South is waiting to ask a question to the Prime Minister. The rules are the rules. We only have a certain amount of time for questions, so we can't do much about that, unfortunately. If the Honourable Member would like to change the rules and regulations of the House, then perhaps he should bring that before the appropriate committee if changes are desired for the proceedings of the House of Commons. I have nothing else to add on the matter. The Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby, very quickly, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I move, uh, because we are all here together, united. I move that we grant two minutes for a question from the Member for Burnaby South. We'd like to confirm in the motion that was accepted earlier. There is no place available to propose new motions or new changes. My apologies, but those are the rules. Those are the rules and regulations of the House. I have to remain within the confines of these parameters. For uh, Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, very glad to be speaking to this pressing issue that has uh, really got Canadians glued to their televisions, that the convoy has been really all over Ottawa and across every major city in Canada, and we've even seen it spread to other countries around the world. So I'm very, very glad that after two long years of division on COVID that we are finally beginning to debate uh, this important matter in this historic House of Democracy. Uh, I did want to begin my remarks by, uh, actually I forgot to say this right off the bat, but I'll be splitting my time with the member from Megantic et l'Érable. Um, so I, I did want to begin my speech a little bit about talking about what kind of politician I think you have to be to, to make a difference in this place. And I think every MP in this House has a bit of a different style. 
And uh, when I first came here, I, I really, for me, I wanted to be a bridge builder. And that really came from when, where I grew up and where I went to university. I grew up in a small farming community in rural Manitoba to four generations of Canadian farmers. So I had very entrenched uh, rural prairie upbringing and values. And then I went to university at McGill University in Montreal, a very prestigious, uh, elite, uh, liberal sort of university. And I met kids from all over the world with all different political views and worldviews and really got an incredible experience learning about how other people think about the world. And uh, I did find that often while parties will disagree and someone will say, I'm a staunch liberal, I'm a staunch conservative, or I'm a staunch NDP, there's actually a lot more that we have in common. And something that I found that all parties, I, I believe, at their core have in common is that they, they do believe that all Canadians and all people of of this world to deserve to be treated with dignity, compassion, and respect. And so that's how I approach these divisive issues that we as MPs encounter all the time, and they're never get difficult, or they're never easy to talk about. They're very difficult issues. And I, I look to try to build a bridge uh, so that we can come together as Canadians and agree on a peaceful path forward. And that's how I've been trying to look at the very divisive situation in Ottawa right now. And uh, what I'd really like to see is a prime minister who calls for national unity. Last week I spoke in the House about a lot of the division that we're seeing in the country between east versus west, rural versus urban, and uh, particularly now during the pandemic. And we have heard so much trauma from our constituents. If there's any member in this house that does not believe Canadians have been through trauma these past two years, they clearly have not been doing their job and listening to their constituents, Mr. Speaker. It has been horrific, the things that I've heard. We hear young children who are so depressed they don't want to eat. Eating disorders are through the roof. We've heard seniors and elderly in our care homes who've opted for medical assistance in dying rather than live one more month through isolation in care homes. I have had widowed elderly women call and cry to me on the phone of how lonely they are and they don't want to go on. I've had grown men who've called me crying because their businesses are falling apart. We know divorces, abuse at home, alcohol dependency, drug dependency, all of these terrible things are up in our country because people are just trying to cope and are breaking down. So from that perspective, I don't really see what's going on across the country is all that surprising. To me, it seems like an eruption of something that's been simmering of pain and trauma and frustration for two long years. And governments have not been listening to that pain and trauma despite having rapid tests, vaccines, and all different types of tools and scientific knowledge. Governments have repeatedly, repeatedly relied on harsh lockdown measures and divisive mandates to control this virus. Meanwhile, we are seeing a Prime Minister who today got up in the House and again, again othered Canadians who don't agree with him. This is a man for six years said diversity is our strength, but if anybody doesn't agree with everything he says, you're in the bad books and you don't get a chance to be heard. You don't have a right to be heard. Damn. And again, last week I brought I brought to the floor of the House of Commons remarks he had said during that $600 million unnecessary election. He said so many times before he called that election, vaccines for all those who want them, vaccines for all those who want them. It's a choice. He said that repeatedly, must have said it a thousand times. And then with da within days of calling that election, he was yelling into a microphone at a liberal rally that you have the right not to get vaccinated, but you don't have the right to sit next to someone who is. So. To me, that doesn't really seem like someone, what did he say in his remarks today? He said, this is not a fight against one another, it's a fight against the virus. Those remarks, Mr. Speaker, suggest very different, very different. So when it comes to an election and scoring political points and winning votes, the Prime Minister is very happy to divide Canadians and pit right. them against each other for their different personal health views. I, for one, am sick and tired of seeing politicians use this as an evil wedge tool to rip Canadian families apart. I can't tell you how much anger and tears I saw in the last election. That was six months ago. And now it's even worse. Neighbors won't talk to each other. I mean, Christmas family dinners. I mean, even if there wasn't lockdowns during Christmas, it's almost a nightmare to get families in the same room now. If there's one person who doesn't share their views, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. Colleagues at work. Again, last week I shared the story of a social worker, a young mom I met during the pandemic uh, on her front step. 
Uh, she was uh, sharing with me a story that she got Hero of the Year award last year. And this year, she, and she had gone above and beyond to help people during a pandemic. Before there was vaccines, she stepped up, Hero of the Year at her job. And now she said no one would talk to her and she was going to get fired because of one personal health choice that she made. And as much as others tried, there was no convincing this woman otherwise. And I just, I don't know how public health officials and public officials get behind policies that do that to Canadians. We are one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. And this government continues to use that as a bludgeon to get people to submit to their policies. It's, it, I've never thought that entering politics two and a half years ago at a federal level, we would see a, a government that was so keen to divide Canadians on something so deeply personal. And as I've said before, and I'll say it again, I denounce any hateful and violent act outside. Whoever is up to no good, who's ever up to that kind of mischief and that kind of hateful rhetoric and those actions, shame on you. But what I'm seeing across the country is people mobilizing because their governments have not listened to them for two years. They've been experiencing trauma for two years and no one is listening to them. And so what choice do they have left? These people have all emailed their MPs. They've called them. They've been turned down by their MPs. I'm sure there's members uh, of the public from Papineau, from the member, the prime minister's riding, who've reached out, who have a different perspective on this, who've been traumatized and fired from their jobs for a personal health choice. There are millions of Canadians, millions of them, that are, have been deeply ostracized from society. And when you don't listen to those people, they mobilize. And we've seen protests across this country for, cent for over a century. And rightfully so, we have the right to peacefully protest. And I would ask the protesters outside that they do their best and stay vigilant to stay peaceful. But we are seeing other governments around the world step up with lower vaccination rates and say, look, we hear you, you've been traumatized, we're moving forward. Here's the deadline, this is the plan. No more mandates, no more masks, no more distancing. You can travel, you can live your life, you can hug each other again. Here's the date, this is the plan, here's the thresholds. None of that in Canada. Absolutely none of that from the Prime Minister. People have been traumatized and they're mobilizing because they need some hope, they need somebody in this house of privilege to come down from our ivory towers and say, okay, little people, we hear you. So sorry we've traumatized you for two years. We're going to step up and we're going to give you some hope. Here's a deadline. The member opposite is laughing. The people in this house are incredibly privileged. You've kept, pardon me, that member has kept his job. Thousands of Canadians have lost their job. And he's laughing about his, privilege, his own privilege. What has he done to serve members that are marginalized during this pandemic in his community, Mr. Speaker, but laugh at them in this House of Commons? Shame on that member. I would, I would ask this government to do everything they can. I asked them this two years ago in the House. Go to other countries, see what they're doing. What are the best practices? How is it that other de highly advanced, developed nations like the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, how, the United States, how is it that they have all the same tools we have, they have all the economic resources we have, they've done, their citizens have done all the work and made all the sacrifices. Why is it that those citizens get a plan for hope? of when we get back to normal, when we get our lives back, when the people outside, you think they want to be here, Mr. Speaker? Those people don't want to be here. They want to be working. But that right was taken away from them. When is there going to be a plan from this Prime Minister? When is there going to be compassionate leadership to say, this is, when, this is it, you've done the work, here's the tools, we're moving forward. Our public health doctors have told us as well, it's time to move forward. It's time to revisit these harsh mandates and divisive policies. Mr. Speaker, I will just end on this, and I, I, I'm very passionate about this. I think we all are from our different perspectives, but I will say I will continue to be a bridge builder, to reach out, to try to understand where others are coming from, and I would, I would, it would just be incredible if we could see members of the Liberal Party, the Prime Minister, do the same. Time to build a bridge, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments, question and commentaire, the Honourable Member for Halifax. Mr. Speaker, I just want to first thank the member from Burnaby South for uh, instigating this, uh, this debate tonight and for his remarks. Now, the member from Kildonan and St. Paul knows that the interim Conservative leader, the member from Portage Lisgar, encouraged her party to not discourage protesters to leave, but rather encourage them to stay and make the occupation the Prime Minister's problem. 
Shortly afterward, when confronted with the horrific and violent deeds of the occupiers, their interim leader recycled Donald Trump's hateful and disgusting torn de phrase. There were good people on both sides. And even tonight, in this very House, in this very debate, that same interim leader tried to stoke the fires of division when asking, again, she did this, when asking the Prime Minister questions. Perhaps the next thing the interim leader will say is uh, she'll tell the occupiers to stand back and stand down. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, the behavior by some of the members on the side of the, member, the, side of the House of the member of Kildonan and St. Paul's has been repugnant as the behavior of those out in the streets. So I'd like to ask the member how in the world she believes the actions of her leader and her colleagues will help to end this unthinkable and un-Canadian disaster unfolding outside of these very doors. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the question from the member who laughed when I said that members of Parliament in this House have extraordinary privilege. We've been able to keep our jobs. Actually, I've never seen that member before, so it's great to see him participating. Um, what I would say is that I'm very proud of our leader for stepping forward today and putting forward a, a call to action to the Prime Minister. She asked him today, will he meet with members of the other parties? Will they get together, sit at a table and say, look, like this is unprecedented. This is an unprecedented demonstration in Canadian history. It's time that you get together, put partisanship aside, and work together to see how we're going to have a peaceful resolution to this. As the critic for public safety, the shadow minister for public safety for Canada, Mr. Speaker, I, have, I am growing increasingly concerned that without a peaceful resolution and compassionate leadership from this prime minister and that member of parliament, that we are going to see this escalate. They're just stoking the fires anyway. They're just pouring diesel on it, so to speak, and raising the temperature with their mean, la with their mean language, their name calling when they should be being responsible and lowering the temperature. So that's what I'd like to see from Liberal members of Parliament and from the Prime Minister, some compassionate leadership. It's time to get together at the same table and talk about solutions. Questions and comments? Question and comment, the Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her speech. You know, as I walk through this occupation, I often reflect as the veteran spokesperson for the NDP on the people who fought for us, who fought for other countries to stand up and speak out against any kind of oppression, the people who fought for the freedom to have a protest in this country. And I know that I just read an article today that spoke about a veteran who was so upset to see people parking on the tomb of the unknown soldier that he went there to take pictures of those license plates so that he would make sure that they were removed and that those people would be held accountable. And right now in our nation's capital, both that monument and the Aboriginal monument are surrounded by fences to protect those monuments for the very people who fought for us for us to have the privilege to stand in this house. So I'm just wondering if this member could talk about where the line is to stand up against people who are comet causing concerning violence and doing things that we should all be appalled by. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the member opposite's uh, the question. I think it's incumbent upon all members of Parliament to stand up against violence and bullying and divisive mm -hmm. rhetoric. And uh, I've seen that repeatedly. I have done that repeatedly, particularly when, again, we see a prime minister of this country who for over a year and a half said that vaccines for all those who want them, vaccines for all those who want them, and then within days of calling a $600 million unnecessary election that further divided wounded, traumatized Canadians, within days from saying vaccines a choice, he said, you have the right not to get vaccinated, but you have no right to sit next to someone who is. That's the kind of dehumanizing language that incites people and gets their temperature up and gets them mobilizing. That is the type of language that is irresponsible that we need to bring down. That is not a prime minister who, that prime minister should not be saying things like that. And what I would say to the NDP is I, you know, I'm from rural Manitoba, we used to vote NDP for decades. And you want to know why? Because it was because the NDP stood up for the marginalized, people who didn't have a voice in this privileged House of Commons. Where has their voice been from the thousands of workers who've lost their jobs? Where's the voice for the social worker who was too afraid to get a vaccine and lost her job? Where is their advocacy for them? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Reprise du débat. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to commend my colleague for her excellent speech. Mr. Speaker, this evening I might have expected for the Prime Minister's first official public appearance since the beginning of this uh, protest that is uh, happening on, the, on Parliament Hill, I might have expected that the Prime Minister would announce something. I might have expected that the Prime Minister might would tell us what plans he has, what measures he's going to take so that we can find a peaceful solution to this situation that has gone on for too long already, that has uh, been too tough on people in Ottawa, that has uh, been here for too long for Canadians. I might have expected the Prime Minister to tell us what his plan was. I thought that since he was coming out of hiding, the Prime Minister would say to Canadians, well, these are the measures to come. These are the steps we're going to take to emerge from the pandemic. This is how, uh, slowly but surely, but also objectively, this is how we're going to lift medical measures, uh, health measures that we have imposed on Canadians for two years now. And I'm just thinking, you know, in his area of federal jurisdiction, just for files that are under his uh, jurisdiction, I wouldn't, uh, I wasn't expecting him to go further. There are 86% of Canadians who are vaccinated, I thought he might say. There are 90% uh, of uh, Canadians who, have, uh, who are vaccinated, and then people have gotten the booster dose as well. So given this situation, which is the envy of the world, really, I might have expected the Prime Minister to tell us, well, now this is what we're going to do going forward in the coming weeks, in the coming months, to finally return to normal life. The provinces have done so. The provinces are doing this right now. Other countries are doing it as well. They're announcing the lifting of these measures, Mr. Speaker. Why? Well, because this virus is not at all the same as uh, the one that uh, hit us at the very beginning of the pandemic, but especially because the tools that we have to deal with it now are so much better than what we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Because at the beginning, we didn't know what the virus was. We had no vaccine. We, there was no screening, no testing. The only option we had was to shut down while we waited for scientists uh, to tell us what they could do. And Canadians did that, and we were proud to support these measures to ensure that Canadians could stay home and stay safe. Two years later, 86% of uh, Canadians are vaccinated. We were asked to get vaccinated. 86% of us did. So two years later, we're vaccinated. The Prime Minister, who must be uh, the only person to tell us this in the entire country, says... Continue to get vaccinated. I'd have no plans to lift the, uh, the health measures. But keep getting vaccinated. We're for the vaccination. We're for vaccinations. The Conservatives were the first to rise in this House to call on the government to uh, reach an agreement with pharmaceutical companies so that we had enough vaccine for everyone. I remember that. I was here. They were pretty slow to act, Mr. Speaker. Of course, they were slow to shut the borders down, too, and also they were slow to recognize that there was a pandemic, Mr. Speaker. But they were very quick to uh, shut down uh, uh, the tactical group on vaccine information. It's as if this government, from the outset, has always been a step behind. But now Canadians need to hear something more positive. They need hope. How... Will this Prime Minister, how does he see us emerging from this crisis, Mr. Speaker? That's what we want to know. That's what we wanted to hear from the Prime Minister this evening. That's what I'd like to hear from my Liberal colleagues. Instead of hearing them repeat in all the media, everywhere, all kinds of uh, false positions uh, about us on this side of the House. That's the reality. It's easy for them. They don't take the responsibilities. They remain in hiding, and they wait for maybe for someone else to fix this problem. But nothing happens, Mr. Speaker. I saw the mayor of Ottawa. 
launch a cry for help. I saw police officers begging for help so that someone should stand up somewhere so that this situation can come to an end. We are, the, the, we are, we have a dire need for leadership. We're not seeing any leadership. We can't change things across Canada because Mayor Watson is looking after his, municipal, his municipality and uh, he has his hands full. He calls for help from the Prime Minister. He says nothing. He remains in hiding. He says nothing. And all of a sudden, he emerged to make a speech tonight that said absolutely nothing. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. And that's what Canadians are sick and tired of. At first, with the COVID, with COVID, we knew someone who knew someone who had had COVID. It, it was far away from us. But we were scared. But today... I got COVID over the holidays. My kids got COVID over the holidays. My wife did too. My neighbor got COVID. But it, the government is still applying the same rules as the very beginning of the pandemic two years ago. And they've broadened these rules as well. And if that's not throwing oil on the fire, if that's not exacerbating the situation, then I don't know what is. That's exactly what the government's doing right now. Mr. Speaker, today the Conservative leader called on the Prime Minister to commit to a process that might see a peaceful solution to this conflict. She wrote to the Prime Minister with a letter that was published also to the other two opposition leaders. The official opposition, well, that's us. But this letter went to all the party leaders. What that letter asks for is that all four of those leaders should meet to discuss a solution in order to calm the situation down, in order to end this demonstration so that Ottawa citizens can, can go back to their normal lives. Yes, those who are listening... This, become, this is coming from the Conservative leader, this proposal that was sent to all party leaders. And I'm going to continue. Canadians want this impasse to be solved peacefully. They need such a peaceful solution. Yes, because everyone's sick and tired. Everyone is fed up. I can feel it in my writing. I can feel it everywhere. And what we need is for a real leader to stand up and tell us what the plan is to emerge from this crisis. You know... Their, uh, you know, Premier Legault talked about the light at the end of the tunnel. That didn't work so well, but we do need to emerge from this crisis. So it's time to uh, take politics out of this solution because Canadians have uh, taken the measures needed to ensure the safety of their communities and their families. And they were encouraged to hear Dr. Tam say that we have to find a more sustainable way of dealing with the pandemic. She also re recommended that all uh, public health policies be re-examined with the provinces and territories so that we can uh, return to a certain type of normality. Dr. Tam said that. That was her. She is saying that we have to get back to normal. We have to start to plan for this. We have to start to deal with the variant, with the virus, with the COVID. Yes, that's her who said that. Because... Canadians' health is physical, but mental health is a big part of that, too. So we need to balance both of, both of those. And I think that's where we're at, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our leader said something that was very important. The leaders of the federal parties have a responsibility to uh, respond to our uh, unhappy citizens. I hope that the, the leaders will use scientific data and agree to, mate, to meet to uh, lift these measures. Mr. Speaker, this appeal has been made. We've reached out to the Bloc Québécois, to the NDP, to the Liberals. We hope that the party leaders will sit down together to discuss how we're going to emerge from this crisis. We need a peaceful solution to the protests here in Ottawa, but they're also happening in Quebec City, Toronto, in fact, all across the country. There's room for agreement. We can work together. And what we also need to give hope to Canadians, let's do so by asking the four party leaders to get together and to work to find solutions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. Yeah, and remember for Kingston and the Islands.
So let me get this straight, Mr. Speaker. Days ago, an email is leaked that the leader of the official opposition actually stated that we should that they should not ask the protesters to leave and instead make this the prime minister's problem but now we're led to believe by this member that the leader of the opposition is suddenly the one that's bringing everybody together to come up with a solution is that what this member is trying to say l'honorable député de the honorable member for megan cyclerable i'm saying it yeah. She is trying to do something good for Canadians, on, and I will support her 100% with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's totally true, Mr. Speaker, it's totally true that it is on the Prime Minister's responsibility what we are facing right now. I stand with that because he was hiding for more than a week, Mr. Speaker, instead of addressing this urgent and very, very disastrous matters. Here, here. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Since the beginning of this emergency debate and up to now, we've heard uh, uh, several Conservative members stand up to uh, denounce and with reason uh, the lack of a proactive approach from this government, and I think that uh, uh, that's true. But at the same time, there's something that doesn't seem clear to me, and that's what really is the Conservatives' position? Where are they specifically in, uh, on all of this? Because, you know, uh, uh, my partner is a nurse, and she talks to people every day uh, about what they can do to prevent uh, uh, the spread of COVID amongst their friends and family. And, uh, you know, she is afraid that uh, the healthcare system uh, might uh, have to deal with uh, worse conditions before it can get better. But at the same time, here we have the Conservatives who are trying to get political mileage out of uh, fatigue with uh, sanitary measures. So I'd like to know, what is the Conservatives' message to the people who are outside, to the people who are protesting right now? Are they telling them to stay? Are they telling them to go home? Are they telling them to respect uh, uh, health guidelines, public health guidelines? I'd like to know, how do the Conservatives want to get us out of this pandemic, and what is their message to the protesters? The Honourable Member for Les Antiques-Lérables. Mr. Speaker, I am a member of the official opposition, and last week, last Friday, I asked a question very clearly in this House. I said that it was time that this demonstration come to an end and that it was also time to bring an end to the restrictions which have caused this uh, protest and we got no response uh, from the government on that mr speaker and that's the problem we are you know the government is trying to make uh, uh, Canadians think that uh, this uh, situation is the fault of everyone except the government. This is a government that decided to call an election after imposing mandatory vaccination, and that's the reality, Mr. Speaker. Those who are playing politics with COVID are those who have been in hiding for the last 10 days, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech. And I agree with him on one point, and that is that there is a responsibility for the Liberal government and that there's a lack of leadership, which means that, uh, you know, this occupation of Ottawa, this siege has been going on for 10 days now. But I would also like to note the incredible cacophony from the Conservative Party right now. This uh, convoy announced from the beginning that they wanted to overthrow the democratically elected government and replace it by a sort of a committee with the Senate and the Governor General. This is a very anti-democratic position, which was supported by the leader of the Conservative Party and by the member for Carleton. These are facts. And this convoy, as soon as it arrived in Ottawa, it started harassing people, it started spitting people, and the several members of the Conservative Party went out and got their pictures taken with these people who are 
uh, holding the city hostage. What is the current Conservative Party position? The Honorable Member for uh, Megante Clérable in 30 seconds or less. Well, I will uh, try to limit myself to 30 seconds, Mr. Speaker, so I'll focus on one very key point. Uh, the demonstrations the, uh, that are hateful and racist, we condemn those. We denounce those in the strongest possible terms, and we should never see these sorts of things happen in any democracy and in any protest in this democracy. However, in Canada, the right to protest is very clear, and I've seen my colleague protest in Montreal in all kinds of protests for all kinds of causes, and sometimes uh, those protests led to chaos, Mr. Speaker. That doesn't mean that the cause at the basis was not a good cause. It's just that there are some people who took over uh, that cause. So what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, is we need to denounce the racist and hateful acts, but we need to allow people to speak out, because for two years now, uh, people have felt a need to speak out, and they need to be able to speak out. And if it's not uh, on the Hill, it's not just on the Hill, it's across the country. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Avignon, uh, Levitis Matan Matabidia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very happy to be here this evening. And I'd like to say uh, at the beginning that I'll be sharing my time with the Member for Saint-Jean. I'd also like to thank the NDP for having called for this emergency debate. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, it's uh, uh, really time that we discuss uh, the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is this occupation of Ottawa. And it's incredible that since the beginning of this uh, protest, we've seen uh, protesters continue to protest and uh, parliamentarians continue to sit. It's like two solitudes and nobody's speaking. And in particular, the government is not speaking to the protesters. So we're at a bit of a dead end. So this uh, protest against uh, mandatory vaccines for truckers who need to cross the uh, Canadian-American border uh, has uh, uh, gotten quite out of hand. We're no longer talking about a minority of truckers. And uh, as we all know, 90% of truckers are vaccinated. So it's a small minority who are here uh, with their, uh, their points against these measures. But there are other uh, points that have been brought up. There are people who are protesting against uh, uh, the, uh, the measures put in place by the Legault government or by the Trudeau government or rather by this uh, government. Uh, and uh, so things have gotten out of hand. There are people who are saying... Uh, dangerous things. There are people who are intimidating journalists and the people of Ottawa. There are people who are uh, uh, blocking the roads, who are not acting in a respectful way. We know that uh, protesting is legitimate and uh, it's legal to do so, but the way they're doing it is not the case. And this uh, occupation has become illegal. You don't have the right to park your car in the middle of the street to uh, uh, endlessly and think there'll be no consequences. This uh, movement's been taken over by a consp uh, conspiracy theorists, uh, people from the far right, uh, and, and many others. And if we go back to January 29th, Mr. Speaker, uh, the protesters met in Ottawa and paralyzed uh, uh, the downtown of Ottawa on uh, Wellington Street. A number of incidents uh, took place. Uh, there was a protester who was uh, uh, carrying a swastika. There were others carrying uh, Confederate flags. Uh, a number of protesters uh, uh, parked on the tomb of the unknown soldier. Others urinated on that. Uh, other uh, protesters uh, uh, put their message on the Terry Fox statue and other statues. Uh, protesters also went and took food from uh, uh, the homeless in soup kitchens. And uh, then there's the noise, which has added to uh, uh, the blockade on the roads, and that's causing problems with the people of Ottawa. There are people in Ottawa who have organized uh, counter-protests. There are businesses who have lost a lot of income with this occupation of the downtown. A number of people haven't been able to get to medical appointments because of traffic. That was the case uh, for a little four-year-old boy from Gatineau who wasn't able to get cancer treatments. He wasn't able to get to his treatment because of the blockade in downtown Ottawa. There are uh, ambulance drivers and paramedics who have had uh, uh, rocks and insults thrown at them, racist insults. There are people who have built... Uh, uh, things downtown. There's quite a supply chain in, uh, for uh, gas, among other things. So this has really uh, gotten quite out of hand, and we can understand that people are sick of it. The pandemic uh, and health measures, we're all in the same boat. We're all tired of it. But, uh, you know, even if I don't... Uh, agree with uh, the claims of the protesters, I have to say that uh, uh, the protesters uh, uh, who uh, protested in Quebec City did better than the ones in Ottawa. Uh, I'm not... 
I think that uh, what made the difference here was that uh, the governance was better prepared in Quebec City than in Ottawa. The federal government uh, knew that uh, uh, when these uh, measures uh, at the borders went into place, things might go badly, and they should have prepared. When we saw the thousands of protesters who were physically and financially preparing uh, for this uh, uh, and uh, started heading toward uh, uh, our capital right in front of uh, Parliament, you would have thought that the federal government might have uh, felt uh, more of a need to act. And uh, it was written uh, in uh, the newspaper Le Soleil today, Ottawa has failed and Quebec uh, did its job, Quebec City. If you want to manage a crisis, you need to have uh, two measures in place, uh, preparation and leadership. In this crisis, Ottawa has failed while Quebec City uh, was able to succeed. And since the beginning, when we've asked uh, the Minister of Public Safety about this, he said, well, it's not his job to tell uh, the Ottawa P uh, Police Service what to do. And we know that that's not his role. But he could show leadership and collaborate with uh, uh, the police forces and establish a plan at the very least. In a time of crisis, a true leader goes out on the ground and takes control of the situation. And in this case, we haven't seen the Prime Minister at all. And we know that the Prime Minister had to isolate because of COVID-19, but uh, clearly his uh, uh, health allowed him to participate in a number of virtual activities. He was able to participate in question period. He was able to hold uh, press conferences from his residence. And the only statement that he made was to say to the protesters, well, uh, stop complaining. And uh, Telling people uh, who don't want to get vaccinated to go get vaccinated, well, that's not very productive. The federal government looked weak uh, faced with these protesters, and that's certainly stimulated uh, their enthusiasm to uh, continue their civic disobedience in the name of their freedom and to the detriment of the freedom of the people of Ottawa. And I'll come back to the comparison with uh, what happened in Quebec City over the weekend with protests. There was leadership there. The government of Quebec said upstream clearly that they wouldn't tolerate uh, anything getting out of hand. The mayor and the police force mobilized to make sure that everything would take place uh, calmly and uh, respectfully, and that's what happened. They didn't let the protest set up camp. By uh, Sunday night, uh, they were all gone, all the protesters. But here in Ottawa, the protesters are still here and they're planning to stay. Why? Well, because nobody is uh, dissuading. Nobody of them is encouraging them to leave. It should be the role of the Prime Minister and the Minister of Public Safety to send a, mess, a clear message that the federal government won't tolerate this and that they'll give all the necessary support to the City of Ottawa and to the Police Service of Ottawa, that they'll make sure that they are in constant communication with the Government of Ontario, with uh, the Ontario Provincial Police and with the RCMP. Last week, we proposed that a crisis group be created, that the government take leadership, that they give updates uh, to uh, the people, that they uh, start a dialogue, uh, that they do something. But uh, the Minister of Public Safety clearly said in the House on Friday, when answering a question from the leader of the Bloc Québécois, that the federal government has never attempted to speak uh, to any of the uh, leaders of, this, uh, uh, of these, th these protests. They've given that responsibility to the, uh, uh, to the police service, but the people, uh, the protesters are here to speak to the federal government. We should never have let the protesters set up camp. But now uh, that they're there, what are we going to do? Well, clearly, the city of Ottawa uh, is out of resources. Uh, uh, the people of Ottawa are uh, sick and tired of it, uh, police officers, too. The uh, city of Ottawa has asked for more support from uh, the different levels of government, including the federal government, because the municipality feels uh, powerless uh, given that uh, the protesters are here to meet with the federal government. So the, they're calling for help. And uh, today, uh, uh, Ottawa City Hall uh, voted on a measure to ask for help from the federal and provincial government. So the message is very clear, and we've been saying it since the beginning of this siege of Ottawa, that, uh, you know, uh, the city of Ottawa and their police office saying they need more help. What is it going to take for the federal government to help? The minister has sent uh, RCMP uh, members another 275 officers, and that's good, and we're happy about that. But he continues to say that uh, it's uh, the ball is in the in the in the city's court, and yes, the city does have some responsibility to take, and they're not taking it. But here this evening, we've heard liberals speak, including uh, the prime minister and the minister of public safety. 
and they uh, took advantage of their time to uh, criticize the abusive uh, actions that we've seen, as we've all done, uh, and uh, we we've all denounced uh, uh, these actions but we would have what we would have liked to have heard from the government tonight was what's the plan the government's going to send more money to the RCMP great what else we haven't heard anything else what is uh, the mandate of those officers at the RCMP is to continue to uh, ensure the safety of people is it to increase surveillance or is it to end what's happening uh, in in the city of Ottawa to end this siege so this is a uh, uh, a, a missed opportunity for the federal government and for the prime minister to send a clear message to the uh, to the people of Ottawa and to the protesters and to show that they're in control and that they won't let things degenerate. We've seen abusive actions and we don't want to see any more, but we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, so uh, it's unfortunate with what we've seen tonight. And I'm sure that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to receive a, a whole pile of hateful messages uh, this evening based on what I've said because I've uh, taken a stand against this protest. And it's unfortunate to see our our society divided this way, but I'm doing my job uh, in this, Mr. Speaker, and it's time the federal government did its job. Thank you. Questions and comments? Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her intervention today and her comments. Um, the first request that's being made, the primary request that's being made by the, the leaders of this convoy, is that the Governor General dissolve this parliament and appoint the Senate and the Governor General to form a quote, citizen, to form a quote, Citizens of Canada Committee. Does this to the mem to this member seem like a group that can enter into negotiations with uh, effectively? The Honourable Member for Evian Limitis Matan Matapidia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, and I would correct him. The first demand, the initial demand uh, made uh, by uh, these protesters was uh, based on the rules put in place by the federal government to ensure that truckers are uh, vaccinated when they cross the uh, Canada-U.S. border. And so that was the initial demand. I didn't uh, see the federal government uh, have a dialogue on that or attempt to send a message to the protesters. And yes, things have degenerated since then. And as I've said, the uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, ridiculous demands, but some are more legitimate. We know that people are fed up, and that's what people are trying to tell us. But to not say anything to them, I don't think that's going to improve the situation. And I don't think that by saying, well, uh, uh, stop complaining and go get vaccinated is going to uh, make the uh, truckers get into their uh, cabs tomorrow and drive off. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague for her excellent speech and her sincere desire to find a solution and work together. And I was upset with the, uh, the Liberals' lines of questioning to be adversarial. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we know the Prime Minister, instead of coming out, as the member said, to end the vaccine mandates, he was name calling, he was demonizing, dehumanizing these uh, Canadians, and he has infringed on their charter rights and freedoms. And in order to continue that, he needs to show that it's demonstrably justified. And Mr. Speaker, we're seeing today the CDC recognizes natural immunity. The WHO scientists are saying, recommending dropping these mobility restrictions. John Hopkins says that the restrictions and lockdowns don't work. And Dr. Fauci in The Lancet says that both vaccinated and unvaccinated Canadians, trans or people, transmit the virus equally since the Delta variant. So the science says that we could come out with a plan to stop the restrictions, get back to normal. Would she uh, support the opposition leaders and the government getting together to let these demonstrators know there is a plan, there is a solution, there is an end. Let's end this together. The Honourable Member for Avignon Limitis, Matan Matapedia. 
I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, but uh, that's what the Bloc Québécois has been calling for, uh, for instance, the beginning, that we create a crisis group for those who are directly involved in the ground, and we're open to the government discussing with the opposition parties, because we have ideas, and we're all tired of the public health measures, but uh, the ones that my colleague is talking about right now, well, most of those were put in place by the provinces, by Quebec in particular, so it's not the federal government who can uh, 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 get rid of certain confinement measures, because the federal government government didn't put those in place. So there are certainly discussions that can be had, and I would agree with him. Everyone wants to see what's the way out of this. Is there a plan? And we don't understand why it's different for the government, uh, you know, uh, to not do that. We know that we can't uh, predict the future. We know there could be a new variant, but there should be some kind of plan. And uh, the uh, Quebec government is doing that. They're going step by step with the deconfinement plan. So maybe we need to see a similar plan from the federal government, at least for the measures that are under their jurisdiction. That would be good for everyone. The honorable member, l'honorable député. The honorable member for Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, uh, we're going back and forth we're, because, on the one hand, we have a government that has decided that it's not going to govern, that it's not going to take its responsibility, and now it's uh, too late. And on the other side, we have the official opposition, the Conservatives, who have suddenly abandoned their historic passion for law and order because... Uh, um, uh, parking a 53-foot truck in the middle of the street is illegal. Would it be possible, and I'd like uh, to ask my honorable colleague what she thinks, that uh, the search for uh, uh, short-term political gain has been making this situation worse? The Honorable Member for Avignon, Lamitis Matan, Metapedia, in 30 seconds or less. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was an excellent question. And yes, unfortunately, I think that there are a lot of people and organizations who are trying to profit from this uh, and who are trying to make political gain, who are trying to uh, maybe get a certain base that they lost because uh, people are fed up. But you know what? Everyone's fed up. Everyone's tired of this. But there's a certain part of the population that uh, uh, wants to you know, get that message out more than others. And I see that I'm out of time. But I hope that everyone, all elected officials, can work together uh, in, a sol in, in a good way so that we can get out of this crisis. Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honorable Member for St. Jean. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to start by saying that I'm very happy to speak to this uh, situation in front of us tonight. Unfortunately, you know, I'd hope we wouldn't get to this point, but it's necessary. So I'm not going to go back on the description of what uh, happened with, uh, you know, all of the unfortunate things that we've seen uh, which took place. Uh, my colleague outlined that very well. So I'd like to go speak to some other points, uh, something that's maybe a little bit more, uh, not necessarily emotional, but uh, maybe talk to some of the missed opportunities uh, uh, that we've seen because this situation has got worse and worse. So all those things that we missed. I would like to say, Mr. Speaker, that despite the fact that we are in a house where there are parties who sometimes by definition should not be in agreement with uh, the ruling party. It's part of political jousting. In the fact, however, we are, most of us, close to a similar position that, uh, that we seem to have lost. And that's unfortunately what is going on right now. We've been polarized by the situation. What is unfortunate isn't necessarily the fact that we've lost the con lost control of the situation as much as the fact that the situation has taken control of us. We have allowed ourselves to be polarized rather than having an intelligent discussion together on how to move forward and get out of this. We are so polarized that we seem to have forgotten how we are collectively sick of COVID. We seem to have ignored this fact in the reproaches we've had against those who have criticized the most radical of, uh, of uh, protests. Some people have accused them of being against protesters. Therefore, you are for closing restaurants. You are for the fact that people are losing jobs. But no one, no one's happy that people are losing jobs. But that's what people seem to be communicating now. Some people have even said, if you are against the fact that people are protesting, you are against freedom of expression. 
and me myself, I've taken part in a number of protests in the past, what I can say is that it's not the case for me. The issue is that the Prime Minister has missed the opportunity to uh, avoid this uh, situation. He is leader and therefore he has to be a source of uh, de-escalation. This started with the fact that he called people, some people racists, extremists. He muzzled those who were a bit more moderate in their claims and put them in the same proverbial basket. And so the more moderate and the more thoughtful protesters perhaps didn't want themselves to denounce their fellow protesters. And so a certain form of polarization was fostered. Some people, therefore, closed themselves to discussing and to talking. And some people did want to talk. First of all, our friends, our neighbours, our families. When I say we, I mean we all MPs, those who have talked to us. Unless you live under a rock, you know that something is happening out there. And our friends, our close ones, said, hey, I, watched my, I brought my daughter to see the trucks. It's nice to see that people are finally mobilising because we are truly sick of COVID. When you take the time to talk to them, you realise that, well, we agree on a number of issues. And there are many people who are ready to uh, protest in a perfectly benevolent way and peaceful way. But the situation has been allowed to run rampant. And the protests in Ottawa turned into the collective protesting of how sick people are. And this was scooped up by ill-intentioned individuals. It was diverted. The message itself was diverted. But when you speak to these people, these friends, these your friends and family, When you, speak, when you spoke to them at the very beginning of the protest, you realised that people were doxing others. They were giving out MPs' addresses and numbers, saying, go, harass them. But a lot of people were saying, no, 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 I want to protest, I'm sick of COVID, but I don't want that to happen. And so when you were talking to these people, you realised that we were much closer to what they wanted and what they were thinking rather than anything else. There are also protesters who took their cars and who drove around, people with whom discussion was possible. I did it myself. On day three, I believe, of the protest, I was waiting for my car. I was waiting for another car. Uh, I was waiting behind a car with a Quebec flag, and I said, hang on, we're not the day before the Saint-Jean-Baptiste. So I asked them, uh, are you going to take your time? Because... I have things to do. And they said, no, are you here f to protest? I said, no, I'm, I'm a parliamentarian. And so we started talking. And it was in a perfectly good atmosphere because these people were open to discussion. We talked about a number of issues. For example, I asked them, why are you here? Well, I told them truckers required to be vaccinated to go to both sides of the border. And the protester said, oh, I didn't know that. But what do you... And then I said, what do you think about the fact that the protest is making restaurants lose money? You're trying to help them by protesting, but you're harming them. And they, and they said, I hadn't thought about this. And we, talk, uh, we talked about this for more than the time it took for them to, sh to, to load their car. And then we said our goodbyes and gave us, each other our best wishes. But these channels of conversation and dialogue were cut by the Prime Minister. It, it's a missed opportunity to tell parliamentarians, talk to these people, talk to the protesters, people who perhaps have the, the same opinion as you do. And the third group of people whose channel of communication has been severed, intelligent communication has been severed because the situation has been uh, exacerbated. The situation has gotten so bad 
that we wonder if intelligent conversation is even possible. We were so polarized that we felt obliged to say either we are for or we are against, which wasn't the case in Quebec City. There was a protest at the end of the week. Everyone found it perfectly accessible. No one said I'm... No one felt obliged to say I'm for. No one felt obliged to say I'm against because it was done in a disciplined way. On one end, people were saying, oh, you're racist and you're violent. And on the other side, it's, people were saying, if you're against the protest, you're against freedom of expression. However, it's not that at all. We were so concentrated on what's happening here in the House of Commons that we seem to have lost sight of the fact that had we decided to uh, be more open with vaccination or we'd been more rapid with vaccination, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had mutations. Perhaps we wouldn't even have to talk about people on the front line because that's also a, a huge issue. Confinement was implemented because we have to reduce as much as possible the burden on first responders. And that is what is essential here. We seem to have lost sight of the fact that none of this would have happened if the federal government hadn't divested from healthcare in the past years because confinement is the direct consequence of underfunding. I find it unfortunate that we are here this evening because we've missed amazing opportunities to have an intelligent dialogue, an intelligent conversation on the ways to get out of this crisis. And I hope that this evening's debate will be an olive branch that all parliamentarians will tend to one another so that we remember the reason for which we are, we are here in the first place. And the reason is to finally find an end to this pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Yanni Kamalta, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I do want to thank the member from St. Jean for her inter intervention today. Um, I think that I certainly uh, learned a lot from what she had to say. I really appreciated the personal account uh, of, of the story that she uh, in, uh, t shared about uh, interacting with some of the protesters. Um, and I think she makes a really good point quite frankly, and I think I can learn something from it, which is the fact that um, there are uh, many different people out there with many different uh, objectives and motivations. And indeed, she's absolutely right. There are people that have come to this uh, protest uh, quite innocently. Uh, I've seen myself families uh, out there um, walking the streets. Um, and, uh, and, and it's important to recognize that. So I thank, I thank her for that. I guess the problem for me is when I'm going to a drugstore like I did and I saw somebody confront the store clerk and put a camera in their face and said, you can't force me to wear a mask in here, I have rights, blah, 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 blah. Like, where do we draw the line? Like, how do I, can, how do we figure out how to appease the people who are legitimately not trying to um, uh, create problem versus those that are overtly trying to do it. I'm wondering if she can share her thoughts on that. Honourable Deputy de Saint Jean. The Honourable Member for Saint Jean. I would like to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for his question. What he has described is a situation where people have done great things. People were doing individual things in the. Uh, in the communities, and, but people were denouncing them on social media. The problem is, these denouncers coalesced into a sort of legitimacy, and then people on the margin added themselves to the soup, and it turned into something completely different. Had we rapidly taken control of the occupation, perhaps there would still be isolated acts that would be easier to uh, denounce. Something that would have been better defined than what we see now. Reminder to keep your questions short and your answers short so we make sure we can get everybody that wants to have an opportunity. Uh, question et commentaire, l'honorable deputy de la... The Honourable Member for La Petite Patrie. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for her presentation. It was a very interesting one with interesting angles. I would like to come back to what her colleague said, the colleague for Avignon La Métis Metamatapédia. She said that the Liberals are hiding behind games of jurisdiction to explain their lack of responsibility, their lack of leadership, and lack of accountability. They're saying that it should be the, they said that it should be the mayor of Ottawa and the Ottawa Police Service that should act. It is not federal jurisdiction. I would like to hear if, she, if the Honourable Member agrees that in a crisis, jurisdictions are important, but it's not a reason to not act. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. They don't become a reason to uh, butt into other jurisdictions. I'm sure that's what my colleague for La Rosemont La Petite Patrie was, uh, was probably hoping that I would say, but collaboration is still great, and that's what we've hoped from the very beginning. Come on, there are questions and comments. Can't believe there's nobody else that wants to uh, ask a question. Um, I'm going to wait one second here just to be sure. Um, the Honourable Member for L'Avignon Métis Matapédia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for her excellent speech. Her speech gave a good overview of both sides of the situation. It's unfortunate. Well, it's great because people are watching CPAC this evening. Since my speech, my Twitter has been blowing up with uh, haters. So I'd like to hear what my colleague has to say. People are using this situation to divide themselves and to insult people. It's, it's deplorable. I'm getting messages. I'd like to hear what my colleague has to say. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean, 32 seconds. It's rather short. Well, I find it deplorable, and I see that my phone is slowly blowing up, which is unfortunate because probably we wouldn't be here had the situation been taken care of and managed from the very beginning. The MNAs in Quebec City probably didn't receive the same number of hateful messages after their protest at the end of the weekend because there was no such polarization that happened. It was done in a much more cordial way. And as I mentioned... We, no doubt, much closer to uh, being closer to the people that are protesting. We've allowed ourselves to be far too polarised. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Privy Council and Minister for Public Safety. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for, for giving me this opportunity to speak on this very important issue and a very important debate that is taking place. As members know that I represent the riding of Ottawa Centre. The House of Commons where most of you are sitting, I'm sitting at my home, is located in Ottawa Centre. Speaker, what we see outside, what we are talking about for last 11 days happening, is happening right in the heart of my community. Although the Parliament Hill is located right here in downtown Ottawa, many people forget, and perhaps these occupiers have forgotten, that a block in all directions from Parliament Hill are residences. There are people who call downtown their home, their seniors. They're people with disabilities. They're young people. They're families who live in downtown Ottawa. Speaker, I have really have now lost words as to how I can describe what my community is going through. So I thought perhaps I can start my remarks today by just reading to all the members through you, Speaker, few of the emails that I have been receiving. Just to give you a glimpse of the pain and agony people have been going, going through for the last 11 days. Speaker, I can spend the full 20 minutes reading you emails because there are so many but I do want to talk a little bit about solutions 
in my remarks. So here's email number one. I'm one of the Ottawa residents in your writing. I feel the need to raise my concerns with you so you may escalate them through the appropriate channels. The members of the convoy who are occupying the city have been causing damage and mayhem across downtown. And I strongly disagree with the police action or rather the inaction of the police up to this point. These people from the convoy have stolen from homeless shelters, vandalized and damaged houses and businesses that display pride flags, assaulted and harassed residents for wearing masks during the pandemic, desecrated our memorials, launched illegal fireworks, and most recently have been caught attempting to set an apartment building on fire while taping the doors closed. This is just some of the inexcusable actions that these people have done to our city and to the residents of our city. Email number two. I have been a resident of Ottawa for over 40 years. Never before have I seen such prolonged, aggressive, and unlawful behavior in our community. Constant truck horns blaring. Diesel fumes, engines revving and shouting at all hours have become insufferable. I am horrified by the racist and anti-Semitic symbols I have recently seen in my neighborhood, which are unacceptable and have no place in Canada. Email three. It should be well understood two years into this pandemic that disabled folks are among the most vulnerable to COVID-19. We fall into many groups. There are those like me who are vaccinated but who face a higher risk of adverse outcomes should we get infected. Others are immunocompromised and get less protection from the vaccine and would be less able to fight off an infection. Others still are medically ineligible for a vaccine. Public health measures requiring mask wearing and vaccine passport have kept the disabled community safe. They are our first line of defense. Disaid, disabled Ottawans have been placed at serious risks over the past 10 days given the flagrant disregard for mask wearing and vaccine passports by occupiers. Places like the Rideau Centre as well as small businesses have closed because they were unable to keep customers and their employees safe. Email number four. We are constituents of Ottawa Centre and un unfortunately live in the Glebe. Our daughter, however, is in Centretown. She was first impacted by the current crisis when a week ago, last Friday, she was trying to do an online presentation from home with a background of ear horns. She moved in with us nine days ago. Others have not been so lucky and have had to remain confined to their homes in the red zone. One of our daughters visits to check on her home. All she could smell on her first two floors was diesel fuel. Imagine trying to take care of kids in this situation. One of our daughter's neighbors has downloaded an app that measures decibels. 66 is the maximum before hearing begins to be impaired. The neighbor's app was reading 72 inside her home. Email number five. I feel unsafe buying groceries as people are in the store without wearing masks and behaving aggressively. Like many other businesses, Massine's independent grocer on Bank Street is dealing with the protest noise and aggression from the public, as well as possible increased exposure to COVID-19 Omicron from those not wearing masks. While taking on the cost of hiring extra security, I feel bad for the cashiers and security staff who have remained patient and calm under these dire conditions. I'm exhausted. While the last 23 months of the pandemic have certainly been challenging, working from home during the week with all the noise from the protests has become aggravating. While not being able to enjoy a short walk or a quiet afternoon indoors over the last two weekends has truly become depressing. Mr. Speaker, I can go on. I can write to you five, 10, 15, 20, 100 more emails people pleading for peace, people who are peace loving, people who understand that we live in the nation's capital and peaceful protest, protest is part of our democracy, but not that is something of this nature as something that is nothing short of an occupation 
something that is unlawful and definitely not peaceful. What people have been asking in my community is that, are we, have we forgotten that we are still living through a global pandemic? In fact, we are still going through a fifth wave with restrictions around us to ensure that we do not get ill and that we do not overburden our healthcare system and our, and our healthcare workers. Sometimes I wonder when I hear some of the debates, some of the arguments coming in this house, especially from the official opposition, that something like COVID-19 pandemic never happened. That somehow things were normal and we just all decided to change the rules around us. It's because we all have gone through a very difficult time. It has not been easy for any one of us, especially those who have been vulnerable and marginalized. And yes, we need to have a conversation around what lies ahead. How do we end this pandemic? How do we get to a place that it becomes an endemic? And how our lives will be impacted by that? But that debate does not take place in the form that is happening right now outside the House of Commons. That's not a debate. That's us just holding a community hostage. That is now how you engage in a meaningful conversation and a respectful conversation. Speaker, I am not interested in speaking to somebody who waves a swastika or a Confederate flag. I have members of racialized and, uh, uh, and Jewish community in my writing who are and I've used this word before, rattled. They're scared. They're re-traumatized and victimized. None of us believe that we are actually seeing those images in our hometown, our nation's capital. Speaker, I urge all the members of this house, you are all respectable, good people with the right motivation to serve your communities to build a better country, to please come together, to please ask these occupiers to leave my community alone, to restore peace in my community. They want to engage in a conversation, have a conversation, but we cannot have a conversation when a whole set of neighborhoods are being held hostage over the last 11 days. This protest, this occupation, this civil unrest has to come to an end. It has to come to an end for the sake of people who live in this community, for businesses who have suffered so much, who were looking forward to opening on January 31st when the provincial lockdown measures were being lifted and they are unable to do any business. They are closed. Have we thought about impact on them and their families, how they're going to make ends meet? I'm grateful to my colleagues Ministers, the member from Ottawa Venier, uh, the president of the Treasury Board, who are working closely with me so that we can find ways to support our businesses, where they are now had a double hit to them as a result of this occupation. So, Speaker, in my limited time, I want to focus on what can we do. How can we get out of this? I'm already pleading to all of us to let's work together. Speak with one voice. Be rational people that we are to ask these occupiers to please leave. And then engage in a process where they work with their elected representatives. Where they, hey, perhaps run for office themselves. If they feel so strongly that we need better laws and better policies. But in a democratic society, that's what we do. 
But in the near moment that we're living right now, Speaker, we need to make sure that this occupation ends. And one of the, the ways we can do this is by ensuring that laws are being enforced. The Ottawa police has been working hard and they are responsible for providing the safety and security of the residents of Ottawa. That is their job. By law, that's what they're required to do. And it's important for them to enforce the law. Municipal laws, provincial laws, federal laws, all three of them have been broken. I am a lawyer by profession speaker. I've been the former attorney general of Ontario. I can give you an entire list of laws that have not been followed through. And we need to make sure that enforcement is there. If resources are needed, as they have been requested, as the federal government has been providing those resources to them from day one, we will continue to do so. I've been involved in this from the moment this protest has started. And I have to tell you, working with Minister of Public Safety, working with the Minister of Emergency Preparedness, including the Prime Minister who've been engaged, who have taken the time to speak with me about this issue, We've been there for city of Ottawa and the Ottawa police service to give them the resources they need so the laws could be enforced. We saw some enhanced law enforcement starting last night. I really hope that that enforcement remain in a sustained fashion so that peace could be returned back to our community so that we could ensure that the members of my community can go back to living the way they lived. But we need to enforce the law. That is what the members of our community are asking for. We need to make sure that there's a plan and this occupation is put to an end. Speaker, there's no doubt that there's going to be a fair bit of conversations that are going to take place after this occupation is done and it, it will come to an end. We will do as we always do, rightly so, learn from, from incidences like these, from mistakes made, things done well, things done not so well. And we shall do so in this circumstance as well. As you can imagine, as a member for Ottawa Centre, I am already starting to think how can we do things differently? And in appropriate time, I will be presenting ideas, Speaker, that we need to consider so that we can protect our democratic institutions, that we can find ways to promote peaceful protests, as is our democratic right, but also be able to safeguard the right to live peacefully for the residents of downtown Ottawa, the constituents that I'm so honored to serve. And one of those ideas, Speaker, that I will be uh, speaking uh, to the members, uh, to the House, is perhaps an evaluation of parliamentary precinct. Right now, we define parliamentary precinct as Parliament Hill and some of the buildings that are located on Wellington Street and Spark Street. Maybe we need to study increasing the boundary of parliamentary precinct so that we can have a better robust safety protocols in place. Not take away lawful, peaceful protests, which are critical to a democracy, but ensuring in a way that we do not run into the kind of circumstances we are running in. So I will be indulging members, my colleagues, into a conversation where we analyze and study better whether we parliamentary precinct needs to have a more bigger footprint uh, and better protocols in place as to how we ensure that a whole downtown is not held hostage. Speaker, I hope you've been able to see the challenge that I am going through. But most importantly, Speaker, I hope that I have been able 
to channel some of the emotions of my constituents. Sometimes it's hard to express in words what my community is going through. Sometimes it's really difficult to hear the other side and speaker have always said that I want to listen to the other side. Legitimize this occupation as something as civil or peaceful. When people are suffering, they've been, they've had a rough time almost over the last two years because of the pandemic and this has made their life unbearable. Speaker, I urge you, I urge through you, all the members of this house to let's stand together by the end of this debate and collectively ask for these people to leave. We can engage in a civil conversation. We can hear each other and agree to disagree, but this is not the way to do it. I implore you, I urge you, please leave our community alone. Please let people in Ottawa Center, in downtown Ottawa, live peacefully. Thank you very much, Speaker. Questions and comments, question et commentaire, the Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Always a pleasure to rise on behalf of the uh, residents of Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou on this important topic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable, the Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary made uh, two points that I wish to follow up with him on, and they're both relatively brief. The first is, Mr. Speaker, he said, let's work together. And I note that the official leader of the opposition tonight sent a letter to the Prime Minister uh, and to all party leaders to work together. So based on that, would the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary be prepared to advise the Prime Minister to do just what he said we should be doing? Secondly, um, the uh, Honourable Parliamentary Secretary said the police should be enforcing the laws. Does he view it as the Prime Minister's job to tell the police what to do in this situation? The Honourable Member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I will address the second question uh, first. I, I think the member opposite knows quite well that in our system of our democracy, politicians do not tell our police officials as to how to enforce the law. There is a very important, significant, and healthy distinction and differentiation between the two. I have the honor of serving as the Solicitor General of Ontario. I very much know, Speaker, that you cannot tell police how to operate. So I would be very careful in suggesting that somehow the Prime Minister should tell Ottawa Police Service or any other police service for that matter as to how they should apply the law. As for working together, of course we should work together and I look forward to looking at the reading of the letter. But I think the member opposite should also listen to the, to the healthcare experts, to the medical experts as to why it is important that we get vaccinated and put an end to this pandemic. Thank you. That's the only comment there. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member, member for Mirabel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech. It was a very uh, moving and uh, passionate speech. He talked about his, uh, his constituents. And Mr. Speaker, if you hadn't told me, I would never have guessed that my colleague was a member of the uh, governing party because I counted the number of concrete solutions that have been proposed by the colleague and I came up with zero. So where's the uh, crisis group uh, that was uh, suggested by uh, the Minister of Justice? With, uh, where is that with the policemen, the police uh, officers? Where is the daily press conference uh, from the Minister of Public Safety? That uh, press uh, conference is nowhere. The Liberals have to understand that after the last election, Canadians gave them a minority mandate. So they have to stop listening to themselves and start listening to solutions. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And, and I think the member opposite is trying to say that somehow this is a political problem. Speaker, we're living through a pandemic. We have, we have a healthcare challenge at the moment. This is a global pandemic. Canada is not alone in fighting this pandemic. This is happening across the world. So to suggest that 
the way to deal with the protests outside is by holding daily press conference. I don't understand how that was going to put an end to this crisis. What's needed is to ensure that the laws that we have created, and you and I are part of creating those laws, are properly enforced. And if somebody breaks the law, then they should face the consequences of breaking the law. And that's what we, it's required in Ottawa at this moment. I'm on the ground. I'm out in there trying to find solutions. We need to make sure the laws are enforced. This is an unlawful protest, which needs to end. Thank you. Questions and comments, question et commentaire, the honorable member for Victoria. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for his speech. Uh, when I talk to constituents, they are tired and frustrated and disheartened that we are still in this pandemic, but the vast majority of them are following public health guidelines. They are tired and fed up with people who refuse to wear masks, who refuse to follow public health orders, putting others at risk. People at Ottawa, as the member mentioned, are beyond tired and fed up, experiencing harassment and assault, witnessing anti-Semitic and fascist symbols, women being threatened with rape, residents from racialized and 2S LGBTQIA plus communities having discriminatory slurs hurled at them. Canadians are also concerned hearing reports of an attempted arson in the lobby of a residential apartment building. It's terrifying. Does the member agree that it should not have taken this long for the prime minister to start talking to municipal and provincial governments? The convoy organizers were clear about their intent. They were allowed to do exactly what they said they would do. Does the member understand why Ottawa residents are tired and fed up with this liberal government? Well, the member think- for Ottawa Centre. Thank you. I, I thank the member for, for, for her comment. And, and I, I will agree to, with her on the point is that Canadians have made a lot of sacrifices. And they are following the public health guidelines. They are getting vaccinated. They are wearing masks. They are socially distancing themselves. It's amazing. I have two young children. It is amazing to see the kind of habits our kids have developed. They're good habits. Hi- good hygiene as a result of this pandemic, but a lot has been done. But I also want to assure the member that since the beginning of this crisis, the prime minister has been fully engaged. I've had conversations with him. He's being briefed, but the prime minister as the head of government does has no power to tell police how to deal with the situation. Our law is absolutely clear, nor we want in our system of democracy having politicians tell police what laws they should be enforcing and how. It's our job to create the law and an independent police role is to enforce the law and in fact, independent judiciary to arbitrate whether the application of the law is correct or not. But I can assure all the members that the prime minister has been engaged, the pr- prime minister um, uh, is fully informed and briefed and making sure that this crisis gets over as quickly as possible. Thank you. Question et commentaire, questions and comments, the honorable member for Halifax. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I just want to tell the member from Ottawa Centre that uh, my heart is breaking for, for him and for his uh, constituents. It's hard to imagine taking what's happening here in Ottawa and putting it in, in Halifax, a city that I love as much as he loves his city, and seeing the kind of damage and, and terrorizing of, of neighborhoods, damage to property, uh, illegality going on, I can't, it just must be so incredibly heartbreaking. And uh, so many of our hearts go out to you. Now, the member is in a very unique position, being the, the member of parliament for the most directly impacted part of the city, but also as a former attorney general for the province of Ontario. Uh, he alluded, Mr. Speaker, to some of the changes that he'll be bringing f- 
proposals for changes that we'll be bringing forth in due course. Um, I'd love if you could give us a sneak preview on the flavor of some of those. I, I, he, he mentioned uh, changes to the parliamentary precinct, the elimination of vehicles off of Wellington Street and the pedestrianization of that street would be a remarkable innovation, but even changes to the operating procedures of this house to, to uh, better manage some of the um, activities of members. We're very interested to hear that. Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the, the member opposite. Uh, you're absolutely right. I am, I'm, I, along with the member from Ottawa Venia, are in the, in the heart of this crisis. And uh, as I mentioned, the community suffering is, is unbearable. It's, it's, you, I'm, I'm starting to run out of words uh, to explain it. Um, and that's why I think as soon as this crisis is over, we need to en start engaging in thinking about the future and, and how to prevent things like that by ensuring that we create an environment where uh, we have peaceful protests, which is, again, I want to stress is a democratic right. And so one of those things, and one of the interesting things as everybody can imagine about Ottawa is multiple jurisdictions. You know, we've got the, the Parliament of Canada, which is the government of Canada, and then uh, you have the municipal service too. And so from street to street, jurisdictions can change. A park is owned by one federal entity and a street next to it is a provincial uh, a provincial or municipal street. And so what we need to look at is the, the boundaries of parliamentary precincts so we can uh, perhaps better coordinate. But you just, uh, the member uh, uh, speaker just said something which is, has been a deep desire of mine, that we need to look at finding ways to convert Wellington Street into a more a pedestrian street to make sure to beautify it, making it green so more people can enjoy the beauty of Parliament Hill as opposed to being able to drive their cars and perhaps even occupy as we've seen in this instance. Continuing debate, Reprise de Debat, the Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be splitting my time with the member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have the right to protest. Protest has long been part of our democracy. So important that we enshrined it in the Constitution, in the four fundamental freedoms enumerated in Section 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. All Canadians have the fundamental freedoms of conscience and religion of free speech and expression, of association and of peaceful assembly. The freedom to protest in the public square, whether on a sidewalk or in front of a legislature or in a public park, is a fundamental freedom. And so if Canadians individually or in groups want to protest by walking up and down Wellington Street, or by standing around the centennial flame in front of Parliament, they are free to do so. Millions of Canadians over many decades have exercised this fundamental freedom. But what Canadians do not have the right to do is to blockade. There is no right to blockade. There is no right to blockade a street there is no right to blockade a highway. There is no right to blockade an international border crossing. There is no right to blockade the construction of a new pipeline, nor is there a right to blockade a rail line. There is simply no right to blockade. And Canadians do not have the right to harm other people or inter to interfere with the freedoms of their fellow citizens. And while freedoms are fundamental, they are not unlimited. Freedoms are limited by what harm they do to other people. And freedoms are limited by how they interfere with other people's freedoms. Mr. Speaker, we are a nation rent asunder. West against East. Rural against urban. Those unvaccinated against the vaccinated. We are a nation divided because of a lack of leadership, leadership that begins at the top. That's right. mm -hmm. The Prime Minister needs to reflect on the language and rhetoric that he has used over the past six months that has so divided this country. Rhetoric that has referred to over three million unvaccinated Canadians in disparaging terms. Rhetoric that suggests that those who disagree with him are not Canadian. 
rhetoric that has poured rhetorical fuel on the fires of division that are pitting one Canadian against another, friends against friends, family members against family members, those unvaccinated against those vaccinated, those in favour of mandates against those opposed, those calling for an end to restrictions against those in favour of restrictions. And while many have fanned the flames of division in this country, they are not the head of government. They are not the Prime Minister of a G7 country. The Prime Minister's rhetoric in the last six months is unbefitting the high office of this land that he holds. Instead of bridging divides and reducing tensions and lowering the temperature, he has demonized the other. Mr. Speaker, it is time for the protesters to end the blockade in Ottawa and the blockade at the border crossing in Western Canada. It is time for the protesters to go home to their families and their communities. We have heard their concerns. We have met with some of them, and it is now time for them to go home. Their concerns have been heard loud and clear, and no doubt in the coming weeks, their concerns will be debated here on the floor of this democratically elected legislature. Mr. Speaker, Canada is a country founded on the trinity of a belief in freedom, a belief in democracy, and a belief in the rule of law. And in a free and democratic society, the rule of law must be upheld. In this case, the governments in this country have delegated the enforcement of the law against blockades to the police. I encourage the protesters blockading here in Ottawa and at our international border crossing to follow the direction of the police. In a democracy, only the state is authorized to use force, including lethal force, to uphold these fundamental freedoms that we enjoy, to uphold the rule of law. We have delegated this use of force to law enforcement. In our democracy, citizens are not entitled to use force. As citizens, we settle our differences through the ballot box or through the court system. We don't settle them through force. Mr. Speaker, we all bear responsibility for the current divisions in this country. We all have a responsibility to reflect on how we got here. I grieve for my country. Instead of peace, order, and good government, we have chaos, disorder, and poor government. And while many democracies are under pressure, both from domestic and foreign forces, Canada has been particularly buffeted by an inability to respond. The pandemic has laid bare the state of our institutions, and they are weak and ineffective. For most of the last year, we did not have a governor general because of scandal. Eight of the most senior members of the Canadian military were forced out in scandal. The former clerk of the Privy Council resigned in scandal. We have a military procurement system that cannot procure, and we have payroll systems that cannot pay. And we have a parliament that cannot do its job because the government defied four orders of this House and its committee for the production of documents. We have a debates commission that ran in the last two elections what is almost universally acclaimed as the two worst set of election debates since election debates were first held in this country in the 1968 election. The People's Republic of China interfered in the last federal election and spread disinformation through proxies leading to the defeat of several candidates and nothing has been done. We have some of the highest levels of household indebtedness in the world and governments in this country are not far behind. Last two years ago, less than two years ago, some provinces in this federation had trouble raising cash on debt capital markets to pay police officers and nurses, and the federal government had to step in to bail them out. We have the second worst health care system amongst leading economies of the OECD according to the Commonwealth Fund. Greenhouse gases continue to rise each and every year that this government has been in power to a record high level 
in 2019, the last year for which we have data. And in the early months of this year, it looks like we will once again break through records with record high levels of emissions. We haven't met our NATO commitments in decades. And now Russia is about to invade a democracy in Eastern Europe. And now we have a national capital in paralysis. And the seizure of an international border crossing, the hallmark of a sovereign state. Mr. Speaker, we have gotten to this place because we have not been serious. We have not been serious about the rule of law. We have not been serious about ensuring our democratic institutions reflect the diversity of views in this country. We have not been serious about domestic policy. We have not been serious about foreign policy. Mr. Speaker, it's time we got serious. Question A, commentary, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for London North Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for his speech. Uh, I wanted to ask him a question relating to vaccine mandates. Given the fact that rates of hospitalization continue to be a challenge in Canada, how does the member feel about vaccine mandates? The Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. Well, Mr. Speaker, I believe that we should encourage all Canadians to get vaccinated. Vaccines are a miracle of modern medicine. They are safe and effective, and they are a critical tool to emerging out of this pandemic. And we should encourage Canadians to get vaccinated through nudges, through encouragement, but not by demonizing them and singling them out. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the leadership we need from this government as we go forward to emerge from this pandemic. Question and comment. For Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to go back to the first part of uh, my colleague's speech. Mr. Speaker, I'm also in favor of the right to protest and I'm in favor of freedom. But obviously, there are people for whom uh, freedom means funding illegal acts with foreign money. There are people for whom throwing rocks at an ambulance is an example of freedom. There are people for whom preventing a child from getting cancer treatment is freedom, Mr. Speaker. There are people for whom uh, setting off fireworks in densely populated areas or setting fire to somebody's house because they've complained about the noise, Mr. Speaker, uh, is a freedom. These are not defenders of freedom. These are not Democrats. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to hear my colleague recognize that uh, tyranny is when some people think that they have endless freedom and that their freedom has no restrictions. And I hope that everybody in this House recognizes that because that's the first step forward to uh, finding a solution to the crisis in front of us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Paul Hills. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the uh, question and comment. Uh, I think that it's very important. It's very important that everyone follow and respect the law. I think that all Canadians have a responsibility to follow the law. Everybody here in Canada must respect the law, and the police has the responsibility to enforce the law. And I think that if there is anyone who does not respect the law, I think that uh, we have given as a government, at the federal government, and at the provincial level, the power uh, to the police to enforce the law. And I think that that is a sign of uh, the strength of our democracy to do that. Lance Kistion Kamaltar, going online to the Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, listening to my colleague, I cannot help but think of a quote made by Desmond Tutu that says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Mr. Speaker, can the member explain how we can stand by silently, ignoring citizens being harassed and assaulted in their communities? Standing silently while displays of racism and anti-Semitism are waved in the streets of Ottawa, paralyzing a community with hate and fear. Mr. Speaker, can the member share when he will begin standing up for those oppressed and experiencing hate and racism? The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Quite simply, I believe that the blockades are illegal. 
Uh, I believe that the blockade here in Ottawa and at the international border crossing in Coutts, Alberta are illegal. And I believe that uh, it's up to law enforcement uh, to uphold the law and ensure that these blockades are taken down at a time and choosing of law enforcement. Um, governments and cabinets in this country do not uh, direct law enforcement as to their um, actions. Uh, we empower them with delegated authorities uh, to enforce the law. And so whether it's uh, arson, uh, whether it's harassment, uh, whether it's uh, violence, um, we have to ensure that law enforcement has the tools and resources necessary uh, to do the job. And I have confidence in the Premier of the province of Ontario. Uh, I have confidence uh, in the law enforcement agencies and the institutions of the federal government uh, that they will do their job uh, and put an end to this crisis. Reprise du debat, continuing debate, the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure for me to be able to speak to the House tonight about the ongoing convoy uh, protest movement that's happening across the country, as well as about the federal mandates that have spawned this response. And let me say at the outset that I think it is so important when people have disagreements about important public issues that they take the time to talk to each other and try to understand each other's perspectives. And if there's a particular challenge at doing that in Canada, it's because we're such a vast country. People in different regions with different kinds of experiences or perspectives that are informed by their region have a maybe harder time engaging in that dialogue with people who live very far away. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, maybe further challenged by the fact that we are a bilingual country. So sometimes it's, it's harder to have those conversations across those experiential, regional, or linguistic divides. And yet there's something about this convoy movement that has suddenly uh, shrunk those geographic divisions because people have come from all across the country to be in Ottawa uh, to, to express significant concerns that they have. So members of Parliament now have a, an opportunity to go out and talk to some of the people who are here and to ask them, why are you here? To look at what signs and symbols they're waving or not waving and to take that opportunity to engage in that dialogue. And what's incredible to me is that by all indication, there are many members of Parliament, many, many people who will participate in this debate tonight, who don't seem to have really taken the opportunity to look around, to try to talk to people, to try to understand. It, it, and I would challenge any member who hasn't done it, tonight, tomorrow, go outside. There are people right in front of this building and ask them, what's your experience? Did you lose a job? Did you have a family lose a job? Did you lose a business? Did someone you care about get affected by this in some way? Do you know someone who's experienced suicidal ideation for the first time because of lost opportunity or social isolation that came about as a result of the pandemic? What are the experiences in your life that have led you to come and take this fairly drastic step? There are many people I know here who are protesting for the very first time. So let's try to understand. Let's ask those questions. Mr. Speaker, I, I got the call from Sebastian in our lobby, who does great work for us on the Conservative side, uh, at about 6.45, telling me that I would have an opportunity to speak tonight. So as I was thinking through, what am I going to do to prepare? Usually I sit in my office and look things up and work in front of my computer. But, I, but I, instead, what I decided to do is just go out and talk to people. And I did a little bit of this before. But try to be intentional about asking people, what has brought you here? And what are the things that you maybe are seeing reflected in the conversation that are not representative or are representative? Because I think it's, again, it's important for us as members of Parliament to take that opportunity to try to understand. And many people told me that they came here because they're deeply concerned about mandate policies. They believe in this core principle of individual autonomy, the individual ability to make choices about your own health without being threatened with job loss as a result of it. And I think it's objectively the case that Canada's approach when it comes to vaccine mandates is far more draconian than many other countries around the world. For instance, countries in Europe have, a, uh, have an alternative that's based on natural immunity. And yet Canada doesn't seem to recognize that. So it's interesting for me because you could say, well, this is the science. We, we, we're not including natural immunity because it's the science. And yet it's the same science in Europe, or it should be. It's the same virus, right? So these are, these are legitimate questions. 
Why don't we have the option to consider natural immunity, to consider a rapid test that would allow people, especially truckers, people who are working alone, or public servants who are working from home, why, why aren't these reasonable accommodations when an individual wants to exercise autonomy over themselves and their own body? I think those are reasonable questions. But you know, I had a, a lot of conversations with, with, with different people when I was out just talking to some of the people who was there. I met, I met a young man who actually voted NDP in the last election. I don't know if he will again after some of the things uh, that, have been, that have been said. Um, I, and I talked to people a little bit about some of the, uh, the, the, the questions raised in, in the media about, about hateful symbols because we, we've certainly seen some of those photos. And what I was told is that in the, in the very small number of instances where people put forward symbols of hate, they were actively told by other protesters, put that away. We, we, we don't want to see that here. That's not representative of what, what we're doing. Objectively, if you walk up and down Wellington Street, what you'll see is people waving Canadian flags. You'll see, you'll see people with various signs expressing messages about mandates. And, you know, and, and I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. So, so I think particularly for my family, the fact that somebody was walking around, one, one person, maybe two people were walking around with a swastika, I think that's, that's incredibly offensive. And obviously that, that strikes something in, in me that's, that's different from other members who don't have that same family experience. The reality is that, that these individuals were told to leave by other protesters. We're told that they were, that they were not welcome there, that their message was not the message that other people were trying to present. I spoke with a young man who was at the protest uh, who, who told me he was gay. He told me he, he brought a, a pride flag with him and he wasn't bothered by anyone. No, nobody had a, a critical comment about that. And I, I spoke with, with many people who were uh, visible minorities. I spoke with a number of, uh, of, uh, of Jewish gentlemen who had come from Montreal to see the protest. And you know, there, there, there is this representation in the media and in the comments of other members as if this is just a sea of people all waving Confederate flags or something. And that's just not what's happening, objectively. Whatever side you're on, that's just objectively not what's happening. So let's, let's start by just looking around and listening to what the objective facts are on the ground here, trying to understand what the source of those concerns are. And maybe recognizing that, that people who have lost their jobs, who are being told they cannot work alone by themselves in their truck, they can't work from home as a public servant, that they, that they can't travel in, in, in the context of a family emergency or whatever the case may be, people that are affected by these mandates, who are prepared to take other precautions like get a rapid test, uh, that they may have a point. I think they do have a point, I agree with them, in saying that these federal mandates should end. Mr. Speaker, we should end the federal, federal mandates not because of the protests, but because it's the right thing to do to end the federal mandates. Because the federal mandates simply don't make sense as policies when it comes to vaccination. Now we've talked about the impacts that these mandates have had on other people and our party has consistently taken I think a very reasonable approach in saying that employers uh, should uh, take appropriate measures to secure the safety of their workplaces. If you are uh, in the public service, for example, if someone is choosing to exercise their autonomy not to get vaccinated, then they should take a rapid test if they're coming into the office. A lot of people are still working from home. But the availability of testing is a good alternative. And in fact, we know there are many breakthrough infections, right? Uh, and, and so even for those who are vaccinated, getting regular rapid tests is a pretty good idea. I would think it would be reasonable under the circumstances of the Omicron variant, for example, to say rather than having a vaccine mandate for air travel, that simply everybody has a rapid test before they fly. Now we've had problems with the availability of rapid tests because the government only discovered rapid tests, it seems, about two years into this process, and now they want to be congratulated for, oh, two years later we're procuring rapid tests, right? And two years from now we'll be having better ventilation in schools. Well, folks, you're too late. You're just too late. We should have been talking about rapid tests right out of the gate, deploying a system of widely available rapid tests before the vaccination was even available. And then we would be ahead. Mr. Speaker, we could be where other countries are. Many other countries, many other jurisdictions around the world are now lifting their restrictions completely. And yet the government is continually talking about ways to further tighten mandates, to further squeeze the very small portion of the population that is not vaccinated. 
The fact is the vast majority of Canadians have gotten vaccinated. The small minority who have chosen not to get vaccinated, I think it's fair to assume at this point they're probably not going to get vaccinated. So at this point it's time to say, well, we, we have the reality of COVID, it's going to be with us, most people are going to choose to get vaccinated, some people are going to choose not to. We believe in this principle of individual freedom and autonomy. And, and we can't function very well as a country if the government continually wants to, to fire and otherwise penalize people who exercise their autonomy. So I would say it's time to lift the mandates and it's time to work towards getting back to normal. Of course we can continue to take appropriate precautions in response to events that come up. But the level of restrictions on individual freedom, the level of coercion, is not something that I think any of us would have thought possible in this country two years ago. These were supposed to be temporary measures. But now, Mr. Speaker, it very clearly is time to move on. It's time to look to the future. Because continually finding new ways to squeeze that small minority of the population who's not, who are not vaccinated isn't going to change anything. It's not going to move us forward. It's not going to actually allow us to get out of this. Mr. Speaker, people who have never protested before are coming here to say they want to be able to work. They, want, they, they don't want to be fired from their job for exercising personal autonomy. They don't want to be seeing empty grocery store shelves. They don't want to have long delays for accessing immigration services because people are being laid off because of these mandates. Mr. Speaker, let's end the mandates because it's the right thing to do. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for L uh, London North Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In debate, obviously, we exchange points of view. And here's a point of view I wanted to quote, uh, Mr. Speaker. It reads as follows. I spent the week undergoing the siege of Ottawa. I asked that we clear the streets and that we stop this occupation, controlled by radicals and anarchist groups. Those are the words of the previous Conservative Party's shadow critic for public safety, a member of this House. To the member opposite, does he agree with his colleague or not? The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I made my views very clear in this speech. I think that members should take the opportunity, that I think this member should take the opportunity to go out and engage in dialogue and, and, and try to come to an understanding of, of, of what are the significant concerns here. But what I've really focused on in my remarks is the fact that we should be ending mandates. That the, the continuing squeezing of that minority who have chosen not to get vaccinated and all the impact that that's having on, on access to services, we're seeing significant backlogs for immigration services in our offices and backlogs accessing other services. And you know, when you, when you put people uh, who are working from home on unpaid leave and don't allow them to provide services that they've been providing, we can't pretend that that's not going to have an impact. When you, when you take trucks providing essential services off the road, that's going to have an impact. These mandates are having a severe impact on vaccinated and unvaccinated people alike, and they need to end. Questions and comments. The member for Mirabel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I could uh, express a great deal of disagreement with what my colleague has just said, but we do agree on one thing. It is important to go out and to meet people. I spoke to a number of my fellow Canadians in a number of municipalities in Mirabel who were for the convoy at the beginning, who, who were enthusiastic about it. But today, when I talked to them, they realized that it perhaps was not the right solution and that to, uh, to break the law with impunity is not the best way to solve a problem. Is, does my colleague agree at least on that? Mr. Saskatchewan. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I do want to be clear because I, I didn't mention this specifically, but I do want to be clear that I think it's, it's critically important that um, people be able to protest and that we minimize the negative impact on the lives of people in this city. That, that there be uh, effective dialogue between protesters in the city that allows the necessary access and transportation to occur. And I think that dialogue can take place if, if the Prime Minister plays a, a, a constructive role in bringing down the temperature. This is the national capital. People should be able to protest here. And, and there has to be a, a, a space at the same time for that to happen in a way that's respectful. So I think there are many people uh, that want to see that, those kinds of accommodation happen through dialogue. And I think it can happen. But that's different from saying that, that people shouldn't be able to be here or demonizing the importance of the message they're presenting. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Churchill, Kawadanook, Askey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I found the member's uh, speech uh, not just bizarre, but deeply concerning. First off, 
uh, hate uh, and uh, violence we've we've heard of over the last number of days. He goes on to talk about the people he spoke to, making it sound like it's a group of Boy Scouts. Mr. Speaker, you know, everybody has talked about uh, the the occupation that our nation's capital is under. It's international news. Uh, and, uh, and what Canadians expect is leadership from their politicians calling on these folks to leave and, uh, uh, and allow for people to live their lives free of hate and the lack of safety they face. And what's deeply concerning is the conser- a number of conservatives insist in, on uh, shifting this conversation to talk about vaccine mandates, etc. This debate is about calling for an end to the occupation uh, and, and also condemning the foreign money, American money, uh, uh, fueled by Trump supporters that are supporting this occupation. Will this member condemn the use of foreign funds fueling a hateful and violent occupation in our nation's capital? Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, for Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. To hear that that member found my speech bizarre is a high compliment indeed. Uh, the, the member raised the issue of uh, foreign money. And I'll just take this opportunity to say to the member, I would love to see a consistent approach taken by parties opposite when it comes to foreign funding and foreign influence in our democracy. Let's have that debate. Let's see that legislation come forward. Because I know that that, that member could maybe take a little bit of a stronger position when it comes to the interference of the Chinese government in Canadian affairs. I'd like to see that member take a stronger position when it comes to issues like the Uyghur genocide and other cases of that foreign interference happening here in this country. Uh, let's, let's talk about addressing foreign interference. I would love to see a stronger and consistent policy on that issue. Continuing debate, we're pleased to debate the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, and I'll say at the outset that I'll be sharing my time uh, this evening with the member from Parkdale High Park, even though the member from Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan would like me to speak for 20 minutes. Unfortunately, it'll only be 10 minutes uh, this evening. Um, And I will note that he still has not invited me on the podcast that he touts so much when he's in the House. I'm still waiting for my invitation. Uh, Don't worry, I'm not checking my email three or four times a day looking for it or anything. Mr. Speaker, uh, I am very uh, glad to participate in tonight's debate, and I think I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to present some facts, uh, because I think that facts are extremely important. I think that there is a lot of uh, misinformation out there, and I think that it would be beneficial to put on the record some of the facts. It's been said once tonight, but I'll expand on it slightly, 90% of truckers have been vaccinated. You know, Mr. Speaker, I drive uh, to and from Ottawa, uh, in my uh, to, to get here, I drive uh, from Kingston to Ottawa and back, and I have seen on both occasions of making that travel since this protest uh, began, countless truckers that are working right now as we speak, traveling up and down the 401 or whatever major highway they, uh, in uh, the country they might happen to be in, in order to move goods uh, around our country. 90% of truckers are vaccinated. I actually believe, Mr. Speaker, that this inception of this protest, this convoy, probably started from a place that was genuinely about truckers and about concerns that they had. But unfortunately, we've seen this morph into something as it's been hijacked by other groups. And as so well pointed out by one of my conservative colleagues, Uh, in a tweet uh, uh, over the weekend, whatever the objective was, it's been lost by those that have hijacked this protest, unfortunately. And that's the reality of the situation that we're in. You know, uh, I find it interesting, I heard the member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, and a number of conservatives uh, this evening talk about these mandates. I mean, his word, these mandates need to be ended. The mandates as it relates to proof of vaccination, the mandates as it relates to, um, you know, uh, you know, h- hospital workers, those are all provincial mandates. It's ironic that the opposition would encourage protesters out front of this building to protest something that at least in Ontario belongs in Queen's Park. 
but they do it anyways. As a matter of fact, the only mandate that the, that the federal government has in place is a mandate that says if you cross the border into Canada, including truckers, you need to show proof of vaccination. But guess what? The United States of America has the exact same mandate. So before you even had to present your proof of vaccination to a Canada border officer on your way into Canada, you will have had to show it on your way into the United States leaving Canada. That's right. And that's the irony of it. That is the mandate that the federal government has as it relates to this particular protest, as it relates to where all this angst began. But yet, my concern is that the opposition continues to throw fuel on the fire. The member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, these mandates, these mandates, he knows full well that the mandate uh, of crossing borders for truckers applies to the U.S. just as much as it applies to Canada. So I heard from across the way, well, why do it then? Well, that's the whole point of working with our G7 partners. That's the whole point of working with the United States so that we do have fairness and equality as it relates to what the rules are to move back and forth. And that's what makes it work so well. Well, the... the the member brought up my electric car. If he, if he wants, we can talk about that for a while too, but I'm not sure you know, why a Conservative would want to do that when we're talking about such an important debate tonight as it relates to truckers specifically and as it relates to what we're seeing out there. But you know what we are seeing, Mr. Speaker, is we're seeing a number of people that are hijacking this protest. You know, the member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, uh, said earlier, and I actually think it was a really good comment, and he talked about why aren't, you know, why aren't more members of Parliament getting out there and talking to these people? You know, he's, he's trying to show and open a door there. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, is that this particular protest, although I have no doubt there are some well-intentioned individuals uh, participating in it, have attracted a lot more uh, a behavior that we all would agree is extremely uh, problematic, extremely troubling, and, qu and quite, quite frankly, uh, uh, quite frankly, um, behavior that we don't, we will do not accept as being Canadian. So I'll tell you an example, Mr. Speaker. La Order. I'm really having a hard time hearing the member. The member does speak very loud, but I'm having trouble uh, hearing him. So if we can just sort of keep it down, be respectful, and uh, we'll continue on. The, the Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And so where, where I was going with this is that although there, there might be some uh, well-meaning and well-intentioned individuals out there, I can't help but... I can't help but think of just the other day when I was in, a, in the Rexall at the corner of Metcalf and O'Connor. I was in there and we had, I saw a protester, I'm, I have to assume that the individual is a protester, I should make that clear, shove a, shove a camera in front of the clerk's face saying, you can't make me put on a mask, I have a right not to wear a mask, who do you think you are? Like this individual was going, you know, they brought this fight to the people of Ottawa, to a store clerk who's literally just working there doing her job. And I couldn't help but say to the gentleman as I was leaving, why are you bringing this fight to her? Your fight's not with her, she's just doing her job. And I trust that my conservative colleagues and any member of this house would do the exact same thing. And that brings me to the last point that I wanted to bring up as it relates to this particular issue, Mr. Speaker, is that for some reason, the protesters don't realize that those that they are affecting the most by this are the people that live in downtown Ottawa. Listen, I don't know if we should tell them this, Mr. Speaker, but we cannot hear the honking in here. As a matter of fact, you can walk in here early in the morning, you don't hear a single thing, and this was all last week too. You don't hear a single thing in here. 
You don't. And you almost forget that it's even happening until you get up and, and, and leave and go outside and you see it again. Meanwhile, all of the activities that have been going on, and then on the weekend when members of parliament aren't even, the vast majority aren't even in Ottawa, these events continue to go on and on. It's impacting the people that live here. I mean, most protests seek to get more people on board by delivering a message, seek to find, find more supporters to come and join their cause. Most protests that would come to Ottawa here and come to uh, the, the front lawn or to the Centennial Flame or Wellington Street do so in a way that is in, meant to develop a following on the way. But instead, this protest has come here and just completely made the people that live here irate with what's going on. And so I believe that it's time for this to end. I believe that it's time for the protesters to recognize the fact that they've made their point and now it's time to dispense of the activities and to go home. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, I come on to questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Mr. Speaker, my colleague talked about the science and the availability of these mandates that the Liberal government has put in, especially uh, infringing upon Canadians' mobility rights. I have a question for him. The rationale for restricting Canadians' charter rights with these uh, mobility restrictions is that vaccinated people don't spread COVID and unvaccinated do spread COVID. Now, Mr. Speaker, that was the belief before, but the, the science, the updated science uh, spoken by Dr. Fauci, the Lancet uh, research shows that vaccinated and unvaccinated persons uh, will transmit the virus equally. The CDC recognizes natural immunity. Could the, minister, could the member please present the scientific rationale for continuing these mandates? And let's get on with it. Let's solve the problem that we're faced with today. Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. If the member feels as though charter rights are being infringed upon, there is a building about 200 meters from where I stand where he can argue that case. That is where he should take his issue of charter rights being infringed upon. Not encouraging people to continue honking the horn, the ho honking their horns on the street, shooting off fireworks uh, in the middle of the night in a downtown uh, uh, heavily urbanized area. Go, go to, go to the Supreme Court and fight the case there. That's how we do it in a democracy, not occupying a downtown core of a nation's capital. Hey, commentator, questions and comments. Um, we're going to go online. L'honorable député de Pierre Boucher. The member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was listening my, uh, to my colleague's speech very carefully, and I was happy to hear that there are people who are demonstrating who went there in good faith and for good reasons. And because the impression that I've had since the beginning of this crisis is more the opposite. It was that the government did not want to see or understand that people had something to say, that people were tired of the health measures, and that they wanted to express this frustration. But what we saw is that we have a government and a prime minister who uh, put oil on the fire and actually wanted things to degenerate so that people so that he could point the finger at the people who are unhappy. And I'm wondering whether the, the Prime Minister could not have shown leadership instead. So if you look at what's happening in Quebec, there's a government there that was acting rather than talking. And here, um, there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. The, a member from the Bloc Quebecois suggests that um, 
we should try to open up dialogue with individuals who have been uh, spreading hate, uh, who have been associated with people that are spreading hate, uh, people that are, fla uh, you know, uh, waving flags that have swastikas drawn on them, people who are raiding uh, soup kitchens to feed themselves because somehow they're entitled to that food, people who have been desecrating a war memorial statue, people who have been dressing up Terry Fox's statue. Like, I just, I, I, like, it's not one bad apple, Mr. Speaker. This is a whole host of problems. And here we have a member from the Bloc Quebecois saying, why aren't you sitting down and talking to these people? They're literally waiting waving flags around that say F and the Prime Minister's name. Come on, this is not, uh, the member must know that there are starting points to negotiations and to sitting down with people and there are lines that can be uh, passed and several lines have been passed in that regard. We have time for a really, really, really short question here and answer. Uh, the Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I just need to revisit an important comment from my colleague from Churchill. There is a sinister component to this illegal occupation. It involves hate, uh, foreign money, influence in our democracy. So my question to the honourable member is, will the government take this seriously and address with integrity the sinister and dangerous factors these past 11 days have exposed? Elementary Secretary, I would seconds. love to find out the answers to some of the questions that the member mentioned. I would love to see some form of investigation into seeing where the money came from, uh, where the activities were generated and where they started. I think that that's a very important, but I am not going to uh, presuppose that I know the answers uh, to those in advance because that would just make me a conspiracy theorist, which I believe we're seeing quite a bit from across the way. Continuing debate, reprise du débat, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade, Export Promotion, Small Business and Economic Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to join this evening's debate. And I we have a point of order from the, me the member for uh, St. Paul Kildonan. Yeah, the member who just spoke just, just said blatantly for on the record that members on this side tonight are conspiracy theorists. That's a pretty significant claim. We are here representing Canadians. He's calling what we've said conspiracy theorists. Can he point to one example of us being conspiracy theorists? I, I, actually, I, I think we're descending into, into debate. I'll go back to the... We're getting, we're getting into debate. Thank you. Uh, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stand here for just a few moments until people cool down just a little bit. Um, this is a, a long debate. We, we're still about a little, a little over halfway through. Um, and I know that, uh, that there's, there's tremendous respect in here, that we need to make sure that uh, each, some, each person that has something to say has the opportunity to say it. So uh, let's try not to be inflammatory. Let's try not to accuse people of things. But let's try our best to uh, talk about the emotions and the, uh, the instances that uh, we're hearing. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to participate in tonight's very important debate about a very pressing issue and about a very uh, important uh, event that's occurring right outside this, this chamber and has been occurring for the last eight days or so. I want to thank the member for Burnaby South for actually bringing and initiating this emergency debate. Mr. Speaker, let me just start by saying, as somebody who came to this chamber as a practicing lawyer who worked in, con in the area of constitutional law and human rights for 15 years prior to first getting elected, that the right of protest in any democracy is sacrosanct. That is fundamental in any democracy. It's protected under Section 2B of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms with due reason. And the issue about speech and protected speech is at its apex when you're talking about political speech. That is the highest form of speech that deserves the highest amount of protection. That's entrenched in Supreme Court jurisprudence. What is problematic, Mr. Speaker, however, is when speech, demonstrations and protest veers into hatred. Now, I don't want to overstate the case. We know that there has been some instances of hatred. Perhaps not all of the protesters are engaging in this. But it does taint and flavor and characterize what we're seeing when we see it on a repeated basis. And what have we seen? We've seen swastikas and we've seen the Confederate flag. And what do those mean, Mr. Speaker? Well, a swastika is obviously a symbol of the Third Reich. It harkens back to Nazi Germany. It's very vilifying and detestable manifestation of what that regime represented and what it did to Jewish people, all sorts of minorities, racialized persons, religious minorities, LGBTQ2 communities, people who are Roma, etc. The Confederate flag obviously represents the institution of slavery. And we heard very eloquently from the member of Hall Aylmer 
how that feels for a person of black skin, for a person who is racialized, how that feels for a person like me, brown skin Muslim man, who takes his place in this house. Those are symbols we don't need here. And what does it mean, Mr. Speaker? It means that what we have dev devolved into, and we've heard about this repeatedly this evening, for the people of Ottawa, for even the people here who work in Ottawa, such as me, Mr. Speaker, it's starting to look a lot more like an occupation than a protest. When you destabilize people, when you disturb them intentionally, when you honk horns just to aggravate individuals, as the member who just, just spoke, the member from Kingston Islands indicated, the fight has been taken not to the government, but to the people and the residents of this city. And that's problematic, Mr. Speaker, because it starts to affect people's behavior. Perhaps that's what's intended here, Mr. Speaker, to have a chill on people's behavior. But I think it's problematic when a storekeeper can't open their, their storefront, a cashier is worried about working at Rexall, and when even members of parliament, my colleagues, and even dare I say and dare I admit myself, Mr. Speaker, that when I went home after the Ukraine debate, the emergency debate, one week ago, I was concerned for the first time in my seven-year parliamentary career about who I'm, I might encounter at 10.30 at night on the streets of Ottawa. That's not a pleasant place to be in, Mr. Speaker, and I think that's what, unfortunately, this has been driven to. The next point I want to make, Mr. Speaker, is that it's important, it's always important to take issues with policy positions. That's what a democracy is all about. That's a good thing. What has been thankful is that at least with that protest outside, people, some people had the good sense to carve out a lane of traffic for emergency vehicles. That's also a good thing. But what I've still seen and what we've seen last summer, this f past fall, now this winter, even just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, is that the people that drive those emergency vehicles are being targeted. They're being targeted with acts of hatred, acts of violence, acts of harassment. People shouldn't fear wearing their uniform, Mr. Speaker. We talk about the people who are in uniform who are keeping us safe, and they deserve to be credited. There are other people who are wearing uniforms called scrubs, Mr. Speaker. When people are cautioned about wearing their scrubs in public, the people who have been keeping us safe, the people who swear a Hippocratic oath to keep everyone safe, no matter how heinous their attitudes, no matter how vile their positions may be, people that keep everyone safe, both the people that are vaccinated and the people that are unvaccinated, those people deserve our respect appreciation and gratitude. And it is exactly the opposite that some people are foisting upon them right now. I'm not saying all people, but some people. That has to be stopped in its tracks. Mr. Speaker, I want to inject a third aspect into this discussion, which is about the notion of trucks being filled with gasoline, being parked 50 meters from a legislative building such as the House of Commons I'm speaking to you from. Mr. Speaker, we know, I know, Muslims know, Mr. Speaker, the trucks have been used as instruments of death and terror around the planet. And what I'm saying here, Mr. Speaker, is that we have to question things such as unconscious bias in terms of how we approach parked vehicles loaded with gasoline very proximate to a legislative building. Because I don't think it's vast speculation or venturing a guess here to say that if those were black protesters, indigenous protesters, if those were, if those were Muslim groups, if, if I could finish, thank you to the member from Forces, Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. If those were Muslim protesters calling for peace in the Middle East, I venture a guess that perhaps the, enforcement, the reaction of law enforcement wouldn't be to let trucks idling, filled with gasoline, idle for eight straight days outside of the parliament buildings. So just something, some food for thought to inject into this debate. But the last point I want to make, again, I'm to, I'm, I guess I have to speak over the people opposite because they don't want to listen, is that I find there's an inherent illogic in a lot of these protests. Now, I've asked a couple times here already just to sort of hear people out. You all have the opportunity to ask questions. You all have the opportunity to uh, get on the speaking list. I see some of you are all ready to go. So let's take the opportunity to listen and, uh, and make comment and ask questions when we have that opportunity. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker. So the inherent illogic in terms of what's going on outside, and there's about six points I'm going to make, and I'll make them quickly. First of all, the amount of federal lockdowns that have been issued in this country in the last two years are exactly zero. They are provincial jurisdiction, first point. The second point is, is that if you're that concerned about trucking mandates, you might want to take notice of the fact that those mandates are applied across the continent. As the member from Kingston Islands rightfully pointed out, there is one that applies to get into the United States, and now there is one that applies to come back from the United States. The third point is that it seems puzzling to this lawyer's mind as to if your intense philosophical position is that lockdowns are problematic and should be eschewed, then why are you causing a lockdown in downtown Ottawa and by virtue of your actions preventing the storekeepers in places like Spark Street, Wellington, and the Rideau Centre from opening. 
It is inherently illogical. The fourth point, Mr. Speaker, is that what I find puzzling is that the party of supposed law and order, the party opposite, Her Majesty's official opposition, is doing exactly the opposite in terms of maintaining law and order in this country. What we've seen instead, and I know they're going to start, they're going to start, they're going to start talking because maybe they don't like what I'm about to say, but their interim leader has actually said, let's not tell them to go home, let's instead make the Prime Minister wear this one. So instead of encouraging law and order and enforcement of the law, they're encouraging exactly the opposite. What I find also puzzling, Mr. Speaker, is that the official opposition prides itself on being the party of fiscal prudence. By the last tally that I heard, Mr. Speaker, this protest, quote-unquote, is costing the good people of Ottawa, the City of Ottawa, and the Ottawa Police Service about $800,000 a day. In terms of fiscal prudence, that's not fiscal wisdom. I, I'm, I'm very impressed that a member of physician of no, no less than a physician is seeking to heckle me from across the way because he isn't happy with what I'm talking about. Order, order. I don't know why we've descended into it. We've had great debate up to now, and for some reason we've descended into, uh, into a lot of heckling. Uh, I would appreciate it if we just uh, let the member finish it up. He's only got two minutes and 21 seconds left. Um, and you guys, uh, the, the, the members, will have the opportunity to ask wonderful questions. Vous aurez la chance de poser des questions. He will have the chance to ask questions and make comments. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and what I would point out in terms of a fifth inconsistency is that the members opposite like to pride themselves on constantly eschewing foreign interference. We heard this come up only in the last 30 minutes. What I recollect even prior to my time in politics, was lots of concern about things such as foreign money flowing into this country with respect to environmental protesters, particularly with respect to the Alberta oil sands. I do find it puzzling and a little bit inconsistent that there is much less concern about foreign money that has been declared to be flowing into this country right now in support of what these people are calling a protest. And that is money coming from Florida and money coming from Texas. So I do find that inconsistency a bit puzzling and to weaken uh, my friend's opposite's position. But let's get back to maybe some place where we can find a meeting ground. There is some discontent, clearly. Some of that discontent has been fomented in the form of hatred, which thankfully everyone has eschewed in this chamber. I think we could be doing it a little bit more forcefully. But what I do think we need to do is get to the stage where we understand that the point has been made and the notion of taking a city hostage and occupying it and taking your concern with perhaps my government or this side of the aisle and man manifesting it and fomenting that kind of protest against a cashier at Rexall against a storekeeper at the Rideau Centre and against the people in the city that are just trying to go about their daily business and get some rest has gone too far. That is when the protest loses credibility. And unlike exactly as the member from Kingston and the Islands put it, normally protesters want to gather momentum. What they've done is exactly the opposite. They've created people who don't see them as credible, don't see them as legitimate and want them to leave. The point has been made. I think the time for the convoy is over so that we can get down to the business of producing better policies and better politics for this within this chamber for this entire nation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. Question and commentary. The Honourable Member for Col uh, Cumberland Colchester. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to rise on this very important topic. You know, I, I really quite find it very, very fascinating that the member opposite would suggest that somebody over here drove those trucks there. Uh, that's really quite fascinating that we're somehow responsible for this uh, and, and that we're responsible for ending it. I believe that this evening our leader actually sent a letter to the Prime Minister imploring him to join the leaders of the other parties such that we could come to a peaceful and urgent conclusion to this. So, and I guess the other thing that's interesting, Mr. Speaker, is my honourable colleague Michael Chung, sorry, my honourable colleague uh, who spoke earlier. Thank you very much. The other Honourable Member Cross, appreciate that. Uh, the other Honourable Member down the, down the road, who I can't remember where he's from, but that being said, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the member opposite actually was not here to hear his speech, in which he said very clearly that we agreed with law and order and the Order. I, 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 I'll, I'll, let you ask the, I'll let the member ask the question in a second. But you cannot refer to someone being here or not being here. So uh, I know just retract that and ask, ask the question. I'll Member for Cole, Cumberland, Cole, Chester. I'm sorry for saying that the member was not here. I really apologize for saying that he wasn't here. Uh, that's unfortunate. You, you can't, you, you can't, you can't, you get us just un unreservedly apologize for him. Whether, whether someone's here or not is irrelevant. 
The Honorable Member for Cumberland Colchester. I'm very sorry for saying those things that I said previously over and over again. I apologize <laughs> for that, Mr. Speaker. You know, the unfortunate thing is, is when we have these debates, perhaps the that everybody should pay very close attention to what's happening, Mr. Speaker, and that would make the debate much better. So, will you get your Prime Minister out there to talk to these people? <laughs> make sure, uh, to, to the member of Cumberland Culture, so make sure that when he asks a question, he's asking it to the chair, not directly to a member, the, the, the Parliamentary Secretary. So, so th three quick responses. No one accused the member opposite or his colleagues for driving the trucks outside. Second point is that attempting to resurrect his interim leader in terms of what she may have said today does not eviscerate what she said last Monday, which is that we should take political advantage of the situation, not discourage people to leave, and indeed make the Prime Minister wear this as his problem. That is a matter of record that has been reported by multiple media outlets. And thirdly, I actually find it quite puzzling that the member opposite, given his vocation as a medical doctor, is not appreciating the simple fact that if people of his ilk are afraid to wear scrubs in public and are being told by law enforcement not to wear scrubs in public because they might be targeted, we have a problem generally and we have a problem for those in his profession who I hope he would stand up for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Avignon Mitis Matan Matapedia. Point of order. Well, in Colchester. It's quite possible that I don't know the rules, but I, I'm quite sure that ilk is really not a favorable term that, that I should be called in this great House of Commons. Yeah. Uh, I guess we're descending into debate, uh, de debate a little bit. Um, the Honourable Member for Avignon, Matan Matapedia. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. He was referring to uh, words uh, from the member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan earlier, and I'm also uh, a little bit, how can I say this, a little bit concerned by what he said earlier when he said that, you know, colleagues, I would challenge you to go speak to the protesters, to go see what these people are living, as if over the last two years as parliamentarians, we had never sp gone out and spoken to uh, our constituents, to businesses that are having difficult times, people that have had to close their businesses, to people who don't agree with uh, the public health measures. You know what? We've been talking to our fellow citizens for the last two years, and we've heard all of this. And, you know, to be unhappy about this, that's legitimate. Uh, and I would like to know if my colleague agrees with me and that it's not just up to the police of Ottawa, the city of Ottawa to manage this, but also the federal government has some responsibility to manage this. Thank you for the question. And I know that there is a responsibility at every level here in this country, the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. But the policies that we've put in place have always been based on science and experts and doctors. And that's where we find our guidance. And we listen to them and we will continue to follow their advice in this situation. Thank you. Entire questions and comments of the Honourable Member for Nunavut. I wanted to thank the member for acknowledging that uh, the NDP have a great leader in our member for Burnaby South. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share the same sense of um, uh, acknowledgement for the Liberal leadership. Uh, the Liberal government has shown a history of either inaction or responding to uh, uh, issues too slowly, uh, some of which include um, them having made promises to address indi indigenous housing, to flow funds for housing so that there's uh, less overcrowding, and of course to uh, the extremist activities at the Hill. Uh, can the member commit to ensuring that uh, implementation of the four-point solution that uh, our mem the Bernie South addressed and when he asked for this emergency debate, which first is to calm the situation at the Hill and then to end with the in, ensuring that there's a strategy to uh, making sure that uh, Canadians live, move to a sense of normalcy so that we can make sure that, first of all, he meets with the municipal leaders, that he addresses the interference with funds from foreign uh, states and to make sure that provinces and territories are have this. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary with a very short answer. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for a question, uh, the member opposite for a question. And what I would say to her is simply that as of yesterday, we had an announcement from the Prime Minister that a table is being struck with respect to leadership from all three levels of government. That is exactly the type of cooperation we need because we are seeing a situation that is very concerning for the city of Ottawa and for all Ontarians and all Canadians. Thank you, Merci. Reprise de Bedeval, continuing debate, the Honourable Member for York Simcoe. Hey! Simcoe. Blake Simcoe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be sharing my time with the Honourable Member from Brandon Surrey. I'm glad we're having this debate this evening. It's a very important issue, and it's necessary to address the growing sentiment that exists right here across this great country. Canadians are frustrated, Mr. Speaker. They're sick and tired. Constant shutdowns, lockdowns, restrictions, mandates are having a terrible toll on our country's population. This toll is now becoming far beyond that of COVID-19 itself. After two years, we know that COVID-19 is not going away. That's why we have to use all the tools at our disposal so that Canadians can live healthy, normal lives and businesses can reopen. Unfortunately, the Liberal government has failed in its handling of the pandemic and now they are failing to provide Canadians with a credible plan to get life back to normal. Even as countries around the world drop their restrictions and mandates, even as they put forward plans to help their citizens learn to live with COVID, the federal Liberal government persists with policies and practices here in Canada that no longer make sense. Over 90% of the population has been vaccinated already. And we know that vaccines have limited utility in preventing the transmission of the Omicron variant. Instead of putting forth a credible plan, the Liberals continue to sow division and resentment among Canadians. They ignore the widening gap between those on guaranteed government salaries, like themselves, and those who are only able to work if the government lets them. There is a widening gap between those who live in rural Canada and everyone else. A gap between low-income workers and those at the very top. Between homeowners and renters and the haves and the have-nots. It's no wonder Canadians are angry and frustrated. It's no wonder that after two years that frustration has led to one of the most significant protests Parliament Hill has ever seen. The freedom convoy of trucks and other vehicles that have assembled outside from coast to coast. They are here at Parliament, as is their right, protesting the policies of the federal government. They are doing this outside the federal building and protesting provincial policies outside legislative buildings across the country. I would note, Mr. Speaker, that this is the appropriate place to do that. They aren't outside private homes or cottages of MPs or Premier's homes. The Prime Minister may not want to speak to those protesters, but I have, Mr. Speaker. I've spoken to many of them. I've read their signs and listened to what they are saying. And one thing is abundantly clear. It's not just the protesters outside in the provincial capitals across the country who have these so-called unacceptable views. These views, are held by, <clears throat> these views are not held by some fringe minority. I've heard these opinions from my own constituents. Canadians from all walks of life have real concerns about how the Liberals have handled this pandemic and want to know what the government is doing to put COVID-19 behind us. Instead of addressing these concerns, the Prime Minister, his government, and some in the mainstream media have labelled them as racist, misogynist, extremist, just to avoid scrutiny for the Liberal government's numerous failures. Unlike the Prime Minister, I believe the most important job I have as an elected representative is to listen to the residents of my community just as it is his job supposed to listen to the citizens of this great country. Over the past few weeks, I've heard from the owner of a local gym in Bradford, Nine Round, who was in tears. She has been sucked down so many times, she can't even count. She now owes thousands of dollars in rent with no relief available to her and no confidence that anything will be changing anytime soon. I've heard from an elderly man in Keswick who was eligible for no COVID-19 support and forced to eat Kraft dinner now five days a week for supper. 
because he can't afford to buy proper groceries as inflation continues to rise. He told me, Mr. Speaker, he never thought his retirement would look like this. I've heard from a couple in Jackson's Point who returned from a cruise near Egypt, only to be locked up in a quarantine hotel for days on end, with no clothes and no access to life-saving medication. I've heard from families in Mount Albert who experienced the pain of losing a loved one to COVID-19, and seniors in Sutton who have been isolated in long-term care homes and other facilities for the past two years without the ability to see their families or the outside world. I've heard an expected single mother in Holland Landing who provided for her family through her job in a federally regulated industry. She was fired because she made the decision that she wanted to wait to get vaccinated after she had her child. I've heard from parents in Bondhead whose son has, hasn't been to school in 18 months, Mr. Speaker. Every single one of these people has real stories, valid concerns about where our country is after two years of COVID-19. Many Canadians are hurting right now. Many have lost their jobs, they've lost friends and families and lost faith in their government and institutions. And Mr. Speaker, they deserve to be heard. My constituents in York, Simcoe and Canadians across the country have diligently followed public health advice, made sacrifices, done what's necessary to keep their families and communities safe throughout this pandemic. They have done their part. Now it's time for the Liberal government to do their part. It's time for a re-examination of the government's COVID-19 response and a more sustainable path that gets life back to normal and gives Canadians hope for the future. What does that path look like? It's clear that more must be done to ensure that those most vulnerable are protected as best we can from the coronavirus. But that can be done without devastating and ineffective lockdowns and mandates that cripple the economy and impact the lives and livelihoods of Canadians. I spent most of my life working as a restaurateur. I know the challenges and triumphs that exist in the industry. It can be hard to make ends meet and keep your doors open in the best of times. But when the government has shut you down and prevented patrons from coming in, it's no wonder many have closed their door for as good. Instead, we need to be looking at alternative policy approaches that will keep Canadians safe while strengthening our economy and respecting individual freedoms. In summer of 2020, my colleagues and I in the Ontario Conservative Caucus were criticized by state media, the Liberals and the NDP for examining an innovative rapid test that Health Canada had not approved after months of delays, despite being available in the US and across Europe. We were looking for solutions and to hold the government count so it could be the best it could be. But instead of addressing the prolonged delays at Health Canada, and instead of looking at best practices of other countries, Government members opted to criticize, ridicule, and ignore. That's why it's no surprise those same rapid tests, and many like it, are still hard to come by for most Canadians today, two years later. But it's not just rapid tests. We need better medical approaches that focus on treating those who are suffering from COVID, not just fruitlessly trying to stop its transmission. Right now, we have some of the worst health care capacity in the G7, and our system will remain strained because of delayed surgeries and other procedures. Where is the plan for that, Mr. Speaker? Where is the funding for the provinces? But no matter what is done to specifically address COVID-19 going forward, one fact remains. Most of us hate to see the country as the state it's in today. It's hurt, and it has divided us. That's why it's important that we restore a sense of unity in Canada, a shared commitment to one another. It's time to put aside the divisive rhetoric and policies and politics that drive wedges between neighbours, family members and friends. There needs to be a recognition that we are all in this together once more as we look towards a future. This is what our country needs and it requires the right kind of leadership to make this happen. Canadians are telling us that they want this parliament and they want it to work together while representing every part of this country and the people who live here. 
and they are telling us they want to see a government that is committed to collaboration, accommodation, and a willingness to listen. Mr. Speaker, I hope the Prime Minister is listening. Right, our questions and comments. We're going to go to Zoom, the Honourable Member for King's Hands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague from York Simcoe for his remarks tonight. Uh, through you to the member opposite, you'll forgive me if I thought I was sitting in Queen's Park as the member opposite highlighted uh, the school closures, uh, the gym that was facing troubles, and of course businesses. I presume he won't be voting for Doug Ford in the upcoming election in Ontario because that is the government that is imposing those elements. What I will agree with the member opposite, of course, is that we do need to transition beyond COVID. Dr. Theresa Tam is talking about that right now as our other chief medical health officers. But my question is this, going back to the protest in February of 2020, this member highlighted, of course, the Wet'suwet'en protests and the economic cost of what the blockades were representing. He said that in committee, it's on the blues for the record. My question to him today, is he not concerned about the economic cost of the blockades that we're seeing in Ottawa, indeed in other places? And why has he not spoken up for these protesters to go back home? The Honourable Member for York Simcoe. Well, I thank my Honourable Colleague uh, for the question. You know, uh, pointing out uh, the provincial, um, let's say, lockdowns to this, I'm trying to show the government the people that are outside right now are hurting. Okay? This is what has all led to this. This is the frustration that people have. People are crying in their businesses right now. Literally crying, Mr. Speaker. You know, the gym I talked about that the member alluded to, she owes the $40,000. She showed me, Scott, my payment is $831 for this. I have $600 in my account and I'm shut. I can't make money. And she's sitting there crying in front of me. This is the frustration we have out there on the streets right now, Mr. Speaker. And I wish my honourable colleague would go out and talk to some of these people and listen to them. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Evignon Amitis, Matan Matapedia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech. And I appreciate his tone. He, uh, he had a very uh, calm uh, tone, and he uh, calmly evaluated uh, the situation and the situation facing a number of his constituents, but I have the impression that you know, we're not finding a solution to the current crisis here. I've heard politicians uh, tonight uh, uh, hit the ball back and forth across uh, the House because we all have a different vision. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about us, but also, you know, all of our constituents. We have a different vision of what measures should be in place and how we should deal with this situation. And in the short term, I don't think that uh, all of this is going to get the uh, trucks uh, off the street tomorrow when, when uh, politicians are using the crisis. Uh, uh, to their advantage. So I'd like to hear my honourable colleague on that. Does he think that it's putting oil on the fire to uh, see politicians try to make gains off the crisis? No. Oh, I love that. <laughs> no, and I, I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the, for the question. You know what? No one should be making political gains off this. This is where, you know, again, I spoke to it in my speech. We are in a minority parliament. Canadians have sent us here to work together and, quite frankly, come up with a solution for this. You know, today, um, our leader put forth a, a, a suggestion to the Prime Minister that we should go out and, and meet with these people. Canadians don't want to see um, these convoys anymore. And, you know, these are the conversations about new government policy, about mandates that we all have to have together, Mr. Speaker. You know, the government will keep alluding to 92% of, of Canadians are vaccinated, 90% of truckers are vaccinated. You know, people will ask the question, and it's okay to ask that question now. You know, Scott, why am I being put in, in a corner? If it's 90%, why the mandates? Why the mandates? And they keep alluding to the United States. I don't take my marching orders from the U.S., Mr. Speaker. We have time for a 30-second question and a 30-second answer, and the Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his comments. He says that he doesn't take his marching orders from the United States. Well, with the convoy, what we are understanding is that there's a lot of money coming from the United States. So does he agree that that should be stopped? Uh, and in fact, uh, this is going to be brought up at committee uh, as an issue from the NDP. And would he agree that funding from the United States should not be going to the convoy and it should be stopped. 
Member for York Simcoe. Well, forward the bill. Well, I, th I thank the honourable colleague for the question, and it's my understanding, Mr. Speaker, that that is being studied at this time and being looked at. Thank you. Continuing debate, reprise the debat, the honourable member for Brandon Souris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague from York Simcoe for uh, he's used to wading into deep uh, waters, and he's uh, done a great job of speaking on this one tonight. As I rise today, unfortunately, I rise with heightened awareness of just how divided Canadians have become. This emergency debate is predicated on that rea very reality. A lot of people are angry right now. On any given day, I hear from people who think that we have too many restrictions, and I also hear from those who want even further imposed. In all my years in politics, I've, seen, I've never seen such heated debates, which has caused a lot of tension in families and in communities throughout Canada. To clear up any misunderstanding, I am vaccinated. I believe they are safe and have helped reduce hospitalizations. I believe they have saved lives, particularly those who are older and have underlying health conditions. I have also encouraged others to get vaccinated. But I want to be able to question the Liberal government's COVID policies without being labelled anti-science, anti-vaccination, or without being discredited because I have the audacity to criticize government policies. For too long, we have been given a false choice that either we acquiesce to every government measure or we are only lending credibility to those who spread false information. The one thing I know for sure is that the political environment we now find ourselves in is directly related to this mindset. Without a doubt, COVID-19 has been hard on all of us. Families have lost loved ones, and many individuals have suffered or are suffering illness. Families in my constituency have been prevented from driving across the border to be with loved ones. University students have been unable to set foot in a real classroom and be able to take advantage of a full educational experience. Healthcare staff in particular have been pressing on for two years to care for those with COVID and all other healthcare concerns. They've provided an essential service and we are grateful for their commitment and sacrifices on behalf of their fellow Canadians. And to those who think that protesting in front of hospitals is a good idea, I can assure you it isn't. The doctors and nurses working in those hospitals are busy saving lives, not setting government policy. The last thing they should have to deal with when coming off a long shift is the sight of angry placards or shouting protesters. Grocery store staff immediately come to mind as do all those involved in our supply chain, including truckers. It may seem thankless to work in these positions during a, long, a time like this, but I hope every single one of them knows how critical they've been. It was on this understanding that governments made a point of underscoring which workers were essential at various times throughout the pandemic. We all understand that we owe a debt of gratitude to these workers. We all want them thank you. We all want them to know how their contributions have helped all of us through this time. And yet, and yet here we are today. After two years of truckers being deemed essential workers, the Liberals decided they no longer wear. After two years of praising their efforts doing what they do best, delivering the goods we rely on, the Liberals decided truckers weren't really essential after all. But the obvious question is. Why? What changed, Mr. Speaker? I get the fact that many don't understand why a certain percentage of truckers don't want to get vaccinated. I get the argument that the vast majority of other Canadians have gotten vaccinated, so why wouldn't the others? Regardless of your frustration with those who won't get vaccinated, we all must have compassion and try to understand that no matter the mandate imposed upon them, they simply will not. At this stage of the pandemic, we must ask ourselves, what reasonable benefit could society and our economy attain from the trucker mandate? The Liberals have failed to give any rationale whatsoever for the decision. And if they're holding on to data include indicating that the truckers have been responsible for COVID outbreaks, they've never shared it with Canadians. This lack of transparency is unfortunate. Canadians deserve to know whether the mandate on truckers is justified. They deserve to know whether the benefit of taking truckers off the road outweighs the impact of our economy, to our economy. 
Worse yet, this government either has no framework for lifting mandates, or if they do, they sure have a funny way of communicating it to the public. We can all appreciate that this situation is fluid. But the government should be able to explain what metrics it is using to determine the scope and speed for removing mandates. On what basis is it making its decisions? There's nothing strange about Canadians wanting transparency from their government. In fact, the government, if the government had, or had, pardon me, if in fact had the government been more open with us, with its federal response, perhaps we wouldn't have seen the same levels of angst among Canadians. Perhaps we wouldn't have seen the same levels of frustration from millions of Canadians who are eagerly awaiting an end to lockdowns and restrictions. It should go without saying at this point, but people are tired. People are frustrated. After two years of personal sacrifices, many are looking to this government to explain the path forward. But to date, it seems like they're waiting in vain. Many Canadian public health officials are signaling, signaling that they want to make a shift in policy. BC's medical, chief medical officer has indicated their COVID response to, it is transitioning to become, quote, much more like how we manage influenza, end quote. As she stated, and I quote, we cannot eliminate all risk, and I think that's something we need to understand and accept as this virus has changed and has become part of what we will be living with for years to come, end quote. In reply to the last question that was asked of my colleague, Ontario's chief medical officer has also said something similar. I absolutely think, quote, I absolutely think we have to start to learn to live with this virus, and we've let our lives be controlled for the, past two, for the last two years in a significant amount of fear, end quote. That's from Ontario's chief medical officer, Mr. Speaker. And Canada's top doctor is noting the need, quote, to be able to address the oncoming presence of COVID-19 in a more sustainable way, end quote. Looking around the world, many countries are removing restrictions or laying out their framework to do so. In the United Kingdom, it's been mentioned in the House many times today, vaccine passports have been dropped. Sweden is removing entry restrictions and domestic rules. And Denmark ended their COVID restrictions last week. A recent Angus Reid poll showed that a majority of Canadians, quote, now say it is time to remove restrictions and let Canadians manage their own level of risk, end quote. If the Prime Minister disagrees with most Canadians, then it's incumbent upon him to explain his rationale. I doubt the Prime Minister wants to unfairly label millions of Canadians as quickly as he labelled those who partook in the convoy as it made its way through Canada. Protests are occurring in communities across the country, but none are more pronounced than what we've seen outside this very place. He's painting every protester with a broad brush, name-calling, dismissing even the most genuine concerns about his government's actions over the last two years. There were literally thousands of people lined up on highways in support of the convoys. The only message they're hearing from this Prime Minister is that because they're supporting the convoy, they too must be beyond redemption. Make no mistake, I denounce any, all symbols of hate and have zero tolerance for illegal behaviour. Anyone who participated in that manner should be ashamed of themselves. Moreover, I think everyone outside should immediately minimize their impact on those who live downtown here in Ottawa. But my message to both the government and to the protesters is turn down the rhetoric, turn down the heat. We must remember we are all citizens and remain so and will remain so after this. We cannot continue to just talk past each other. We will get nowhere if we continue this. The leader of the official opposition has requested a meeting between the Prime Minister and other party leaders so we can come together, depoliticize the response to the pandemic, and talk about where we go from here. Canadians need leadership. They need to see a plan. They need hope. On this side of the House, we're prepared to work together to end this protest 
and help families and communities return to their normal lives. I hope all parties will join in this effort. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a little over an hour ago, uh, one of this member's Conservative colleagues, uh, the member from Wellington Halton Hills, gave a very passionate speech in this House. And though I didn't agree with everything he said, he made it very clear that this blockade that's going on outside is illegal. As a matter of fact, he posted that uh, video of his speech, and on Twitter he's already received well over a thousand retweets and likes of that. Now this is a very different approach, Madam Speaker, to this issue being taken by the member from Wellington Halton Hill than we've seen from the vast majority of Conservatives. I would like to ask this member how he feels about what the member from Wellington Halton Hills uh, said about this blockade being illegal. Does he agree that it's illegal? The Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Mr. Speaker, my people in, in Brandon Suris, the people of the fine constituents of Brandon Suris, believe that these peaceful protests are allowable. But, Madam Speaker, the occupation of downtown Ottawa has been uh, going on for some time. And the reason it has been, let's face it, is because the Prime Minister won't go out and talk to them. So if this member wants to bring up questions about uh, who said what, then I, all I'll say is the Prime Minister, it's in his hands. Our House Leader, or our, pardon me, our Interim Leader today has um, written a letter to the Prime Minister and in the questions here this evening, when the, right to the Prime Minister, asked him to come together with all political party leaders and find a common ground to uh, end the situation that's taking place, not just here on Parliament Hill and in Ottawa, but across Canada. The member for Mirabel. Madam Speaker, I agree with a member for Brandon Suris because it's our role in the opposition to criticize the government's actions, and that's what we do. And it is our role also to represent our fellow citizens who have paid dearly during this crisis. And I honour uh, the fact that our, my colleague has said openly that the protests must be peaceful and legal. But the reason that we're here today, tonight, it's precisely because the protests outside have been neither peaceful nor legal. So I'm, I would like to ask my colleague whether tolerating that kind of behaviour is an implicit way of renouncing our job as the opposition, because we are here to speak for our constituents. Brandon Service. Thank you very much to my colleague for his question, and, uh, and I agree with him in regards to um, the, the, that there needs to be a solution to this protest uh, that's been taking place. And I've been involved in many uh, debates in Parliament Hill and uh, as a uh, lobbyist coming uh, in my lifetime as a farm leader to Ottawa many times to make my point, but we made it and went home. Uh, the situation here is just exactly what I said in the first paragraph of my presentation tonight. It's a rise with heightened awareness of just how divided Canada Canadians have become. And why is that, Madam Speaker? It's because this Prime Minister decided to put mandates on truckers in Canada after they were deemed to be essential for 22 months since the beginning of COVID. We have time for a brief question. The Honourable Member for uh, Edmonton, Griesbach. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I really want to thank the Honourable Member from Brandon Sirs for his delineation between the real issues that are facing our country. One is division, of course, and we both, I believe, condemn the hate speech and the hate symbolism that has been flouted in our nation's capital and across the country. On the other hand, the members talked about the pandemic and the issues with the pandemic, and I'm so encouraged to hear that the member is encouraging members of his constituency to get vaccinated. But the question I have for the member is, considering my home province of Alberta, we have some of the highest numbers still of COVID-19, and ICU units are still in, in surge capacity. Wouldn't the member agree that provinces have also a role to play in making sure that we can handle the pandemic, but also bring forward a plan like the member talks about, freezing restrictions? But that time isn't now. Would the member agree? The Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Well, I, I think uh, I appreciate the member very much for his question, uh, Madam Speaker. But I think the latest news 
is that, that I've heard over the weekend is that Alberta has 91 percent vaccinations and 87 percent of their population is vaccinated with two vaccines now. So I think he needs to catch up on the reality that that's actually uh, at least tied or maybe ahead of the rest of Canada in regards to vaccinations in Alberta now. Um, and so I think that uh, uh, the member has uh, um, maybe a little bit of catching up to do, but that's not the point here. It's, it's the fact that we need to be able to make sure that goods and services are delivered across this country and that the Prime Minister has been dividing the country. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for King's Hands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an absolute privilege to be able to rise virtually, of course, to give remarks on uh, an emergency debate uh, on a topic that I think is of very importance uh, uh, to our country. Uh, indeed, of course, to the people in Ottawa, uh, particularly with what we're seeing with the protests to date. Uh, I would be remiss if I don't mention that I'll be splitting my time today with my honorable colleague from Vaughan Woodbridge. Uh, Madam Speaker, I had the opportunity about a week ago to present in this house for 10 minutes uh, on the reply to the speech from the throne, but I used it as an opportunity to see and to articulate what I was seeing vis-a-vis um, -vis the protests in Ottawa. And of course, there's been seven days transpire since then. And so it's given me an opportunity to refine my thoughts on what we've seen. Uh, members in this house have talked about, of course, MPs, the opportunity to engage. I have seen that. I have had the opportunity to walk through, uh, engage with people on my way back and forth to the hotel. And I'll, I'll give my opportunity to opine on what I've seen. Um, but let me just try to give a synopsis, Madam Speaker, on what my remarks uh, detailed about a week ago. I explained to my colleagues that my father was a truck driver too, and that I am certainly uh, one of the elements that I think is extremely important and a silver lining of the pandemic perhaps has been a reflection and a recognition of the important role that our essential workers play, uh, sometimes who can be unsung heroes uh, in their own right. And so as I did a week ago, I'll go on record for thanking all those men and women uh, that get up and to be able to make a, you know, a very honest living being able to serve uh, in an invaluable way to society and, and hopefully all Canadians are able to reflect uh, on what they're able to bring, whether it be truck drivers, uh, nurses, other uh, professions uh, that are on the front lines of this pandemic, they are doing important work and deserve to be recognized. Uh, I, I reminded this House why some of the provincial and territorial measures are in place, including the measures that the Government of Canada has introduced. And um, although I would agree with my colleagues that certainly, yes, we are all tired and yes, we want to be able to move away from COVID. And I take notice that other jurisdictions around the world are moving in that direction. The reality is the reason we are moving in this direction on some of the protocols we have in place is that a disproportionate amount of unvaccinated Canadians represent the ICU cases in Canadian hospitals from Newfoundland and Labrador to British Columbia. I gave the statistic and yes, I, I take notice, Madam Speaker, that it, it would shift perhaps on a daily basis. But last week, for example, 44% of ICU cases in Nova Scotia were tied up with 9% of unvaccinated Nova Scotians. Uh, and so it becomes a debate and we've heard members go through this in terms of individual freedoms versus collective freedoms. And, and, you know, I'll reference members back to my speech a, a week ago of that tension. And frankly, every parliamentarian, indeed, every Canadian is going to have a different ideological bend on where exactly that line should be. I gave an example of Mark Clark, a dedicated volunteer in my community. Indeed, some members might have seen in the house last week, uh, that I gave an SO31, unfortunately, about his passing. Uh, his surgery was delayed for three weeks, his open heart surgery that he needed because there was not enough beds in the healthcare system in Nova Scotia to be able to accommodate him. Now, we can certainly reflect back, Madam Speaker, and talk about the challenges that existed in the healthcare system. Uh, our government has provided support. Provincial and territorial governments are working hard to make sure the system, frankly, doesn't collapse. It speaks to some of the fragility that existed, but that is the situation we are in. That is why we're imposing these measures as we try to reduce the spread and to try to avoid situations like Mark Clark, who aren't able to be able to access those surgeries uh, and frankly, um, unfortunately, have passed away as a result. Now, again, there's a spectrum there in terms of individual freedoms and protection versus harm and what that line should be. 
every member in this house is going to have a perspective on that. But the reality is that is something that is driving decision making at this point. Um, Madam Speaker, I also certainly highlighted the fact that no Canadian uh, in the country is being required to take the vaccine. Uh, and again, we can weigh whether or not the consequences of that freedom of choice to choose to vaccinate or to not to choose to vaccinate and the repercussions of such are fair and equitable. I think that is all fair game in this house. Uh, but the idea that individuals don't have the freedom to choose on whether or not they want a vaccine, uh, I think, is a fallacy. Um, and frankly, uh, I want to certainly mind, be mindful of the importance of colleagues in this house and the tone and the measures that we set. And, and we've heard this elsewhere, Madam Speaker, uh, from other colleagues who have spoken on this tonight about the importance of how we bring down rhetoric. I, I think all parliamentarians in this house, all 338 of us have a role, elected colleagues in other places of the country. It's not uh, one individual. It's not uh, one side of this house. We all have a role to play. And I think it's important to be mindful of that in the days ahead. But I want to go to the protest in question, because that is the nexus. That's what we're talking about here today. And yes, I take notice, Madam Speaker, that perhaps there are very well-intended people. In fact, as I went through some of the protests in the last week, I, I saw individuals that would be reflected of perhaps the people that might live in my riding, individuals that had certain concerns and wanted to bring those forward. I also saw a much very sinister crowd. Uh, we saw Confederate flags. We saw swastikas. Uh, we've seen businesses, windows shattered, individuals who are flying pride flags in Ottawa being terrorized, uh, individuals being shoved to the ground. The instances I could go on and on and on, Madam Speaker. So while there may be well-intended individuals, and I trust that there are, there is also individuals who want to do much more harm, not just perhaps to parliamentarians or to individuals, but to Canadian democracy, calling for an unruly, uh, you know, overthrowing governments, uh, suggesting that they can go to the governor general to dissolve parliament. It, it, is, an, it is frankly insanity, uh, Madam Speaker. And if members can't call it for what it is, they need to be able to do so. And, and it brings me to my point that if you are someone who is protesting here in Ottawa or elsewhere in the country, and you fashion yourself as a well-intended individual who wants to uh, exercise your section uh, two uh, sub B of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to protest, uh, fine. But recognize that your voice is being drowned out right now by individuals who are far more sinister, who have far more sinister views. And I think the point has been made, as other parliamentarians have said in this house, if you are one of the good ones, it's time to go home. It's time to go back and let the people of Ottawa have their rights and freedoms back, their ability to go to work unhindered, their ability to go on with their lives without fireworks and horns and the whole circus that we've seen here in Ottawa. And I, I and again, I have to be careful with my own words, Madam Speaker, but I hope you sense my passion. If you're one of the good ones and you're watching this here today, it's time to go home because indeed you have members of parliament that will stand in this house as we've heard here tonight and will continue to debate the issues that matter to you. In fact, that's what we do in a democracy. We as members of parliament bring information back from constituents that we hear and we bring that message and we debate it on the floor of the House of Commons, not by clogging up streets. And, and I, I want to take it to the Wet'suwet'en protests that we've seen in 2020. Frankly, there was conservative members of this house, Madam Speaker, that uh, were, uh, you know, rightfully calling that there was needed to be an end to the blockade, that this was something that was disrupting the economic uh, prosperity of the country. People were, uh, you know, shutting down critical infrastructure. Now, I take notice there has been some conservative members, particularly in the last few days, start to make a breakaway and talk about that. Um, but I think on the whole, if I could, Madam Speaker, through you, there has been a hypocrisy by the Conservative Party of Canada. They have not used that same language and that same principle. And I stand here as a member of Parliament saying that regardless of how you view the issue, regardless of what your issue may be, you do not have the right to shut down critical infrastructure in this country. You do not have the right to uh, do what you're doing. If you want to come to Parliament Hill and protest, that is your right. It's a constitutionally protective one. But to create the disruption and harm that is going on right now, it is not right, Madam Speaker. And indeed, every single member of this House should be calling for the same thing, for individuals to go home. 
I only have about one one more minute, Madam Speaker. Uh, Ten minutes does not suffice on a on a conversation such as this. Where do we go from here? Uh, individuals have suggested the prime minister negotiates or comes out and talk. Who who do you negotiate with? It's a mob rule right now. Who would you actually turn, you know, to those members who have suggested that here tonight, who would you turn the prime minister over to actually speak to in that group? Because it's not clear to me who the leadership of this group is. And even those that are seemingly leading, I think, have a much more sinister view. I think it's time, as the ministers have indicated, for the police to use their discretion to be able to make sure that this protest is wound down, that we can carry on with the, the business of the nation, and that members of parliament can articulate uh, in this House and debate what needs to be debated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would put it to the member that it's not about negotiating, it's about listening. It's about listening to the fact that there are, are, are tens of thousands of people across the country who are protesting in different ways, some of whom are driving their trucks places and then going home, some of whom are staying places. But the point is, people are concerned about losing their jobs over mandates, mandates that need to end. But I want to put a specific question to the member, and this is about the discussion around foreign funding. Because many members have raised this issue, oh, for, foreign, foreigners are donating money to this rally. Well, Conservatives have been talking for a very long time about the need for tough new laws to address foreign interference and address foreign funding. And that's constantly dismissed by the other parties when it comes to uh, all kinds of other causes, including election interference. So I'd like to ask the member, will his government put forward legislation to address concerns about foreign interference in our democracy across the board? You can't just complain about it in one case and then let it go in other cases. But if the government is going to put forward good faith legislation that addresses foreign, foreign dollars coming into Canadian political debates across the board, I think there would be a lot of support for that in, in the House. Would the member put forward that legislation? The Honourable Member for King's Hands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to address my colleague's first point around individuals who are choosing to exercise and, and protest. I have no issue with individuals who want to protest. Uh, I have issue with people that are blockading highways in Alberta. I have issue with people that are blockading the downtown of Ottawa. If the member suggests that government should acquiesce to individuals who protest, yes, I understand. Governments need to listen. Governments need to take into account. That does not always mean that they have to agree. So if the member opposite thinks that government should just acquiesce and do what individuals are driving and suggesting is wrong, and that's the way we should run our democracy in this country, that is a very, very poor view. As it relates to the, uh, the aspect around financing, yeah, absolutely would agree that if we are going to move on a law to have foreign interference, it should apply to all individuals through all causes, if that is the true desire where government and parliamentarians want to go. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would like to thank my colleague for his speech. And I agree that it is legitimate to protest, but its facts perhaps are more debatable. But I heard this cry from the heart to the protesters telling them to go home. But I don't think the protesters are just going to say, oh, okay, let's go home. I think the federal government should have given a clear message from the very beginning and should not have let the protesters get a, a foothold. They should have cooperated with the government of Ontario and with the city of Ottawa and have a plan from the beginning because now things have gone too far and we don't know what to do to get out of it now. So what does the member propose? What should the government do to put an end to it? Thank you. Merci, Madame la Présidente, et je veux remercier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her question. Of course, the federal government's role when it comes to police issues is to support an increase in the number of certain police forces on the ground. And the role is to work with the municipal government in the province of Ontario to find a solution to help people on the ground. At the end of the day, it is the Ottawa police or the RCMP's discretion that comes into play to decide what the best response is to stop the protest. The Honourable Member for Port, uh, Port Moody, Quick Whitman. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just wanted to speak to a point that uh, the member from Burnaby South brought at the beginning of this debate, and that is the emergency rescue for the health care system. So I asked the member of our, our, for, about our health care system. Will the member agree that it starts with funding it properly? And will the government answer the calls of the premiers to increase health care transfers to the provinces? If answer from the member for King's Hands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll try in 30 seconds. Look, I, I think that there's important investments that need to be made in our health care system. I don't know if I necessarily agree with the fact that they should be transfers without strings from the government of Canada to ensure that outcomes are being uh, made. I don't speak for the government of Canada. I'm a member of parliament that happens to be in the governing caucus. I'll let our cabinet speak on that issue. But what I would say is I do think there's opportunities for the ability for private delivery, still under a single payer model, still under the uh, public model to deliver outcomes. Uh, and it's not all just about money. It's about how we can have better management and health care system as well. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and uh, good evening to all my colleagues, uh, both here uh, in presence and virtually. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, Madam Speaker, before I, I begin my formal remarks, uh, um, uh, before I begin my formal remarks, excuse me, Madam Speaker, I uh, I'd like to comment on the way I look at the situation we are faced here with in this wonderful and blessed country that we all call home. And we, as 338 parliamentarians, have the privilege to serve each of those residents that, uh, that live in our ridings uh, and come here and do our best and put forward what I would call reasonable leadership. Reasonable leadership to debate the issues, reasonable leaderships uh, to do what is right for our constituents, uh, to do what is right and recommend for their public uh, safety, for their public health, and do what is right to exit this pandemic so we can all return uh, to what I would call uh, a new normal, but a normal that we would want to see. Uh, we're in winter now, uh, summer, spring and summer will then come, and the days are getting longer, and hopefully soon they'll be, be getting warmer, and we'll want to be at a barbecue with our friends, traveling, enjoying all of what Canada has to offer. And we can do that in a number of ways. And for the last two years, Canadians, including those wonderful residents in my riding of Vaughan Woodbridge, have been resilient, but they're tired. We're all sort of tired. We're all tired of COVID-19. We're all tired of talking about it. So when I think about the best way to exit this pandemic, it's through vaccinations. It's through Canadians doing the right thing, and they have, and they are. And we ask them to continue to do that, but we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. We are, but we have to be patient. Now, that's the one aspect of what Canadians going through. They're getting back to work. Kids are back in, in the province of Ontario, back in school physically. Universities are opening up uh, for in-person classes. It's great to see. Our manufacturing businesses continue to run. Our frontline workers continue to do the great job they do day in, day out. And they have uh, my utmost respect. Uh, but at the same time, we still have work to do and we need to rem be, remain focused on the ball. Now we have this occupation or, and this protest that has gone here uh, in the uh, city of Ottawa the home, our nation's capital. And as I said last week uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, a panel with some of my colleagues, it needs to come to an end. It does need to come to an end. It is disruptive. It is disrupting people's lives from earning a living for all those businesses along Sparks in the downtown core. It has made people feel very unsafe. And it is not about a trucking mandate. 95% of, uh, of truckers in Canada are vaccinated. The same rule applies in the United States, going into the United States or coming into Canada. People need to be vaccinated. So there's no disagreement there. We know vaccine saves lives. For those people on the other side of the, other, my colleagues on the other side, I'll say, well, truckers are by themselves. No, truckers go home to a family member and see their friends and we need them to get vaccinated. And they have overwhelming numbers, but there are people uh, Canadians out here that I have the utmost respect for, Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian, that will dis disagree with that. They don't want to be vaccinated. They don't believe in that collective responsibility that we all need to have as a country, as citizens of this beautiful country, we have a collective responsibility to exit COVID-19. We need to work together. And Canadians in an overwhelming majority have. Now, in the province of Ontario, the lockdowns, which many of these folks outside are protesting against, are provincial lockdowns, provincial measures, which are now being lifted. Today, I read that in the city of Toronto, 
uh, this summer that Luminato and I think it's Carabana will be in-person events. So we are returning to see some, seeing some norm normalcy. We are starting to get that back, but it's coming incrementally. These individuals outside, and I walked through like many of my colleagues have, and you know, looked at some of the signs and stuff, it's a hodgepodge of a lot of different uh, issues. They want to overthrow a democratically elected government. Would you sit down with somebody who wants to overthrow a democratically elected government? Is that who you're supposed to speak to? I don't think so. That's not reasonable leadership. It's not reasonable le leadership at all. And for many of my colleagues on the opposite side and, and my, my own side, I'm not a partisan MP. I want to debate the issues. I want to do what's right for the residents of my riding to make sure we have a prosperous future. We've recovered more than 100% of our jobs. Our economy is bigger than it was pre-pandemic. We've done the right things. We've shown reasonable leadership. And we continue to show reasonable leadership. Canadians don't expect perfection from all 338 MPs. They expect us to do our best. They expect us to do what is right. Meeting with protesters who want to overthrow a democratically elected government is not what is right. And I know many of the opposition members in the, in, in the loyal opposition agree with that. And many have commented on their Twitter and social media platforms that the occupation must end. If they, people want to protest up and down the sidewalks and hold placards and hand out information pamphlets, God bless them. That is their right. That is their sacred right. And I believe in civil liberties. But I also believe very much in collective responsibility of doing what's right for your neighbor. Just like Canadians in an overwhelming majority across this country, in every province, in every city, rural or urban, have done. 34,000 Canadians have died because of COVID. The government has had the backs of Canadians for two years, invested $500 billion to support Canadian businesses, families, workers, buy rapid tests, secure vaccines. The Conservatives at one time said, we'll never get vaccines till 2030, or 25, or 28. Well, no, they're here, and they're in abundance, and we're actually helping out the rest of the world now. And that's what Canada is about. So when I think of these, the protesters, I have the utmost respect for them. They need to go home. They need to bring this to an end. The citizens of Ottawa deserve that respect. They deserve to have their lives back. The shopkeepers who invest their heart and soul in their businesses that are shut down deserve that. There's no one to talk to because that's just not the right thing to do. Plain and simple. So. Madam Speaker, when I think about reasonable leadership, I say this, blockades must end, because that's reasonable leadership. We must do it, continue to do what's right. And I agree, we need to continue to, I believe in science. Absolutely, I think every 338 MP should believe in science. I have faith in what they say. They may not be perfect, but if their comment says we need to transition, we transition. But let's do it prudently. Let's do it judiciously. Let's do it in a safe manner that gets us there. Let's not do what happened, happened in Ontario, where we open up, fill the stadiums full of people, and then we gotta shut down, because then our hospitals are over capacity again. And then we have to cancel tens of thousands of surgeries, and have people literally waiting months and years to get surgeries that they need. That is not responsible leadership. We, as a government, are showing responsible leadership. And I plead to my colleagues, I listened to some of the debate earlier on, being respectful is who we are as a people. Not polite, respectful. I.e., we can debate, we can scream, but we need to be respectful. And I hope to see that all the time when I come into the House of Commons, into this cradle of democracy, if you want to call it that, into this House. We need to do that. Madam Speaker, I did have some uh, formal notes, and I'll, I'll read some of it. Um, but what I really want to reiterate tonight is these, this occupation, these protests, they need to come to an end. This is not about trucking mandates. It's not about that. We need to exit COVID-19. That's our focus, not anything else. We need to keep Canadians safe. That's what we should all be doing, not meeting with protesters or who who hold up awful placards 
that we all know about and we don't need to discuss again, who don't respect the rule of law, who don't respect the citizens of Ottawa to get a good night's sleep or for their, their family to be safe and to feel safe. So, Madam Speaker, the protest against vaccine mandates is gripping the city of Ottawa as well as other parts of this country. All members know that COVID-19 pandemic has cost us dearly with a loss of life and livelihoods. Not one of us has been untouched. It goes without saying that this period has been long, extremely challenging for all Canadians. The provinces and territories have legislative authority to implement and execute the pandemic response actions that are appropriate for their jurisdiction, including implementing and easing public health restrictions. Now, Madam Speaker, I'll be the first one that really wants to go to uh, a big wedding or my daughter's bapt uh, communion in, in a couple months so we can invite all our relatives. I see that Madam Speaker is asking me to wrap it up, so I will stop there. And just to say it's nice to see everyone this evening. I hope you and your families are keeping safe. And I can't wait to see all my colleagues in this place together, hopefully soon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And comments? You want to remember for Brandon Sirs? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to uh, thank my colleague for his speech tonight and presentation. But he, as well as his predecessor, uh, the speech before him, indicated that they didn't know who they should go and talk to, to talk to the, to the, uh, to the trucking uh, organizations and individuals who are out in the streets here and across Canada. Um, but first of all, you have to make the offer. Madam Speaker, we know that there are organizers in this uh, cavalcade. They didn't come all the way across Canada uh, by just uh, telephoning each other up and saying we're going to move across the country and end up in Ottawa. Uh, there are organizers. The government has failed to even ask who that would be. I'm sure if they put an olive branch out to those people, they'd, they'd get a meeting in an hour. Uh, and our leader today, our interim leader, has indicated that to the Prime Minister that he should sit, he should do that and he should sit down with all of the elected leaders of the parties in this House and come up with a common solution to end this uh, blockade. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Uh, Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member from Brandon Sears for his, for his uh, question. What I will say is this, you know, our government put in place a measure to help protect Canadians and Canadian in this place, in this instance, truckers. I spoke with a uh, president of a trucking company in the region I represent, 1,300 employees, uh, 3,000 uh, beds, if you want to call them that, um, trailers, excuse me, and 95% of his workers, 95% of his truckers were vaccinated. He operates in, in York Region and in the Midwest in Chicago, and he said to me, Francesco, it is the right thing to do. And all my, call, and all my employees who cross that border are vaccinated. That is what I believe in. When I talk to the industry, we gave the industry a long runway to prepare for this measure. The Canadian Trucking Alliance, we spoke with them. They support us and they support this stance. That is what we need to do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Madam Speaker, my colleague has talked about responsible leadership, but for responsible leadership, we need to have leadership. So I would like, uh, I think we should be attacking perception here. So in a country that is very divided, there seems to be unanimous opinion that this government hasn't shown leadership, that it hasn't done its work. And that has led us into the crisis that we're in today. We have the impression that this evening on the government side, the fact that, uh, you know, to, they think that repeating that the convoy has to leave is just going to make the convoy leave. Could my colleague please explain why all those who think we've shown a lack of leadership or seen a lack of leadership in this government, why are they wrong and where is that perception coming from? Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would like to say to my colleague from the Bloc Québécois that... Uh, Leadership is very important for us. Showing leadership and working with the Ottawa Police Services in the City of Ottawa and collaborating with them and sending them resources uh, from the beginning of the, of the convoy uh, until up to date. We have shown leadership in providing the resources that they require. And again, I wish to reiterate, how can you go and negotiate with individuals who want to, democ who want to overthrow the democratically elected government that Canadians voted for uh, in the last election? Uh, that to me is a something preposterous, preposterous, sorry, uh, and something that is wrong. You don't go and negotiate uh, with entities uh, that want everything for themselves 
and have no need to, no desire to cooperate, and in fact are not following public health guidelines so we can finally exit this pandemic. Questions and comments? A brief question. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. I wanted to thank the member for his comments and uh, uh, I just needed to express that I disagree that uh, a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. Uh, the extremist activities have shown that this is not the fact, that this is not the case. Uh, law enforcement has reacted very differently to this extremist activities compared to how law enforcement reacts to First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have uh, defended their lands. Uh, having said that, I do want to ask the minister, uh, or, I'm sorry, the member, uh, because he's been talking about uh, responsible leadership. Does he not agree that it's important that the prime minister meets immediately with municipal, le municipal leaders as a way to begin forward uh, towards uh, ending the pandemic? Through the honourable member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Um, I thank the honourable, my honourable colleague from none of it for her question. I will say that the lines of communication uh, between the federal government and uh, the City of Ottawa and the Ottawa Police Services have been constantly open. Uh, they've been constantly there. Uh, we are collaborating. We are assisting them with resources from RCMP officers to obviously intelligence gathering. Anything they need, we are obviously there. We don't direct the police force or the Ottawa Police Force to do anything or undertake any sort of activity. Uh, they're independent, uh, and there's a reason for that, of course. So I would say to my honourable colleague, uh, we are in constant contact with the City of Ottawa, their mayor, and the Ottawa Police Services for the resources they require in this situation. Situation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Yeah. Hey. Madam Speaker, I'm always honoured to rise here in the House. I want to make it clear I'm going to split my time with uh, my colleague from Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. <clears throat> At the current time, uh, the interim leader of Canada's opposition has reached out to Canada's Prime Minister to ensure a peaceful and urgent end to a very, very difficult situation. And the question that needs to be answered is, will the Prime Minister respond? What has become very clear in Canada is that the mood of Canadians is moving towards the be beginning of the end of the pandemic. Reali we realize that, it's, that it is not only the health of Canadians influenced by their physical health, but also by their financial, social, and mental health. I can clearly recall in the early days of the pandemic, holding the hand of someone about to die from COVID-19. They were there without their family. Their only way of communicating with them was through an iPad. Some small redemption in those early days regarding this, this person was that I'd known them previous, previously, and they'd shared with me their journey in life as a young person. How they had documented a bicycle trip across southern England, how they'd been essential to the development of a hospital in Cape Breton, how their wife had died and how they ended up living in the small town of Truro, Nova Scotia. Indeed, to watch this 90-something-year-old male die without his family will forever have a profound impact on my view of the COVID-19 pandemic. Canadians have suffered. It's also important to reflect on the grave concern we should all ha now have with respect to the mental health of children and adolescents. Indeed, my own son has missed out on his high school graduation and the wonderful social times that many of us have experienced in the first two years of university. Getting your own place to live, solving your own problems, meeting new friends, and learning how generally to be an adult all on your own have been things that have been severely dampened by the COVID-19 pandemic. This unfortunate part of the pandemic and the associated isolation is that many people live in their own echo chamber. We've become isolated to the views of the others who would often surround us and engage us in exciting debate and discourse, which sometimes, of course, led us to agree to disagree, but other times led, to truly, led us to truly engage in conversation which would allow us to see another point of view and perhaps indeed indeed change our own point of view. Another example of not seeing other points of view <clears throat> is our inability to travel. We need to better understand other cultures, how they solve problems, how they communicate, 
and how they live. It's important that we do these things. This, my friends and colleagues, leaves us with the need to question those things important to us and to help us better understand how we need to help our fellow human beings. As we have these multitude of different experiences, those things can help us grow as individuals, understand other cultures, learn new languages, and be more resilient to take on our everyday lives. That is not saying, Madam Speaker, that travel is an essential part of being a Canadian. It's simply to say that there are many things which can potentially make us more tolerant of others, which we have deeply missed during this pandemic. For many others, it has led to the tragic end of a business, which they worked so hard and spent their entire life savings trying to build. The travel sector, of course, has been particularly hard hit, as has the hospitality sector. Restaurants are essential to our communities, and the socialization which happens therein has suffered under this unbearable yoke. We all know that Canadians love to have a beer or a coffee and catch up with their friends, to see their expressions, to understand their burdens, to help shoulder the load, and to share a great laugh. Sadly, this too has been transformed by COVID-19. No customers, no socialization, and as I mentioned above, living in your own echo chamber. Moreover, Canadians indeed, <clears throat> and indeed people around the world, have suffered with increased levels of anxiety. They have lost trust, they have lost hope for the future, and they've lost their security. Madam Speaker, what is hope? One might define it as the feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Unfortunately, there's been no certainty and the ability to plan for the future has been lost. We do know there are several things which can benefit the health of our human species. Things such as good sleep, meaningful employment, doing something purely for the benefit of another, important relationships, and physical activity. Essential, all of, those have, all of those things have been disrupted by the COVID pandemic. As we're all aware, many, if not, if not most, of the provincial medical officers of health are calling for the end of mandates. Countries such as the United Kingdom with 64% vaccination rates and Den Denmark with 80% va vaccination rates, compared to the over 86% that we have here in Canada, are removing mandates for, for masks and vas vaccines and passports. We need to begin to recognize the time to move forward is now. The Canadians cannot be expected to live their lives in this perpetual state of uncertainty and without hope as we go forward. To be very blunt, there are many out there who do not have many years left. I'm a 53-year-old man. Realistically, I may have perhaps 15 vigorous years left. Prior to the pandemic, it would have been 17. Do I want to continue my life not seeing the joy of smiles on faces, not being able to travel, not being able to have social events with constituents, limiting my gatherings with family on special occasions such as Christmas and Thanksgiving? to have birthdays that are drive-bys with horns honking from neighbors with signs on our lawns. This, my friends and colleagues, it's not living. It is also very clear from recent studies that lockdowns are not, are not effective. We now know how much the poor federal health care funding in Canada and the lack of surge capacity has perpetuated this pandemic. Prior to the pandemic in my small town with 100 beds in our hospital, we perpetually worked between 90 and 130 percent capacity. Our intensive care beds in Canada per 100,000 people are half of those available in the United States and one-third available of those in Germany. Now, sadly, we have an unimaginable tsunami in terms of the backlog of cases of diagnostic imaging, of laboratory, of special appoint specialist appointments, and mistreatments. How is this perpetual underfunding ever going to allow this catch-up to happen with an overburdened infrastructure and a tired, exhausted, burned-out human health resources of physicians, nurses, and other allied health care providers? So, Madam Speaker, how does this all end? Do we simply trudge forward one foot in front of the next without any hope? Or indeed, is this a defining moment in humanity where those around the globe begin to realize that unfortunately sometimes, and sadly, there can be a face, fate worse, worse than death. How do we begin to move forward? 
One great way is to look at the legendary Colin Powell's legacy of the 13 rules of leadership. General Powell was arguably one of the most influential writers on leadership in the Western world in modern times. As he would suggest, number one, it ain't as bad as you think, it will look better in the morning. Number two, get mad, then get over it. Number three, avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. Number four, it can be done. Five, be careful what you choose, you may get it. Six, don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision. Seven, you can't make someone else's choices. You shouldn't let someone else make yours. Eight, check small things. Nine, share credit. 10, remain calm and be kind. 11, have a vision, be demanding. 12, don't take counsel of your fears or naysayers. And 13, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. All these rules of leadership are not perfect. Leadership is not perfect. One of these things that we also must know about great leaders that you must try, you must care. In the immortal words of John F. Kennedy, we do not do these things because they are easy, because they are hard. I implore this Prime Minister to check the ego, check the position, and meet with leaders of the other parties and bring this situation to a peaceful and urgent end. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? L'honorable député de Pierrefonds. The Honourable Member for Pierrefonds de Lyon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from uh, Cumberland, uh, Colchester, for um, his uh, comments, and and also I want to extend my um, my condolences for the passing of your friend. Um, and and I appreciate uh, a lot of what you said. Um, I'd like to just hear from you, uh, in particular around since we're talking about um, the protests, the convoy in front of the hill right now. And and you didn't mention this at all in your address. And I'm curious about your um, your opinions and your um, your thoughts on this. But but we see, for example, swastikas. We see um, hate speech. We see. Uh, illegal acts such as arson. You didn't have any comments on this. I'm, I'm curious. What are your thoughts on these uh, on these acts, on these flags, etc.? Member, uh, to ensure that he addresses all questions and comments through the chair and not to the member directly. Yes. The honourable member for Cumberland, Colchester. Madam Speaker, thanks very much. Uh, I'll uh, I will thank the member for his question. You know. Uh, my speech tonight, Madam Speaker, was the attempt to turn the temperature down here. This is a very, very volatile and unfortunate situation. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really important that we understand that members on both sides of this House have continued to say that those acts are deplorable, they're despicable. And I think that I find it unfortunate if uh, my, my colleague opposite wants to continue to perpetuate that that is something that anybody in this House would stand for. I think that's very, very unfortunate. It's inflammatory, and it's the exact, the, those exact reasons that I chose in my speech not to talk about those things, but to realize, Madam Speaker, that we need to begin to get to the end of this situation that's very, very volatile. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for APTB, uh, rather, Avignon, Lamitisse, Matan Matapedia. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his speech. I uh, enjoyed listening to it, and it's true that uh, people have developed uh, anxiety and uh, they've become cynical, and uh, many have lost uh, trust uh, in our institutions, and all because, as he said, they're living in their own echo chambers. And I appreciated as well uh, his list of rules of leadership, and I think it's unfortunate that the government hasn't followed those rules of leadership, and I think it's a, it is a, a good idea that the leaders of the main parties uh, get together to find solutions to the crisis, but does he not think that it would be even more productive for the federal government to meet with the City of Ottawa, the Ottawa Police Service, and the Government of Ontario, and all the different uh, groups who are on the ground to find a solution to this crisis? Thank you. Cumberland Tolchester. Madame la Présidente, je, je... Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. I think that there is a time for meetings and there's also a time for action. I think that uh, often the government uh, uh, talks about the importance of having meetings and, and more meetings, but I think now is the time for action. 
And I think it's time for a direction, for a plan for the future, and not just for the future of uh, the occupation, but it's for the future of our country, Canada. Thank you. And the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. And, and I want to start by acknowledging what the member said in his in his intervention that, you know, people are suffering, that COVID-19 has been terrible, that people have died, people have lost so much, that it has been very difficult. But, you know, he talks today, he talks to my colleague from the other party about turning the temperature down. You know, last week I had to ask my staff person not to come to work. She is a young Muslim woman and I was afraid for her safety. I have another colleague working in my office that, that is taking a sick day because she has not been able to sleep and she's deeply traumatized. So how can members of the Conservative Party of Canada continue to create a public relations campaign out of the occupation and our national capital, um, you know, by posing with protesters, posting messages of support and fueling further divisions with their own party and across this nation? For Cumberland Colchester, a brief answer, please. Madam Speaker, that is exactly the thing that we're trying to avoid here this evening. We think it's very, very important, even with respect to the audacity of the members opposite, that we need to turn the temperature down. We need to get the, the, uh, the occupation finished and be able to move forward and, and get back to the great things uh, that we have to offer here in Canada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. And I do want to remind members that when someone has the floor to please be re respectful um, and there's opportunity to ask questions and comments at the proper time. Uh, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Always a pleasure to rise on behalf of the residents and people of Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou, especially on an important topic like this one. Uh, uh, let me be direct, Madam Speaker. Um, I would love to see an end to what is going on outside, a peaceful end, and that end begins with the Prime Minister. COVID has been a difficult situation for everybody. Obviously, everybody in this House denounces any violence, any racialized gestures or symbols that have been displayed over the last two weeks. I rose in this house seven days ago as the Shadow Minister for Veterans Affairs to raise that very point when it came to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And I have no regrets on that point. <laughs> Madam Speaker, COVID has left us with a very fluid situation. Initially, people were unsure whether or not to wear a mask. Then people donned masks at the requests of government. Then we waited for a vaccine. Then we got a vaccine. Then we got our second dose of the vaccine. And then we got our boosters. And I personally did all of these things as quickly as possible. And I encourage those around me to consider doing the same. Here, here. Canadians have been asked to give, and they have given a lot throughout this pandemic. I myself was reflecting earlier today on one of my young children who would not remember a period pre-pandemic. The point is this, Madam Speaker, we all want to get to normal. The people outside want to get back to normal. The people of Ottawa living and working in the surrounding area want to get back to normal. I want the people outside to get back to normal. I want the people living and working in the downtown area to get back to normal. I would love to see the people of Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou get back to normal. And I want to see all Canadians get back to normal. One thing that we've repeatedly heard, Madam Speaker, is the Prime Minister say, we have your backs. I prefer to take a different approach, though. It's Canadians who've had one another's backs the doctors who've had our backs, the grocery store workers keeping groceries available for us, the pharmacists filling our prescriptions, the respiratory therapists helping us, nurses, doctors, truckers. These are the people who've had one another's backs. And I'm yeah. thankful to live in a country like Canada where we can make that claim. In my view, Madam Speaker, a prime minister is a prime minister to all or is a prime minister to none. And there is no middle ground. As my honourable colleague from Nunavut, J. 
just mentioned when uh, addressing my colleague from Vaughan Woodbridge. She referenced the term a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian, which in my recollection was a reference to when the Prime Minister opposed uh, stripping citizenship for people committed of, terroristic, of terrorism offences. We should not forget that the Prime Minister knelt with protesters within the last two years in breach of COVID protocols. And yet, here we have a Prime Minister that is dividing Canadians. Madam Speaker, I have great trouble when I hear the Prime Minister blame unvaccinated people, calling them names, adjectives like fringe, racist, misogynist. From the most basic level, Madam Speaker, if one wants to encourage another to do something like get vaccinated, the best way to do it isn't to call them a name. It's to encourage them, to answer the question. If anything, those types of divisive tactics will alienate rather than re resonate with people who are unvaccinated. Yeah. At the most basic level, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister's job is to unite, as is everybody's job in this House. Unfortunately, I'm seeing a Prime Minister who is choosing to divide, which is genuinely unfortunate. In my capacity as Member of Parliament for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou, I've had many discussions with people, both vaccinated and unvaccinated. The Prime Minister may not uh, appreciate this, but I've had reasonable discussions with people on all sides of the debate. Some people I would call hesitant, and they have questions. That's why I share with them my experience, tell them what I've done, why I did it, and I invite and encourage them to do the same. But I can't force, I can't compel a health care decision. Which leads me to the point of leadership and how we go from today, Monday, to tomorrow, Tuesday, Madam Speaker. This, today, tomorrow, is the time to resolve what is happening outside. I walked around today to and from Parliament Hill two or three times. I probably heard one or two horns all day, which for those who've been here for the past couple of weeks is kind of is anomalous, and I, I, that's likely due to the recent civil injunction. But I noticed something. The tone felt different. It was quieter. Now is the time for a peaceful end, Madam Speaker. We don't have 5,000 people outside. We have a few hundred people remaining. Madam Speaker, if I could speak to the Prime Minister through you, this is what I would say. I would tell the Prime Minister that today he brought his partisan hat to the chamber and that tomorrow he should take that partisan hat off. I would say today the Prime Minister took an us versus them approach and that tomorrow he should meet with the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Bloc Québécois and the leader of the New Democratic Party who arranged and requested this emergency debate. That today the Prime Minister's approach was to look at other people as different. But tomorrow I encourage him to see all Canadians and their desires to move on from the current impasse. The past two years, Madam Speaker, have been hard enough, difficult enough. So I would say to him through you, Madam Speaker, please be a Prime Minister to all and help end this impasse. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for his uh, for his very passionate speech. The member said uh, in his speech that the Prime Minister's job uh, is to unite, as is everyone's in this place. Now, over the past two years, we've seen 34,000 Canadians have died from COVID, 5 million across the world. People in Ottawa have had to file injunctions, as the, the member said himself, in order to get a little bit of peace and quiet. So 
when we see uh, you know members from the opposite side going and and joining uh, this occupation of Ottawa, disturbing the residents and and the peace of Ottawa, does does the member not think that he himself has a responsibility to do the right thing, to be democratic, to stand up for the values of democracy of our great nation? Our member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Uh, Madam Speaker, I feel that's what I'm doing right now, discussing all Canadians, not just some Canadians. I implore a peaceful resolution to what's happening right now. But when we talk about democracy and a peaceful resolution, we're about two weeks in now. Where has the Prime Minister been the last two weeks, Madam Speaker? That's really the big question. But let's not focus just on where he's been the last two weeks. Let's focus on where he's going to be the next day and the next day after that in bringing a resolution to what's happening. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was listening to my colleague's speech very carefully, and I have to say that I appreciated the tone a great deal. It's a change of tone from what we've heard from the Prime Minister and the government. Really, that was a... Uh, us against them tone. And so we don't encourage that kind of tone. But what I think, what I appreciated in my colleague's speech just now is that he said that he was, he was vaccinated, that he encouraged others to get vaccinated, and that he also wants to see the right decisions being made with regard to the health crisis and to move forward and to put an end to the crisis, the protest and to the pandemic. And also, when it comes to de-escalating the crisis, does he, would he and other members of his party be ready to go see uh, the uh, protesters to ask them to leave Parliament Hill so that we can end this uh, occupation crisis. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank my uh, honourable colleague for his, uh, his helpful remarks and for his comments. Uh, Madam Speaker, at this point, I feel a lot of what we can do has really been exhausted. Uh, if I can put it bluntly, the ball is in the Prime Minister's court. Yeah. Uh, he, is the, uh, he is the head of state of Canada. Uh, and I endorse what the leader of the opposition has suggested, which is a meeting between himself, uh, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the bloc, and the leader of the NDP. Uh, these are the leaders of the four um, uh, official parties in the House of Commons. Who better than to hit the ground running to put a peaceful end to listen to the people who are outside and to hopefully move forward in all facets that are necessary. Thank you. We have time for a brief question. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would like to thank my colleague. You know, others have said today, and, and I will say that as well, my father was a trucker. My dad, Duke McPherson, was a trucker. He's worried about truckers. I'm worried about truckers. Uh, so, so what I want to know from this member, you know, when you talk about doing the right thing, listening, helping out, why is it that the Conservative Party, if, you know, if they really wanted to help truckers, why do they reliably vote against improving safety regulations and enforcement, about, uh, vote against better working conditions, vote against increased ability and support for unionizations, vote against improving workers' rights? You know, that's their legacy in this House of Commons. If they actually want to support truckers, why do they constantly vote against truckers' best interest? Uh, a brief uh, response, the Honourable Member Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Uh, I thank my Honourable colleague for her question. Obviously, I, I'm not sure what particular legislation she's referring to, so it's very difficult for me to, to answer a question about general legislation. As Conservatives and as all people in this House, we want what's best for Canadians, and I am prepared to fight for that, as are all Conservatives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the, Minister, to the Minister of International Development. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to share my time with the member for Mount Royal. Madam Speaker, I never thought that I would be in this House having a debate, an emergency debate like this, with our city, Ottawa, under siege in a state of emergency. We have heard so much today from many members, in particular, the Honourable Member for Ottawa Centre, my good friend, 
who talked about what is happening just meters away from the House of Commons, what is happening to the citizens, the, the, de the desecration of our national monuments, including the National War Memorial, of what is happening with the noise, the incessant noise, how it's impacting children, children with autism, people with dementia, people who have to live in the residential districts around downtown. We have heard about the treatment, the assaults, the verbal assaults, the threats, the way in which people wearing masks are being treated, the people who are working downtown. We have heard that all evening. I'd like to talk a little bit today about the impact on my constituents. My riding is only 15 minutes from downtown. And most of my constituents, many of them work downtown. Many of them have not been able to go to work, whether it's on Bank Street or at the Rideau Center. They haven't been able to collect a paycheck for the last 10 days. And those who have had the opportunity to go to work are terrified. They're being threatened. They're being harassed. I had a man write to me to tell me that he works at a church, a church. And this weekend, while at work inside a church, he had to call the police because he was that threatened. I have mothers whose daughters live downtown who have said that their daughters and their friends are facing threats of murder, threats of sexual assault. This is not something that we should be living in the capital city of our country. I was heartbroken when I heard from Jewish mothers in my writing who are saying, how do I explain to my children that people are wearing the yellow star? that people are flying the swastika. What do I say to my children? And this is at a moment where in one of the neighborhoods in my riding, where we have a large Jewish population, there were trucks driving around with vile symbols. This is what's happening in our city right now. We had a mother with autism when they were going down Carling Avenue for hours honking their horns, who, a mother whose child has autism, who actually said she was taking him to the emergency because there was no other way to get away from it. So yes, it is having an impact. And I have a coffee hour with my constituents every Friday. It's virtual now. And there's a young man, a young racialized man who said to me, I don't understand. It's almost a loss of innocence. How can it be that he can't go downtown in his own city because of the color of his skin? And what was really important about that coffee hour is that people in that coffee hour were listening to each other. We actually had some people who were at the protests attend the coffee hour and hear the impact that it is having on some of the racialized LGBT and other members of our society. And I think that. People need to, to, to listen to one another more and be decent again, because what's happening out there right now, that is not decent. It is not peaceful. When you're threatening violence, that is not peaceful. And the impact goes even beyond what's happening downtown. The Queensway Carlton Hospital in my riding has not been able to get their workers from Gatineau on the other side of the bridge to be able to come to work. The nurses and the frontline healthcare workers. So people in my constituency are not able to get the help when they're sick. And worse yet, the CHEO, the Children's Hospital, is having trouble. This is the impact that it's having. This is not about political speech anymore. Maybe it started to be about that, but now it is about mob rule. It's about intimidation. It's about bullying. And it has absolutely no place in our city or in our country. So anybody that is saying that this is a, a peaceful protest or it's somehow about expressing political opinions, that's not what it is. And I think anybody now having seen the impact on people, how this is hurting people. It is unleashing hate. Anybody who sees that impact should not be out there posing for pictures or giving coffee. Madam Speaker, I've worked in parts of the world where politicians thought that they could draw that line, that they could toy with these forces of hatred and somehow use them for political gain. And we've seen what happened. I've worked in Sarajevo. I have worked in Kosovo. I've worked in the Congo. You can't put those forces back in. You have to denounce them. You have to denounce them every single time. You cannot stop those forces once you unleash them. You cannot control them anymore. And Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, when people say, why are we not talking to them? Well, 
I don't think that we want to tell other Canadians that if they were to come with with large trucks, with lots of noise and threaten people and, and cause the kind of terror that they've caused to people in Ottawa Centre, that they're 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 scaring people that if you do that, that's how you can be rewarded by being heard, being listened to. And and who are them? I, I, I'd like to think about it. They're not the truckers because 90 percent of the truckers are vaccinated and and most of the truckers are out there doing their job. And they're not even anymore. The people who like all of us, we are all tired of covid. We're all tired of, of the measures and, and the lockdowns. But it's not even about that anymore. There are people who are a few feet from our House of Commons who are calling for the overthrow of our government, who are calling for harm to come to members of Parliament. That is an attack on the institutions of our democracy, and they want people to lose faith in our institutions. And that is something that we absolutely cannot condone. Madam Speaker, people have asked, what are we doing about it? Every single request from the city of Ottawa with the federal government has provided. We have 300 RCMP officers. We have tactical and logistical support. We have joint intelligence and operations teams, community liaison teams, and we're coordinating between all levels of law enforcement. But politicians do not direct the police. I personally, this weekend and, and before this, have been talking to other levels of government. I've been communicating with the mayor, with the provincial MPP. The prime minister has been doing that, the public safety minister, from the beginning. And we've also talked amongst parliamentarians about solutions to this, that maybe we need to be looking at the financing of these movements. We need to ban symbols like the swastika and the Confederate flag. And I would say the member from Hall Elmer articulated perfectly the impact that that has on Black Canadians. We need to look at social media and how it propagates hate speech. We need to support the businesses and the workers who haven't been able to go to work this week. But Madam Speaker, as I as I finalize my words, I want to leave with one thing. Most people are good. Canadians aren't as divided as people think they are. The fact is 90% of Canadians are wearing masks and getting vaccinated and making sure that they're protecting their neighbors. In fact, what we've seen this week, the Shepherds of Good Hope, the homeless shelter where, where people were, were trying to get food, and some of the women's shelters are getting more donations than they've ever gotten. The Legion, the Terry Fox Foundation. We have people who live in the neighborhood around the hospital who are saying that those workers who can't get home and back safely can stay in their spare room. We have truckers that continue to go out there and deliver goods. And these are the good people. These are the decent, good people. And I think we need to, as we're living through all of this and seeing all of this, and it, it, it starts to affect you and make you wonder about humanity, we need to see that the vast majority of Canadians are good. So I'll leave with one quote from the doctors and nurses in Ottawa. They wrote a statement. And what they said was, we will not cower. We will not hide. We will wear our scrubs in public without fear, knowing that you Canadians have our backs. And that is exactly what we have. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? L'honorable Port Maudie Coquitlam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just wanted to thank the member for the comments today and to thank you for shining a light on the voices that have not yet been heard tonight. Uh, you know who else hasn't been heard, Madam Speaker? It is the nurses, the nurses and the healthcare workers the member just spoke of that are working in the hospitals tonight caring for people. I raise my hands to the healthcare workers and to the nurses experience violence on their way to work. I see you and I offer all of my gratitude to you from myself and the people of Port Moody, Coquitlam. The Honourable Member, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I really want to thank my Honourable Colleague for raising that. And I think we all share that same sentiment. Those nurses, those doctors, those frontline healthcare workers are there every single day caring for us. Whether we take their medical advice or not about getting vaccinated, they are, they are there. They are going to work. And they say they're not heroes. 
but we know that these are the people that we need to be supporting. These are the people, and this is why we've made it illegal that they that anybody would would harass a healthcare worker on their way into a hospital. And that is happening right now in Ottawa. And I want to applaud, along with all members here, the courage and the incredible sacrifice of those workers. Thank you. Questions and commentaires? The member for Mirabel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her speech, which was imbued with humanity, and to speak in the voices of the people who are experiencing the inappropriate and unacceptable acts in the protest. No member in this House has taken a photo with the protesters by accident, and it's unacceptable. And I should say that all of the uh, requests by the City of Ottawa and the police force of Ottawa have been heard by the government, but we feel a lack of leadership, and we can see it tangibly tonight, a few meters away from here. So why hasn't there been enough done, and what remains to be done by the government? The Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, and I, I would say that, in fact, uh, we just today announced that we're going to have a trilateral meeting between the different levels of government. Uh, we know that people don't want to hear us say, oh, it's about jurisdiction. But the fact is that politicians do not direct the police. And what we need to be doing as politicians is, as, as a federal government, is provide all the resources so that the police who have jurisdiction have everything that they need to be able to uphold the law, to be able to do their jobs. And Madam Speaker, I would say that we have been from the very start, in fact, from before the time that the, that the convoy reached Ottawa, we have been having that coordination. We have been talking with law enforcement and at every single level, political leaders have been talking. And as I mentioned, I've been talking with uh, even in my constituency, when uh, when they were rooting them through a residential neighborhood in my constituency. I, I got talked to the mayor and the provincial MPP to make sure that the convoy wasn't being welcomed and sent down Woodruff Avenue. Um, that Every single day, these conversations are happening, and they've been happening from the, the municipal councillors right up to the prime minister, and we need to keep doing that. And then after this is over, I do believe we will have lessons to learn. We will need to sit back and wonder... And and I think, in fact, in part... We want to allow for one quick question before I was trying to give the Honourable Member a, a, a sign there to wrap it up. Uh, a brief a question, the Honourable Member for Brandon Sears. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to ask my colleague why the Prime Minister has put all of his eggs in one basket, will not go out and speak to the truckers. When the truckers have given them an option, uh, the associations that I've spoken to in the trucking industry have said that if they'd have had a negative test available, they'd have taken a negative test, and if they proved that they were negative, they'd go to work. Uh, and if they were positive, they would isolate like anyone else. Uh, I just wonder if she could elaborate on, uh, on why we don't have enough. We didn't have enough uh, rapid test kits in Canada from the middle of December to the middle of January, at least anyway. So uh, it couldn't be done. But... If they are available now, as the Prime Minister says, why wouldn't they allow that? A very brief answer from the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And we've actually procured just this month 140 million rapid tests. But also, these are not the truckers. The Trucking Association signed a joint statement with the minister saying that he, they support the vaccine mandate. 90% of truckers are vaccinated. That's not who's out there on the lawn right now. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would like to thank the NDP leader for proposing this debate. How sorry I am to the people of Ottawa and the businesses of Ottawa for what they have experienced over the last 10 days. Nobody deserves to experience what they have. There are those who say that this convoy is about freedom. I certainly agree that after two years of a pandemic, most Canadians yearn for freedom. But most Canadians also agree that freedom comes with obligations. And those obligations include protecting the most vulnerable in our society. This means we all need to get vaccinated because without getting vaccinated, new variants will continue to emerge 
and our hospitals will be overburdened. This means we need to wear masks indoors because we know that the virus spreads more quickly in poorly ventilated or crowded indoor settings. So when someone calls for all mandates to be terminated, they are going against science. But that does not mean that other restrictions should not be constantly reconsidered. There are many in this country who are double vaccinated and boosted. They have done everything right over the last two years and believe that they were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Then Omicron hit us in December. Our healthcare system that lacks adequate surge capacity was about to be overwhelmed and politicians had to act. These restrictions involved a travel advisory and added testing upon return at the federal level. But the vast majority of these restrictions were imposed by provinces, including by conservative provincial governments. Everybody was trying to do their best, using their best judgment, but that does not mean that everyone agreed with the decisions and they all merit debate. I can fully understand why parents are confused and upset when their kids are having their schools closed uh, with the kids' mental health having been so deeply impacted. I can understand why some business owners can't understand why their businesses are closed while other comparable businesses are open. I have a friend who runs a gym. I have a friend who runs an adult basketball league. They have been constantly closed over the last two years. Given the importance of working out to physical and mental health, it is hard for me to explain to them why this is the case. Believe me, I get it. There needs to be reasonable conversations about why vaccinated people and business owners are subject to restrictions. And we need a plan that provinces and the federal government agree upon to talk about how other restrictions will be relaxed. But let me be clear. These frustrated Canadians are not represented by the protests currently going on in Ottawa and other cities. Demonstrations are important expressions where citizens make their views known. They typically involve local residents receiving a municipal permit, making their case, and then leaving after a reasonable period of time. They involve a careful choice of location, and normally organ organizers go out of their way to not disrupt the lives of people and businesses. This is a constitutionally protected right that we need to respect, whether or not we agree with the cause. But while legal peaceful assembly is a constitutionally protected right, the blockade of a city is not. The rule of law still exists in Canada. Honking all night long and keeping people awake, sending off fireworks, and refusing to follow local rules related to wearing masks in indoor settings are not part of a normal peaceful protest. Harassing citizens and journalists is not part of a normal peaceful protest. Desecrating monuments is not part of a normal peaceful protest. Targeting healthcare workers is not part of a normal peaceful protest. Stealing from food banks is not part of a normal peaceful protest. And let me say loudly and clearly that flying Confederate flags is not part of a normal peaceful protest. Waving swastikas and wearing yellow stars and having the nerve to compare your situation to Jews who are murdered in the Holocaust is not part of a normal, peaceful protest. My colleague from Holly Elmer spoke beautifully about what it meant to him as a Black Canadian to see people waving the Confederate flag. Let me just say that as a proud Jewish Canadian, seeing some fellow Canadians waving flags with Nazi symbols and wearing and selling the Stars of David that Jews were forced to wear to separate them from the rest of the society in Nazi era made me more sad and angry than I have ever been as a parliamentarian. I have heard from constituents of mine who are Holocaust survivors, and the pain and anguish that this has caused them cannot even be described in words. What kind of people would do this? Well, Mr. Speaker, the organizers, uh, Madam Speaker, the organizers of the convoy have made clear what their goal is. Their goal is the removal of the duly elected government. Their goal is the abolition of all mandates and restrictions whether scientifically validated or not. The convoy has some organizers who have white nationalist and bigoted social media histories. And who is supporting the convoy, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker? Well, it is supported by Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis and Ted Cruz and Matt Gates and Paul Gosor and Marjorie Taylor Greene. I think my colleagues know that I believe we can disagree without personalizing things, but these politicians are different because they are actually attacking American democracy. The hallmark of democracy is that the loser concedes an election. But in this case, these politicians 
have propagated the false and laughable claim that Donald Trump won the 2020 election, even though these claims were laughed out of almost every court to which they were brought. Indeed, Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, had his law license suspended for communicating demonstrably false comments to courts in his capacity as Trump's lawyer. I personally have no issue with Americans commenting on Canadian politics in the same way that I reserve my right to complain about laws in U.S. states that make it more difficult for minorities to vote and stop women from having safe and accessible abortions. But what we do not need is further disinformation in Canada. People already have enough disinformation about vaccines. The last thing they need is disinformation about our democracy. And the presence of Trump 2024 signs at this blockade is of deep concern. So what do we need to happen? People are frustrated in one action. I want to thank the men and women of the Ottawa Police and the Parliamentary Protective Services, as well as the OPP and RCMP and other forces who have done their best. But even though this is under the jurisdiction of the city of Ottawa, nobody wants to hear about jurisdiction. We have a huge problem. Citizens' lives are being disrupted. They do not want to hear excuses from others that this is not their jurisdiction. They want all governments to work together to have this convoy leave Ottawa. They want a safe and peaceful and respectful end to this blockade. I was very pleased to hear the announcement today that all levels of government will work together. May I suggest they also need to communicate together. All of us need to see a daily press conference with all three levels of government and the operational leaders at the police level so that Canadians know exactly what is being done to protect the rule of law and reestablish order in this city. We need to solve this issue and end these blockades. But once that is accomplished, what do we need to do? We need to have a parliamentary committee study exactly what happened with this convoy. How did a convoy end up being allowed to park trucks across from Parliament Hill? What security changes are needed? What legislative changes are needed to ensure that local police forces can request federal assistance more easily? Should there be federal responsibility for policing in downtown Ottawa that currently does not exist? We need to understand how this convoy was financed and whether or not there are countries seeking to cause trouble in Canada by financing illegality. It is one thing to receive donations from the United States, but if U.S. donations can come in this case, it would be equally easy for our adversaries like Russia and China to send funds. What legislative changes, if any, are required to protect our democracy? And the member for New Westminster Burnaby has brought forward a private member's bill to make the use of racist symbols and emblems such as the swastika and Confederate flag criminal subject to carve outs. I think this is indeed a subject we need to quickly tackle. Well, this has been a very unhappy experience, Madam Speaker. Let's learn from what happened and use the experience to ensure that this cannot happen again and that we take steps to enhance and protect our democracy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have uh, just two quick questions for my colleague, for both from constituents. So one from a female police officer in my riding that got her first vaccine, unfortunately had an adverse reaction and is scared. And now she's mad at a prime minister that's calling her misogynist and racist for having health concerns. And the second one from a fully vaccinated health professional in my riding who is seeing other countries around the world with less vaccination uptake that are opening up and lowering their federal equivalent mandates and restrictions and wants to know when is this federal government going to lift the restrictions here in Canada? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much. Uh, the first thing I would say is that if somebody had an adverse reaction to the vaccine, there is an exemption that they can then procure to not be fully vaccinated. I don't know the situation exactly of your constituent, but if she truly had a reaction, a negative reaction to the vaccine, and her physician advised her against it, then she can procure an exemption in most provinces. Uh, secondly, I, as, as I stated, I believe that vaccination, vaccine mandates are important. I believe that public health uh, rules like mask wearing indoors still have to be followed. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to look at all restrictions for vaccinated people, including, for example, whether or not we still need a travel advisory, whether or not we need testing uh, in addition to the PRT, test, PCR testing when you leave your destination, more testing when you arrive. All of these need to be reconsidered in light of new facts. And, you know, we all need to do that at the provincial and federal level. Comments, questions, and commentaires, Honorable Deputy. The member for Abitibi-Témiscou. Sorry. Avignon, la métisse matin, Matapédia. Uh, 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for his speech. And I agree with him on a number of points. Uh, there have been, uh, there's been abuse, the abuse has been denounced, and that's the right thing to do. But this is an emergency debate. It's the last speech of the evening, and I am perhaps too optimistic, but I would have liked to have something come out of this. I mean, an emergency debate like this one, it makes it possible for us to talk things through, propose solutions. But I was wondering whether we could have a, a parliamentary committee struck on this issue so that we can talk about what we can do. I mean, that's wonderful, but we actually have to have something. What concrete measures could be put in place now to get the trucks moving? I will let the Honorable Secretary, Parliamentary Secretary answer, but we are running out of time, so perhaps he could give a very brief answer. Madame la Présidente. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I am I'm very uh, much in agreement with my honorable colleague, and I would also propose something that she herself proposed, and that is that when we not only need a liaison between the three levels of government, but also daily communication where all three levels of government communicate together about what they are doing uh, with police forces to stop what is happening now, because those people have to leave Ottawa as soon as possible, and we have to work together to do that. Motion carried. Accordingly, this House stands adjourned until later this day at 10 a.m. pursuant to Standing Order 24-1. Good night, everybody.